Hey everyone, this crown of thorns looks painful, and it is painful. Believe me, it's painful to wear this, but I'm just glad that I'm not on Earth today with the sanity machine there. He's a fucking thorn in almost everybody's side. That guy is crazy. He's a madman. He's deranged. He does cursor magic. He is just, he is just a piece of work. Just a piece of work. <laughs> hello, hello, hello, hello. Is this live? Is this live? Is this live? Hello, Wendy. Hello, Manny. Can you read me? Audio check. Check one, check two, check three, check. 33 check 33 this is king stephen i hope everyone's doing well it's been a long time since i saw you in a live stream so i thought i'd do a a live stream i i i think my last live stream might have been almost 20 hours something like that but youtube didn't post it so that's what's happening. Happy Good Friday. Happy Good Friday. I slept a little bit last night during the night. And uh, yeah, I'm feeling refreshed now. I'm, I'm feeling ready to go. I've got to say, I, I feel pretty good. I had some, uh, actually for breakfast instead of eggs today, I had some of my leftover cabbage roll soup that I heated up in a pot. And I had three bowls full. I was hungry. So it was delicious. I, I might have to put my recipe out there. It was so good. It's so hearty and filling. And I was stuffed after three bowls of that. Lots of cabbage, meat, rice. Also some mushrooms. I put some sliced mushrooms in mine. It's very, very tasty, very tasty. So I noticed that Demon Slayer channel is now going after Forever Con Man a little bit. And he's saying some very familiar things in his videos, which revealed to me who Demon Slayer is. I know who it is now. They, they tried to throw me off and it didn't work. I know who it is. Pooya, Pooya, the former moderator at Forever Con Man channel. Pooya. I know exactly who it is. And they snapped when they got banned from my channel. And there's somebody that can't take it. They can't take it. And I figured it was Pooya. And that's why I've been saying all along Pooya. Pooya. A former moderator over there. He's too afraid to show his face and his voice and and use his own voice. He's just a little scaredy cat. And he's also a copycat. His latest videos, he's he's trying to he's claiming that he's exposing Forever Comment for being a grifter. I've exposed him multiple times over the last year and a half to two years. He's a little bit late. He's another copycat. And that's all he is. He's just a copycat. He can't come up with his own content. All he can do is talk about me and be envious of me because he isn't me. He never will be me. He never will be. I think Puya might be a disgruntled little incel. That's what I think. I think he might be an incel. He's the same one that said that, oh, you would talk to me if I was a girl or something. He's jealous of my harem. That's what it is. He's he's really jealous that I have a harem. So little Puya, little Puya, is all upset. Ah. Poor little guy. He's also in Europe. He doesn't. He kind of has broken English. It all fits. 
times when he's online, all of it fits. All of it seems to fit. He is just a little munchkin and he's jealous. Poor little Puya. So he's a little copycat. Little Puya's little copycat. I'm glad I don't have to live that way. I'm glad I'm not him. I'm so glad I'm not him. But I'm going to cover his stupid little video now just for a second. Hi there, Carmen. Good to see you. Let's check out this this video by Puya. Puya. Near death experiences are fascinating because they reveal a lot about the afterlife. It reveals repeating patterns in which the soul on the other side is suggested, coerced, and even forced to reincarnate on Earth for a variety of reasons. Whether you trust these entities or not, one thing is certain: they have the ability to erase and implant memories. So, whether you believe the earth is a school or if you think it is a hellish prison where you are being harvested, you must admit that basing your decision solely on near-death experiences is misguided. Why? Because, in my opinion, all of these stories can be planted memories. These are the stories these entities wanted to tell on earth. It has two purposes. You believe that everything on the other side is divine, and that you must trust angels, guides, and deceased parents while being judged for your actions. Or, if you are smart enough you will recognize that something doesn't add up here. Why do we have to have our memories erased and sent here to learn? Learning and growth without memory are not only impossible, but also pointless. However, both groups are being duped. Do you think these entities, the same creatures who created this intricate design, are too stupid to realize that some people on Earth will notice the inconsistent narrative and figure out the big scam? Do you really believe they didn't think this through? In my opinion, NDEs are a PSYOP. I mean, at least one entity must have raised its hand and said, don't send them back with afterlife memories, some YouTuber on Earth will figure out our scam. If you don't want souls to escape your prison, hinting at them on such a large scale is the worst plan in the universe. Now, you could argue that this is part of their agenda. This is called revelation of the method. They have to tell us what they do as if they are a rule-following saint. No, they do not have to. Clearly, there is no court in the universe. Look at what is happening to humanity on Earth. The deception runs deeper than you might think. Even the most closely guarded truth on this plane can be a deception. If you are a thinker and researcher, you will eventually come to this realization that NDEs and Soul Trap is another PSYOP. Yes, this is a hell realm, and we are not at the top of the food chain. So he's but, saying NDs and the soul trap are another psyop. Then he's saying this is a hell realm, and that we're not at the top of the food chain. They're psyop. Yes, this is a hell realm, and we are not at the top of the food chain, but that is only half the story. However, I have yet to find anyone who has realized this. They either refuse to believe that even Soul Trap and NDEs could be PSYOPs, or they are in it for the money. The latter is true for a YouTuber that many of you may have heard of, Forever Conscious Research Channel. He is in it for the money. You he were a moderator over on his channel, Puya, until my channel came around. Then you started to see, after a while of watching my videos, that what I was showing about this guy is true. I'm the one that woke you up to this forever con man 
creature and his in inconsistencies and his money grubbing and shekels begging and the fact that he says we consented and this is all voluntary consent to evil and, and suffering. You were asleep until my channel came around. You were asleep and you were over on this guy's channel as a moderator. You were a full on fanboy of this guy. I exposed him first before anybody else did, before anyone on YouTube. I was the first to expose Forever Con Man and many, many others. And I don't do it for money on my channel at all. Be more obvious, even if he tried. He wasn't obvious enough because you were a moderator there. You didn't see it until my channel exposed him. You were completely a follower there, part of it. He could not be more obvious, even if he tried. If you go to his YouTube channel, he has a dozen different ways for you to donate, which is fine. But what about the additional content that is hidden behind a paywall? What about one-on-one -on -one sessions, which cost more than speaking with a professional therapist? What happens if someone is unable to pay? Now he's showing his sessions. He's showing things that I've showed, including just recently, but I've showed this long ago. Showed this long ago. Are they doomed to reincarnate because they could not pay? The FCRC is filled with red flags. Begging for money is the least concerning. In the next few videos, I will fully expose him. I believe he is a gatekeeper and contributes to the system. You were part of his channel. You were a moderator there, so you were part of it. Demon prayer. Nineteen people watching. Hi, Inga. Good to see you. Hi, Weird Wednesday. Good to see you. Hi, Fiona. Good to see you. And welcome to El Diablo Radio International. On this Good Friday. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. A beautiful day in the neighborhood. Won't you be mine? Won't you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Hello, Traders World. Hello, Uni. Hello to everyone that's here. Glad you're here. It's good to have you here. So my last live stream, I, I really enjoyed it. I had a few different guests on. And it was fun. And you know, you're allowed to have fun in this place. It's a hell realm, but there's no point in being miserable. And that's what I've been saying all along. A lot of these other channels want to make people miserable. They want to make people fearful. They want you to be afraid. They want you to get, get down and depressed about things. And they're not in it for the right reasons. They're really not doing this for the right reasons. So I just showed a little bit of Demon Slayer. Puya, Puya, at the beginning, Puya. And now I'm going to show this video. This is kind of interesting. Hold on a second. Uh, Hello, Mike.
this little light of mine i'm gonna let it shine this little light of mine i'm gonna let it shine i am gonna let it shine light can illuminate it can it can chase away the darkness but it can also blind you you can shine a bright light and blind somebody with a light like a weapon women and children escape in the lifeboats we are really teaching him to internalize his own disposal and we're preparing him to make a decision to resign himself to an icy fate while women and children escape in the lifeboats we are really teaching him to internalize his own disposability and baby girls by attending to her crying so quickly by letting her know she's inherently important to us we're preparing her for the day she has to think of her own safety first, even if it means the man she loves is left standing alone with a rifle in front of a cabin. We're preparing her to take that seat in the lifeboat. We're training her to not allow guilt or empathy or acknowledgement of a man's humanity or any sense that he might just maybe deserve it more to convince her to give her seat to him. Because for millennia, the human species absolutely depended on her feeling 100% entitled to that seat. And that brings me to feminism. Not too long ago, uh, I had it out with a feminist who had come into a male safe space uh, from a feminist blog, uh, just to scoff at the idea of male disposability. Um, she, she went there and basically said that the entire concept was a myth, that men's lived experiences were completely wrong and that they were just a bunch of whiners who were complaining over nothing. Uh, yeah. Anyhow, that got me thinking about the concept of male disposability and how that interacts with the feminist movement. Male disposability has been around since the dawn of time. <laughs> uh, and it's based on, on one uh, very, very straightforward dynamic. Uh, when it comes to the well-being of others, they come first, men come last. This is this is just the way it, it has always been. Uh, seats in lifeboats. So Mushroom Coyote right now, if Mushroom is listening to this, is disagreeing and say that saying no, women are victims, women are oppressed. This is misogynist. These women have internal internalized misogyny and all that sort of thing, but. The observable evidence is that women in the West are privileged. They are put, their lives, very lives are put before men. They're even put before children. Women and children first. That is across the West. All right. Do you understand? Uh, <laughs> being rescued from burning buildings. Who gets to eat? Um, really, society places men dead last every time. And society expects men to place themselves dead last every time. Humans have always had a dynamic of women and children first. Women and children first. No such thing as male privileged. Everything that these feminists have taught you is false. It's an agenda. Feminism is an agenda. It's a psyop. It's destructive. It's tearing apart Western countries. Young boys know, even if their fathers and even if their mothers don't know. They're realizing how it's the opposite of what they're being taught. They're not stupid. They're, they're seeing the treatment of girls and seeing that girls get treated with privilege. With privilege. In school and in society and in the media and in the movies entertainment everywhere they look scholarships for school everywhere they look everywhere they look and that has not changed at all uh the 93 percent workplace death gap has to be evidence of this uh, 
if only because there's nobody with any kind of importance or power who's interested in changing it at all. In fact, I remember reading an article in a BC paper not long ago uh, that described the increasing proportion of female injuries on the job as a huge problem. And the insane thing was the change reflected a decrease in male injuries rather than an increase in female ones. Men's injuries on the job had gone down because the economic downturn had put so many men out of work in the resource sector that there just weren't as many trees or pieces of heavy equipment falling on men as there had been before. And yet this was framed as a huge problem for women that required immediate action to solve. Um, it, it's just crazy. Uh, it's like if men aren't dying at work at 20 times the rate women are, we must be doing something wrong as a society. Back when we were still living in caves, that attitude was necessary for human survival. Nature's a really harsh mistress, especially when you think of all the animals that never ever get to die of old age. Uh, things were a lot different for humans through most of our history on this planet than they are now. Life was dangerous, human settlements were small, isolated from each other, and one big disaster that took out a lot of women pretty much meant the end of the entire shebang for that group of people. So really, the level of importance that a human settlement placed on the well-being of women and children uh, reflected almost always how successful that settlement was. And that can be expanded to encompass entire societies. I keep hearing from the feminist camp that femaleness has always really been undervalued by society and that maleness is preferred. Uh, but I've always contended that it's the exact opposite. Yeah, but uh, the, what she's saying is, is regardless, is true uh, about society and what happens with men. So even if the source is a scammer, which many are on YouTube, not just with her, but all over YouTube, there's people making money and scamming. The deaths of men is, is nonetheless true, and that's what's happening. It. The feminine is intrinsically and individually valuable uh, simply because females are the limiting factor in reproduction of any species. Uh, when it comes to producing babies, every woman counts, whereas biologically, one very happy man could probably do the work of hundreds in that regard. So the level of instinctive importance we humans place on the safety and provision of women and their children it's one of the main reasons why we've been able to be so successful that we've come to really dominate the planet. Hey guys, it's your girl, Melanie, and you told me, well, not you, but some of you guys told me I needed to look up Karen, I think it's Strahan or Strawn, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but I looked up her channel on YouTube and one of the videos that um, came to mind is, not came to mind, that struck a chord with me is feminism and the disposable male. And I was really curious about this. And it's so funny to me that what she, you know, I've, again, my channel started talking about relationships, calling out modern women, their behaviors, their mindsets, and really focusing on dating. But as I, again, as I, as I started looking at the issues out here, it, it just is really going nowhere. Most of the, you know, most of the men now are, well, not most, but a lot of the men have woken up. A lot of the things are focused on pointing out the behavior that women are doing, how illogical it is, and then also building up men and, and, and showing them that there's alternatives to what, you know, the world has told them is their only way. But now men know they can go their own way men, and without guilt and without shame and that they can embrace their freedom. They also we also know that passport bros. They can travel and that they're valued. Men are American men or men in, from the West are valued all over the world because of who they are. They actually have status. They actually are seen as uh, a positive. Women actually want to be with them and that women will, you know, are still feminine in those places and understand their traditional role and what men need and what men like. So I, I start to see that the issue is that feminism across the board, the sexual liberation is where all of this started. This is, that is ground zero to what we're seeing today in society in the dating world. That is just a, the, the dating world is just a symptom of the root cause, which is the disease of feminism and sexual liberation. But it's like every time, you know, and I know you guys don't think I do, but I do read your comments for the most part. I don't always respond. 
Um, but I do digest it. And a lot of the ideas and things that I get, it, it, it helps, uh, move the needle along in my brain, listening to men, hearing their perspectives, hearing how they feel, the way they think is really important for me that I digest this directly from you guys. I think it's more digestible to women if they're hearing it from women, because women have had decades to hear it from men, men talking about what feminism has done and, and women in general have not listened, have not listened in Canada and United States and other countries. And uh, they're finally starting to see that a lot of them are not married in Canada and United States. A lot have never been married. A lot want children. They don't have children. A lot are divorced and a lot, a lot like that's going to be the biggest in history in the next so many years of women reaching 40 years old and never married. It's just basically marriage is over in these countries. And, uh, that's what's happening. Even if women shake their heads and disagree or, you know, there's, there's lots of times that women just don't want to face the truth on this kind of stuff. They just don't, they say that they want to be happy and have a relationship and want to, you know, live with, with someone or be married and, and not die alone. But a lot of them are going to be growing old alone and dying alone is the real reality of what's going on here. And as I said, when men say certain things, a lot, especially these issues, a lot of women just plug their ears and don't want to listen. But at the same time, they'll say they care about men or they love men, they love their dad or they love their brother or boyfriend or whoever. But do they really, if they don't care about any issues affecting men? Is it just kind of dressing or, you know, empty words? It, it's just fluff, you know, at that point. I don't think they really do care because they don't care about what's happening to men. It would be like men saying, oh, I care about women. And they start talking about whatever issues affecting them or deadly for them. And, and men just tune out and just kind of walk away. It's, it's that way. So men are walking away in society now. If you have a man, you better hang on to him because I, I don't know if you'll ever get another one with the way things are going um, in, this, in this realm, in the Western world. It might be different in India and Africa and China and Japan. Well, it's changing in Japan as well, but uh, certain countries it might be still traditional ways of decades ago, but they're catching up. Feminism is going worldwide and it's something, it's not just a turn off for men. It's something that men know is toxic and women, it takes, it takes some years, if not decades of somebody trying to break through to them to show them what's obvious, that it is toxic. Feminism is cancer. And a lot of women still can't see it. I would say the majority of American and Canadian women can't see that. So I don't know if they're slow, if they're brainwashed, a combination of both, but they are not up to speed of where most 15-year-old boys are at in the, in the ability to see it. That's the truth. A lot of women only start to see it when they're in their 40s. It's too late for you then pretty much. At that point, you're not going to have children and you're most likely not, not going to get married. So if you realize the truth, then double thumbs up, but it's not going to change your life. It's really not, not going to too late. Okay. It's too late. And again, some people don't like to hear that because they want to hear stuff that makes their ears feel good, that tickles their ears and, and makes their tummy feel good and their heart feel good. And, they want to hear truth that's just like a little care bear or something. And it just doesn't work that way in this realm, for the most part. And as I hear these things, it, the thing I, that kept echoing, of course, we know feminism doesn't see the importance of men. It pushes men down. They're, they're, men are supposed to be traditional. Men should sacrifice. Men should be silent. If men have opinions, it's misogyny and the patriarchy and they, they just aren't valued at all. And I never saw it like that because I've always valued men, but I didn't know the West in general had, they really hate men. They really see them as disposable. But what she's saying here really goes deep. It cuts deep within me because it's just been expected, you know, that men should take the sacrifice. I talk about my blue collar brothers all the time. And I talk about how they're the most powerful 
uh, force within the West, with around the world, really, because if every blue collar man went on strike for just a day, it would collapse the entire world's economy. And I do think blue collar men need to rise up and stand together. Um, and, and that's a whole nother video I plan on doing. But think about just the blue collar men, how they do these dirty jobs. They do the hard jobs. They're expected to do it. They're expected to go out there and work, be these workhorses, not to complain, not to, and to just take whatever it is that they get. And, you know, they don't go on TikTok and make rants and cry. And, and if they did, they will be shamed. They're not man enough. They're expected to silently do their work, suffer, and just be happy with it. And if you think about the sexual liberation and feminism, how it started, you know, women you were staying at home. They weren't able to go out and work. When, when they talk about going out to work, they're talking about these glamorous jobs, you know, corporate jobs. That's actually false. They were able to go out and work. Most women didn't want to. And the ones that did work, usually it's because they had to. In those days, they were at the lower economic end. And they needed two incomes because their husband didn't make enough on his own to pay for the house, wife, four, five, six children. Okay? A lot of men did make enough in those days, but not all men. So it was actually a privilege and a sign of, of status for women that didn't have to work didn't have to work, okay? Both of my grandmothers had jobs. So they could sit down at a computer, these jobs that seemingly have power and you make a lot of money from them. They're not talking about men who are working the pipelines, men who are you know, uh, building skyscrapers or bridges, men who are uh, down into the, uh, in the sewer systems and doing the real hard work that keeps the world running. They're not fighting for equality there. They just expect men to keep doing those jobs, stay silent, support the world, don't be shamed by women, be looked over by women, obviously be invisible to women. So they're not allowed to, to speak up. They're not even looked at in the dating market. The things that the reason why men would work hard and, and keep their head down and keep going is because the promise of being able to have a family and legacy and feel like, feeling like you're achieving something as a man. But as that has gone away, men are still expected to keep doing these things in silence. And if a man speaks up, it's now new with social media that that man will be canceled. If a man has speaks on his own rights, speaks on how he feels, speaks on pointing out what's going on or, sp or be proud of himself. Women feel it's their obligation to cancel him and that how dare you speak? Just look at what happened with Simone Biles and Jamie Owens. He he's he sees himself as a prize and they're like, how dare you? She's achieved more, so she's the prize. This is how delusional they are. You aren't even allowed to have self-esteem as a man. And so what she's saying, this is my first time really, I'm trying to connect the dots right here, but I just wanted to lay a foundation of what's going on in my brain. I like to give you guys this in real time, even though I can be very loquacious. But I'm, I'm starting to hear what she's saying that men went to had to go to war. Men were disposable. Men have always been disposable. And, and it's just crazy to me that when I think about it, like, like, yeah, they were expected to die in war. They would protect women and children. And why inherently they say women are born with intrinsic value. And it's because we carry the wounds. We're able, the, the, the labor of carrying a child is, is, is, is it's, you know, a woman can only carry a child for nine months. Like it takes nine months to carry a child. It's much more intensive for a woman where a man can spread seed to hundreds of women within a short period of time. And so now it's the idea of feminism that we only need a few men. We need, and in, in the dating world, the way this translates, we just need these chats, these top guys, and the rest of you are of no consequence. You're just supposed to work. You're disposable. You're thrown away. And this is this profound. And while I will concede that this drive to keep women safe from all harm has often resulted in extreme limits being placed on women's mo mobility, uh, their agency, their power of decision to direct their own lives, uh, all through history in many cultures and in many cultures even today, uh, I think it's telling that those cultures tend to be the most backward
when you consider the restrictions placed on women in places like Afghanistan, and then you consider that if we bombed them into the Stone Age, it would be progress. I think you can conclude that the most successful societies had a really, really good balance between allowing women freedom and the ability. Amber Lance, uh, are you on drugs or something? Do you have an issue? You seem very confused. Are you on drugs? Are you having a stroke? To choose and direct their own paths in life and the need to protect them and provide for them. However, uh, feminists will insist that this, uh, these kinds of restrictions being placed on women in those kinds of societies are the ultimate form of, of objectification. Uh, you lock up your possessions to make sure that they will never be lost or stolen or harmed. Uh, honestly, if I were a guy on a battlefield, I might appreciate being objectified in that way. I think if I was going to be an object, I'd rather be a sexual one or somebody's prized possession than an object that can simply be thrown in the trash or smashed into pieces in the service of somebody else's purpose. Feminists also have a very, a very simplistic idea that our willingness to absolve women of their crimes, uh, slap them on the wrist, uh, spare them punishment, um, it comes from a deep disrespect society has for women's personhood. Uh, not seeing them as full human beings, capable of looking after themselves, that we see them as children who don't know any better. And yeah, well, there are parallels uh, there in our desire to protect both women and children from uh, not only their own poor decisions, but the full consequences of their shitty behavior. It's really not as simple as they try to make it out to be. I mean, seriously, even today, even today in 2011, uh, we fully expect that if it comes down to a, a man and a woman in a burning building and you can only save one, the expectation is that you choose the woman every single time. So honestly, whose humanity are we placing above who's here? We're not talking about going to work. We're not talking about getting an education. We're not talking about having the freedom to decide what you want to be in life. And well, they call it getting an education, going to a university, getting indoctrinated and programmed and brainwashed to follow feminism and getting a degree. A lot of women call that getting an education. It's indoctrination. They can have it. Fill the universities with 100% female population. The student body can be 100% female. A lot of guys don't want to go to university anymore. They see what it is at least in Canada and United States, they see what it is. We're not talking about getting to take Taekwondo. We're talking seats and lifeboats here. Uh, the person in the lifeboat is going to survive no matter how capable or incapable they are of managing their own life. And the person going down with the ship is going to die no matter how independent, self-sufficient, and awesome he is. I'm sorry, what just came to mind was that, okay, the reason why these kind What comes to mind to me is a woman that has could be in the lifeboat. She could have a body count of 200 men that she slept with, be a complete hoe, be a degenerate, be a drug addict, have had four or five abortions, whereas the man on the ship going down, sinking, that doesn't get the seat in the lifeboat, could be an extraordinary man. It could be a genius level that would do things that would help humanity. It doesn't matter. The woman is valued more than any man. That's our society. So when women talk about male privilege, they don't even understand how delusional and dumb they sound. It's a lie. It's a lie. And I will call people out on lies, whether they're men or women. I don't care if it hurts their feelings. That's too bad. Concepts came to place, and I think it was formed in societies because men are physically stronger, men are more logical, they're more capable in terms of fighting, in terms of, you know, carrying the heavier load physically. And 
you know, and with that comes great responsibility that this is why when women are mad about the patriarchy, well, men had the greater risk. They had all the responsibility. They bore all the burden. And women would just seem to keep raising the next generation, cook and clean and do these things, more traditional things that were not heavy lifters. They weren't burdensome in, in reality compared to what men had to do. But as I think about it and, and what she's seeing here is that, you know, there is this. I like when women try to think about what men had to do rather than just complaining about women having to cook and clean and, and dust and do laundry back then. What were the men doing back then? In 1940, what were the men doing? The, it is almost passed on the, the real, it's not a patriarchy that we've existed in. It's a matriarchy in terms of the importance of women and protecting them and providing for women when they've always been able to live a more softer life, being the weaker vessel, men took on more of the risk. So of course they were the ones that needed to decide more on the laws and the things going on in the Did world. Did she just say women are the weaker vessel? Come on, women are as strong as men. We're, we're equal is what women say these days. Let them do the hard tasks. Let them try to do the heavy lifting and all this stuff. Let them try to do everything that men do and show that they're equal. I, I just want to see how equal we are because I've heard it for so many years now. How equal are we? Because they were the ones on the front lines of it. But what women wanted, well, we want those same rights. We want the same things, the privileges, seen as privileges that men get. We want those same privileges, even though we don't want equal responsibility, even though we don't want to work as hard, even though when given the opportunity, we don't go into blue collar work. When given the opportunity, we don't even go into STEM, which is now called STEAM. It's not science, technology, engineering, and math anymore. It's science, technology, engineering, the arts, and math. And some people say, well, you know, the reason I include arts is because some of these graphic designers and, um, and uh, uh, architects and all of that, which could still go into engineering that can still go into technology, that can still go into math because there is science behind that. But of course they have to include the arts, which we know why. So with more women, they can fill those quotas more. But I just think about it, women gravitate towards softer things. There's an expectation you do for me. I take, I take, I take, plus I wanna be in charge, even though I'm not willing to sacrifice my life. I'm not willing to do the hard labor. I'm not willing to lay my life on the line the way men have been forced to do. Men have been forced to do these things. So it's just fascinating. That's the equation. One life more valuable than another. And the woman wins every time. So honestly, is there any argument anywhere that women's humanity has always been held in higher regard by society than men's? To be important to society, a woman merely has to be. A man has to do in order for his life to have any meaning to anyone other than himself. I think it was man-woman myth who said our society reduces men from human beings to human doings. And I really think that's an apt analogy. Uh, we measure a man's worthiness to wear the title of man, <laughs> and therefore the title of human, through how useful he is, uh, either to society or to women. And one of the most useful things a man can do even now in the eyes of society is to put women and children before himself. And while I think there's plenty of argument that this attitude is at least- Let me just say this, and that is why they always say men are narcissists. Women will say men are narcissists, but really women have become like petulant children and are narcissistic because they're used to a society that caters and panders to them, to their needs, to their wants, to their desires, to their emotions. Everything is designed toward making a woman feel good and a man should just take it. And so when a man doesn't want to take your emotional abuse, when he doesn't pander to what you want, when he doesn't live up to the human doing that you expect him to be, because women don't see him as a human being. He's a human doing. What can he do for me? 
And this is why I'm now understanding why they say men, when they really love a woman, they love her, not what she can do for him. Some women will say, well, he, he, he just loves women because he gives him sex. He expects her to give him sex. That's part of an exchange of love and women act like they get no benefit from it. But women want a man to pay her bills, take care of the home, provide and protect. And even if he, she stays home and he works all day, works 40 to 80 hours a week at work, when he comes home, he's still expected to, to clock in for her share of the work. She doesn't go out and clock in for him after that and go to work after she stayed home all day watching soap operas, having to do some laundry and watch over her children that I thought motherhood was the greatest job of all and that all women love being mothers and it's just so great. Even that now women despise because it's not about self. I don't get to talk to adults. I don't get to go do this. I don't have my freedom anymore. When's the last time you heard a man say, I don't have freedom anymore because the lives of my wife and children are dependent on me, that we will go homeless and hungry. My children can die. We will, we will, we, my legacy is on the line if I don't go to work. So they just, they keep clocking in and they do it happily to knowing that it, it, it makes a man happy to make his family happy. It, it gives him a satisfaction. But for women, no. If a man, if, if everyone, if her children, if her husband, if the men, everyone, society's not making her happy, she's unhappy. It's about her happiness first. And this is why when a man sacrifices, when a man wants to marry you, when a man decides that it is so much more than just feelings, but then when he does it, he's taking the risk of losing everything because one day you're not happy anymore because it's not enough. Because society keeps telling you as a woman, you deserve more and more and more. And it is a narcissistic cycle. My God, guys, I feel like I've unlocked the next level of like Mario or something. <laughs> Partly innate, the way most survival traits are, even collective ones. Uh, if it starts in the chromosomes, we really do everything that we can as a society to reinforce this dynamic. Studies have shown that even though baby boys tend to cry and fuss more than baby girls, uh, parents are quicker to attend to or console a baby girl than they are a baby boy. Um, even just the level of acceptance of infant male circumcision in our culture when female genital mutilation was banned pretty much the first afternoon we all heard it existed, it really says a lot about the differing expectations we have for males and females. I mean, speaking as a mother, uh, the last thing I would have ever wanted uh, was to hear my child cry, especially when they're at an age when they're completely helpless, completely at the mercy of outside forces and utterly dependent on the adults in their lives for every last thing. And yet even knowing how painful that cut is, <laughs> we expect baby boys only days old for fuck's sake to just suck that up. And just think about what even these very first interactions and experiences, these differences in how we nurture our babies, depending on what gender they are, what this teaches them. Uh, what do we teach baby girls when we attend to their crying so quickly? Uh, we teach them to ask for help because their needs are important. Uh, we teach them to let us know when they're afraid or in pain because it's important for us to know when they're sick or in danger or hurt uh, so we can do something about it. We teach them that when they're sad or lonely to summon comfort and comfort will be there. We teach them that they're important. Uh, their needs and well-being, both emotional and physical, are important just because. And what are we teaching baby boys when we need them to cry? We teach them there's not much point in seeking help because it will be grudgingly given, if at all. Uh, we teach them that they should become self-contained in their ability to deal with uh, emotions like fear, uh, helplessness, loneliness, sadness, pain, distress. We teach them stoicism. We teach them to suck it up. Uh, we teach them that their fear and their pain are things that are best ignored. We teach them that their emotional and physical well-being are just not as important as other things. I mean, given all of that, is it any wonder it's like pulling teeth to get a man to go to the doctor when he's sick? What we're teaching that baby boy is all the things a man needs to know and feel and believe about himself if he's going to stand in front of a cabin with a rifle while his wife and kids hide inside. We're preparing him for the day he has to fix a bayonet to a rifle and charge a hill under enemy fire. And we're preparing him to make a decision to resign himself to an icy fate while women and children escape in the lifeboats. We are really teaching him to internalize his own disposability. And baby girls, 
by attending to her crying so quickly, by letting her know she's inherently important. I'm sorry, guys. Internalize his own disposability. Wow. I even, even I, you know, the things I say, men are workhorses, but I, I just an expectation that I have in society that men just are that way. But no, we've conditioned men like that. And of course, there, there has to be balance. There, it used to be worth it for a man because these were seen as masculine traits to develop in, in our boys. But now girls want, again, and then they, there were certain benefits. When you sacrifice more, when you work harder, you get more benefits, you get more rights. But for some reason now it's, no, I make no sacrifices. We, we raise girls still with the, sorry guys, if you hear noise outside. We raise girls with the idea that, you know, they can be just like a man. They could do this like a man, but they're not going to sacrifice like a man. Women don't want the responsibilities of men. They don't want those things, the same thing that men, men have to go through, the conditioning. We don't want women like that. We don't expect them to, and we still coddle them as in their feminine roles but then tell them they should have everything the man has and even more and that he's disposable. Men don't matter. And we see this, you know, the data really shows out on dating apps. This is where I, I find it the most interesting where the large, the large, the hundred percent of women want this tiny percentage of men that they think look physically attractive. So we even now we require men to have physical beauty on the Fibonacci scale and that they're this Adonis body in order to be worthy of, of procreation, to be worthy of, of, of a relationship of sex. And even those things that are natural desire for men, we shame them for, oh, he's objectifying me, but then we objectify ourselves and we, guys, it's really convoluted what's coming out, but it's like new, new synapses, new brain <laughs> matter. My gray matter is like firing and I'm just seeing it. It's like, I thought I was seeing things in a macro way. Now this, like this woman has really expanded my thinking to another level and just work with me while it's, it's churning. The butter's churning, but it's, it, it's getting there. It may take a while, but it's getting there. Wow. We're preparing her for the day. She has to think of her own safety first, even if it means the man she loves is left standing alone with a rifle in front of a cabin. We're preparing her to take that seat in the lifeboat. We're training her. I know what she's going, guys. I Let me rewind it for a second so you could just hear this whole thing again, like put out. I'm sorry. I, I know I messed it up. Just This was just so profound. I got to be quiet. Here we go. Here we go. Safety first. Even if it means the man she loves. No, hold on, hold on, hold on. We got to rewind it a little bit more. A little bit more. We got to get this. This whole thing. We fire. And we're preparing him. To Are there any other, quote, soul trap channels or truth channels that you know of covering these topics to make a decision to resign himself to an icy fate while women and children escape in the lifeboats we are really teaching him to internalize his own disposability and baby girls by attending to her crying so quickly by letting her know she's inherently important to us we're preparing her for the day she has to think of her own safety first even if it means the man she loves is left standing alone with a rifle in front of a cabin. We're preparing her to take that seat in the lifeboat. We're training her to not allow guilt or empathy or acknowledgement of a man's humanity or any sense that he might just maybe deserve it more to convince her to give her seat to him. Because for millennia, the human species absolutely depended on her feeling 100% entitled to that seat. And that brings me to feminism. You know, the patriarchy smashers, those righteous avengers of equality, uh, dogged dismantlers of every single gender role. What exactly is feminism doing to dismantle this traditional role of the disposable male? Feminism's greatest victories have only reinforced in everyone that society still owes women provision, protection, help, and support just because they're women in its collective dismissal and abandonment of male victims of domestic violence, it only reinforces in men that it's pointless for them to ask for help because men's needs are of no relevance and their fear and pain don't mean anything to anyone. Feminism teaches us to put women's needs at the forefront of every single issue, uh, political or social, whether that issue is domestic violence law, sexual assault law, institutional sexism, 
social safety net, education funding, homeless shelters, government funding for shovel ready jobs that didn't stay shovel ready once feminists got wind of them. Everywhere you look, everywhere you look, there are feminists pushing their way to the front of the line, demanding women's fair share of all of the goodies, the good stuff, the, the loot, the booty, the cookies, even if women don't need it, even if women don't deserve it, and even if somebody else needs it and deserves it more. And they get it because we give it to them. Feminism has done nothing but exploit this dynamic of the expectation on men to put everybody else before themselves, especially women. Women's safety and support, women's well-being and women's emotional needs always come first. This is the most stunning piece of society-wide manipulative psychology I think I have ever come across. Feminism has been on the down low with old school chivalry right from the start, and they might seem like strange bedfellows for sure. But they're not, because both concepts are built on a firm foundation of female self-interest. We made our way as humans through a really harsh history, and we became the dominant force on this planet. And one of the reasons we were so successful is because we have consistently put women's basic needs first. Guys, I'm sorry, what just came to mind, I mean, this is so deep. I'm gonna have to watch this a few times on my own, really dissect it. This is really transforming the way I'm even, I mean, this is adding so much. But even if you aren't like a, a, a Christian, what you know, I am, and the way I was raised when it thinks, you know, um, they're trying to change the genders now. The Church of England was debating whether they should uh, take the masculine pronouns away from God as he labels himself in the image of a man. Um, but then he sacrificed his son, Jesus Christ. Like when you look at the sacrifice, who made the sacrifice, even God himself chose a son, a form of a man to sacrifice for the entire world. And even and willingly doing it. And you think about the Garden of Gethsemane when he was praying the Lord's Prayer and he, the fear that he still had fear, he still had human emotions, but despite his own humanity, his, despite that, he was willing to dispose of self to save others. And I'm sorry, that just came to mind when we talk about that, that even in, in, in, in mythology and in, in, in, in religion, it is usually the sacrifice of the man, the male figure for the, for the, good of others and, and they just are taught to accept that and now they're Okay, so I'm going to check something out uh, here. Let's see here. Apparently, this is Hans Wormhat's channel. Hans Wormhat, this is a request. A lot of times people have requested this. This is a video on how to get saved, how to save your soul, how to go to heaven. And I'll just try to go through. Hans Wormhat, this is a request. A lot of times people have requested this. This is a video on how to get saved, how to save your soul, how to go to heaven. And I'll just try to go through, keep it brief, as brief as I can. So one word, Jesus. Yes, Jesus Christ is how you get to heaven. You can't go to the Father except through Jesus Christ. And some people, I think, I guess one, one good thing to talk about right away is what it isn't in my opinion it's not some sort of ceremony that makes you saved i don't think having a water baptism is what makes you saved some people for me these are red flags if you disagree with me that's fine but this video is just about my opinion on how to get saved i think it's through jesus and specifically you have to read what jesus says how to not get saved water baptism i don't think that's going to save you I'm not saying that it's a horrible thing to go do a water baptism. 
it's fine. Go do it if you want to do that. But I don't think that's what saves you. Some people, in my opinion, who are payers or trannies or whatever, seem obsessed with the concept of being born again. I don't, I don't think, how do they know? To me, that's like a holier than thou thing. They're like, well, I've been born again. Have you been born again? How, in my opinion, being born again, it's just telling you, that just means that's what it's like when you do get saved. Your life is totally different. It's like being born again. I don't think that it's some sort of thing where, oh, In this video, I'm going to talk about how I specifically make my YouTube videos and a little bit of philosophy behind it. I'll try to keep things short, but this is pretty dense, I think, in information. And this is a topic. Today's video is going to be about transvestigation, and I saw this briefly on uh, Powerpuff Girls episode, and had a had a nice chuckle, especially over the bright orange, and then this image for Congress. These days, they would even let them look like this and have them run for Congress, but you know, back in the day, they kept this stuff a little bit more behind closed doors and you know the think of all the governors that you find out that they've done drag in the past or whatever it's part of it's a hazing ritual for people that are in the club you'll you'll hear certain people talk about being pressured into cross-dressing and sometimes they use it as blackmail i'm sure more in the cases of the political um baffos or inverts or whatever you want to call them club members orange 33 club members is what i say a lot of times and uh yeah it's a thing for a reason try to find try to find any children's show out there that doesn't involve cross-dressing in some way shape or form i would be very very much surprised if you could find any media out there that doesn't have some sort of cross-dressing going on and there's a reason for that. They they know the magic behind you can't see the forest for the trees. And they know that if they joke about it and if they talk about it and if they keep it constantly in view, that a lot of people will never see it because it was just always there. That's just where they grew up. Oh, I just I just thought celebrities were kind of weird looking and and that the people that said that they were attractive just had different tastes than me rather than realizing that it's a giant gaslighting operation and that people know exactly what they're doing. So certain... This stuff is old news. This is so 2015. And other people did it before Wormhat. And yeah, Wormhat, I don't even know if he likes women. But uh, where's his Soul Trap videos? Because this is just basic truth or shit. Has nothing to do with what I'm doing here. So maybe this is your friend's channel or something, but look at this. Today I just have a little bit to talk about, a little bit on my mind. And I'm going to finish reading chapter three of Jeremiah. But before I get to that, this was on Reddit earlier today. And I didn't check the comments, but I'm going to go ahead and assume that the reason that this one, you know, went viral, made it to the front page. 
I'm hoping, and I didn't check, a lot of times things blow up because everybody wants to flame the, the poster in the comments. And I, I'm hoping that's what's going on here. My 21 male, so I'm guess the person that's complaining, my parents, 038, refuse to do their own dishes. You answered the question, but this channel and Mag Truth has nothing to do with what my question was. Nothing. And we'll continue to pile them until I wash all of them. So I'm hoping that people in the comments are like, wow, you're a 21-year-old still living at home and complaining that you've been given a chore to do? Like, who cooks the food? And I just relate to this because I hate doing the dishes, but I like cooking. And man, it sucks to have to do both, <laughs> to have to cook and clean and do all the other stuff. <clears throat> so again, I didn't read the comments. Also, this picture is a little bit sus. Like, like there's a weird family situation going on. Uh, is the 21-year-old, the? it looks like maybe some step parents and, the, and step sisters or brothers but i mean who knows that that almost looks like the type of family photo that just comes comes in any frame these days but i'm guessing those are the reasons why this story made it to the front page not because of other reasons people probably wanted to flame this guy and yeah that picture but what this reminded me of besides the amount of entitlement that a lot of young people feel and lack of drive, which I mean, I get it. They're born into a really horrible, horrible time and the future is bleak. So, and time is short too. That's another thing that I feel sorry for the younger generations that they have the same expectations put on them, but time is so short. That's why curriculum is actually a topic I, I really love in as proof that time ain't what it used to be. Nowhere has curriculum been added. Everywhere, the curriculum is being gutted. And things like nap don't exist anymore in kindergarten. And so children have basically the same expectations on them. But nobody can meet those expectations. And that's why it's bred this culture of due dates don't really exist anymore to kids these days and you know responsibilities they can just complain and whine about their mentals for long enough until the ball just gets dropped and they don't end up having any responsibilities more or less but i i get it part of me gets it because this world really sucks and and we really don't have the same amount of time anymore but people aren't willing to admit that and instead so a lot of blame oh why can't you why can't you guys do this stuff because we did this stuff when we were young well it's totally different now and literally there's less time now but luke chapter 12 verse 53 the reason that i think about this a lot is that i i see this verse get brought up in like criticism of maybe even jesus people try to say that like why would jesus say this but jesus said a lot of things that are hard to hear hard for us to accept but it's a truth it's an obvious truth so that's why i like this verse the father shall be divided against the son and the son against the father the mother against the daughter and the daughter against the mother the mother-in-law against the daughter-in-law and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law i mean mother-in-laws and that has been a known uh kind of like a meme tumultuous relationship for a long time but i'm guessing in times past people used to be more civil and but I see this verse everywhere, and it reminds me of how children these days, they're allowed to confide. Like, children that are still developing have really underdeveloped frontal lobe, but they're going to counselors and saying, I feel a certain way. And, you know, they take that so serious. The counselors are like, all right, keep that away from your parent. They try to rip them away from their parents. This is what cults do, too, try to rip people away from their family and you know make make them a member of this club that's why it's a like a club why is being why is that thing it's like a club and same with the with the sexual stuff that's all over high schools too like there there should be no pride no gay anything in high school that's grooming to even talk about sexual things 
to high schoolers and just start building clubs based around sexuality. It's all disgusting. And it, it creates this divide between parents and children. That would be, I mean, I homeschool and it's one of the biggest reasons that I'm okay homeschooling because a huge part of the, of the school system is to wedge a divide between students and their uh, parents. Obvious now more than ever, I think. Okay, so I've, I think I've said enough. I'm going to finish. I'm, so if you want to grab your Bible, I'm in Jeremiah chapter 3, and I'm going to read verses 12 to 25 and say anything that comes to mind. And just for context, Jeremiah has been preaching or prophesizing or to, to Israel, telling them that they're backsliding. And so that's what's still going on. Go and proclaim these words. Okay, let's see what else we can see here. What else do we have over here? Where are the soul trap videos? Where's the reincarnation videos? Is this another Jesus video? He had a video years ago saying that zebras were fake and they were just painted horses. Not kidding you. I don't know if it's on this channel, but he had a video years ago saying that Zebras are not real. They're just painted horses. This is a video on sloths and how sloths are not a real animal. It's a giant hoax and making up fake animals and putting them on the world stage and getting everybody to believe in them. It's something that a lot of countries participate in this. And they almost like brand their country sometimes with their fake animal. Uh, my mind just goes straight to China and the panda. Uh, they've like branded their country with their fake animal. Even though there's no pandas in ancient Chinese art whatsoever. It's because it's a, a modern invention. Australia, very much branded. And we'll talk about Costa Rica later in this video because it's like Costa Rica didn't really have the tech to brand themselves with the sloth until very recently they're attempting to. But it's almost too little too late. Sloths are in almost every zoo, it seems, these days. And it really wasn't like that 20 years ago. And it's because robotics today are just uh, way... It isn't robotics... I know a girl that's held on to a sloth and showed me pictures and video. They are real. <laughs> this guy's amazing. This is incredible. Easier to develop than they used to be. So, this video, I'll just play it. And what do you think? What do you think? I think they're just showcasing off that little baby. Yes, the little babies are also fake. And the people in control of this place, it, it all comes out of Hollywood, really. A lot of this stuff. And they get people to... This is the level that a lot are at. They're following Jesus and saying that sloths are not real and zebras are not real. And look at this. God's amazing creation. How is this a soul trap channel? How is this a Soul Trap channel? Today's Thursday, September 14th, 2023. And I'm just coming here to say hi. I know it's been a while. And I'm always thinking about, about this channel and all the people that I've met through it and how it brought me to God. And that's largely been the focus for, I hope, years now. And... It's the one truth that when you find it, you don't let go of it. I know God is real now. That is the point of life. I always knew that either God was real or God wasn't real. Okay, And then when I, when I got the message and I knew that God was real, 
everything is so different and that becomes the obsessive truth behind everything that's because why wouldn't it be in my opinion and so this is a part of that i mean this channel is a part of that and so i'm always thinking about posting stuff here and trying to be present so if i'm ever gone be patient with me i will never leave until jesus comes back in the clouds until I... jesus comes back in the clouds he said this guy will never leave I, I i don't know what the fuck is wrong with people what is wrong with people pray that i'm raptured and i pray you are too reading this get right with with god start reading the bible learn who jesus christ get is Get right with god start reading the bible he said get a relationship with them and be hopeful that you can escape in rapture as well so today's video is going to be very simple i just want to wanted to say hi say that little message i never will forget about any of you and i really appreciate i've made some friends through this and i still talk I talk with some people that I've met through this and have made life lifelong oh, friends. This guy's so amazing, isn't he? Amazing. And of course he has eight thousand, eight and a half thousand subscribers following this garbage. Following absolute garbage. Here it is. Here's the zebra video. This is awesome. I'm gonna subscribe to this channel. For comedy, this is this is awesome. This is hilarious. So this video here is he named it a zebra is a stripy horse. A zebra, it a zebra is a stripy horse. And over five thousand people viewed it, and over one hundred twenty-seven liked it. Look at this. You think that's just a stripy horse? Look at this. With stripes on top and underneath and on his left and right A zebra is a stripy horse and his stripes are black and white The horse and zebra look alike, there's ways in which they're not And zebras have got something which the horses haven't got It's nature's way of helping us to tell the two apart It's not the only way, but it's a splendid way to start a zebra is a stripy horse, his stripes are white and black. A zebra is stripy at the front and stripy at the back. With stripes on top and underneath and on his left and right. A zebra is a stripy horse and his stripes are black and white. A zebra is a stripy horse, his stripes are white and black. A zebra is stripy at the front and stripy at the back. With stripes on top and underneath and on his left and right. A zebra is a stripy horse and his stripes are black and white. The horse and zebra look alike, there's differences as well. And if you wonder which is which, it's not too hard to tell. And when they're standing side by side, you won't have any doubt. The zebra is the one with stripes, the horse the one without. A zebra is a stripy horse, his stripes are white and black. A zebra is stripy at the front and stripy at the back. With stripes on top and underneath and on his left and right. A zebra is a stripy horse and his stripes are black and white. A zebra is a stripy horse, his stripes are white and black. A zebra is stripy at the front and stripy at the back. With stripes on top and underneath and on his left and right. A zebra is a stripy horse and his stripes are black and white. Yes, a zebra is a stripy horse and his stripes are black and white. So that's Hans Wormhatch channel, everyone. That's the that's a channel that this guy recommended. This guy recommended that. Why Satan fakes animals? Look at this. Today's Thursday, November 5th, 2020. And today I'm just going to explain as simply as I can why people make up animals. And it's nothing new. 
way back in the day, if you've ever looked at really old maps that have oceans on it, you'll usually see a few scary ocean monsters drawn on the map. And people have been telling tall tales of fake animals probably since the beginning. And people still come up with them. I guess Chupacabra is pretty, pretty recent invention. And it's just nothing new. Chupacabra, got the jackalope. Every area has their own hoax animals. Drop bears a double hoax because it's a hoax built on a hoax. Koalas are not real animals. They're just little plushies that... Look at this. He says koalas, koalas are not real animals. And he has credibility amongst, quote, truthers by the thousands. He just said koalas are not real animals. animals drop bears a double hoax because it's a hoax built on a hoax koalas are not real animals they're just little plushies that people used to build a taxidermy bear and stick it up in a tree and they tell people that it's an animal and nowadays it's just a little bit more advanced they have cgi and animatronics there's wolpertinger it's just nothing new the platypus people knew that the platypus was a hoax when they first came out with it the platypus is so weird that scientists, even the scientists, thought the first specimen was a hoax. And they were right. But there's this whole concept of a big lie. If you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. And so just like the platypus, the scientists at the time, they knew it was a hoax. But they just kept telling a lie over and over and over again. And it's just been adopted and people just assume it's true. No, platypus are not real. That's one of the biggest animals that they use to try to push evolution. When you start to get the hang of what the fake animals are, the fake animals are the ones that you don't just see running around outside like squirrels and cats and dogs. The fake animals are the special ones that you need to see on the TV or at the zoo. And we're going to get into one that you see at the zoo in particular in a second. But anyways you get the feel for what the big animals are, the big fake animals. And they're the media favorites too. The media loves the fake animals more than anything. That's why the WWF isn't just like a squirrel or a dog or something. It's a panda. And that's why Australia is all about the koala. I mean, they're, they're all about the kangaroo too, but kangaroos are real. So you really see the koala pushed a lot more than you see the kangaroo pushed. And if you can think back to the wildfires, they were constantly having, having stories about koalas in the wildfire. But I think I saw one story about kangaroos in the wildfires and kangaroos are actually real. And they just make all these stories about their stuffed animals. People would go out into the into the woods wherever they keep these plushies up in the trees and they would save the plushies and then they love to make their viral video with all the plushies in their car oh look at these things that i saved and yeah there was some bad footage out of that anyways this i'm gonna spend probably the bulk of this video just talking about this one and fake animal in particular it's not a fake animal in that it's not alive. It's that they take an animal that is alive, say a donkey or a horse, and they camouflage it, they paint it, and they tell you that it's a new animal. And it's one that you can clearly see the brainwashing when you're able to step back and look from afar and see how, how many times were you told Z is for what? Z is for zebra. Gets told to you about a million times when you're growing up. That's programming out there kind of hinting at the truth there's a million and one comics of the stripes falling off of a zebra or somebody painting stripes on a zebra there's a million and one instances of things like this where they will tell you that you disguise a horse as a zebra the joke is and this is a meme that they use with their fake animals all the time they present you with a really badly painted or they present you with a really bad representation of whatever the fake animal is. And then they point you over towards a, a nicer looking one. And it makes you think that the nicer looking one must be real. Oh, if, if this really bad attempt, right? Th this is like if a non-artist attempts to paint up something to look like a zebra. However, you get a skilled artist to paint up a horse looking exactly like a zebra. 
Well, then it looks exactly like a zebra because that's exactly what zebras are. They're a horse that has a very skilled artist paint stripes on them. Right? What what makes a painted horse? It's a zebra that doesn't pass. That's basically it. What is a painted horse? It's a zebra that doesn't pass as a zebra. They So I don't know how much more of this I'm going to cover. I mean, I don't, I don't even know what to say. People are at this level. People that are at this level. bunch of biblical shit videos he has just a bunch of garbage I haven't seen anything here about the soul trap so i don't see i don't see what that idiot was talking about as usual people lie it's the way it goes Just advertising garbage channels. Oh, the pickle sp conspiracy. Look at this. Today is Thursday, January 12th, 2023. And this is a video about the pickle conspiracy. And let's just get right into it. Who here watching this video knew that dill pickles, your standard dill pickle, is supposed to be a fermented food? It's supposed to get sour through a natural fermentation process. That's your standard pickling is not traditionally done with you just put it in something very sour and then it makes it sour. It's supposed to be a natural process and it's way better for you. It's a probiotic. It to naturally ferment things, to let something go sour naturally, you're encouraging the growth of good bacteria. And you're not just taking something and dunking it in a sour solution and making it sour that way. So who already knew that? That your standard dill pickle, it's supposed to be a fermented food, like kimchi. Kimchi is fermented. Certain pickled cabbage things are traditionally fermented. And this is the real pickle. The pickle conspiracy is that pickling is supposed to be fermentation, not dunking something in vinegar. And, uh, the process is pretty simple. I've actually started doing this. This is like a new culinary thing that I'm trying out. And I would say cooking is one of my hobbies, but it's, it's just something that you need to do. If you're not going to eat processed crap all the time, you need to learn how to cook or hopefully have somebody in your family who cooks. And... Cooking, like every aspect of life, typically the general thing that people do and the easy option is 
going to be corrupted in some way and it's going to be gate kept and takes a little bit of effort on your part to find the real truth find the the the right way to do things so just what what i'm thinking of is the the difference between the way that we should be naturally preserving foods and just think the mindless 1950s housewife filling their pantry with all these canned goods i'm going to get into the specifics of canned versus fermented in a bit <clears throat> but in general it just fits this theme of the right way to do stuff is not the way that most people do it and you need to do your own research if you're going to figure out the best way to do things if you just follow Well, a lot of people believe it. Uh, Weird Wednesday, over eight and a half thousand on his channel. That shows you that people gravitate towards stupid bullshit. That's what people like. People don't want the truth. They don't want the truth. Tag on. Now I'm going to give you a mashup kind of video right here where I break down multiple things that's on the table. I'm going to show you right here. Now we're going to talk about the supposed be trans woman milk, meaning that, cho, this is dumb, man. Talking about trans people producing milk, we're going to get into this and give it a bam because, like I say, you don't know where the world is heading, but yes, it is destruction. It don't matter what it look like. They head into, but it's destruction. Pay attention. A group of health officials mm -hmm. in the United Kingdom. So these are Listen, government officials. Watch the hand sign. That's the triple sixes right there before they give you the lies. Pay attention here to this dumb shit. They mm -hmm. are now claiming that milk produced by transgender women, so mm -hmm. biological men. You hear that, people? Transgender, biological man can produce milk. You believe that, people? Listen. Because we talk about it already that you shouldn't be drinking animal milk. You're not even drinking the human milk. But guess what? They're not talking about woman milk. They're talking about man transform into woman give you milk. Is that real? Listen. Help of drugs, of course. Help it's of just drugs. as good for babies as mm -hmm. natural female breast milk. Yes, so it's just as good for baby as female breast milk. You hear that, people? This is why I know the world is heading for destruction. I don't know what you see or what you heard, but you can't hide from this. It is what it is. The earth is about destruction. It's a devil earth. Listen. The leaked letter from the University of Sussex Hospital's NHS Trust mm -hmm. insists the term they need to use, we have to use, they say, mm -hmm. human milk. Wow. And it's meant to be gen You have to use human milk, but not woman. Not from the gender who produce it. You have to make a man into a woman and then now give them pill to produce milk because we have to use human milk. Is that stupid? Listen. Neutral. It says that milk from trans women mm -hmm. is, quote, comparable to that produced following the birth of a baby. John what? says that milk from trans women is, quote, comparable to that produced following the birth of a baby. So you hear that, people? The trans woman can produce the same milk as the woman when they supposedly have a baby. Is that real, people? Is that real? By medication, you can make a drag have milk. Is that real, people? What is it they're doing here? Why would they do that? A trans, a trans woman can't have a baby, so why would you let them have milk? Where are the soul trap videos? Where are the soul trap videos? Uh, 
Oh, here, here we go, though. Here's the cash app. Here's the cash app, everyone. For Mag Truth. I'll post this in here. You think it's a real channel? You think it's a real channel? Sometimes I like to do this to show people so many in this realm that are full of shit in this place. Where are the channels that are like mine? I want to know. Eight and a half thousand subscribers here on his channel. I got getting on another bit of breakdown. Now, we're going to take a look at this supposed to be Jacob Rock child right here. As you see at the corner, this Sodomite right here, the devil advocate right here on earth. They tell you passed away at 87 years old. And if you look at this faggot, you know, it's not no 87 years old. Like I tell you, it's the devil advocate working for the devil right here on earth. They have to show you these people right here to let you kind of understand what the world is about. But you never get it. It's all a trickery. These people that own the most money in the world, yes, they're working for the devil. They have to show you human beings, supposedly, walking around and moving around like you, that basically control these things and tell you the supposedly Rothschild family started Israel, meaning they're the one who make that city. And it's not a coincidence why his name is Jacob, and Jacob Rothschild is 66 in numerology no coincidence there let's get into this right here and see what they're talking about with the debt of jacob rothschild make it run british financier and philanthropist mm -hmm. jacob rothschild of the rothschild you hear what they call him financier and also philanthropist you understand that that means they got hands on the people you have to understand that that's why they call him philanthropist they're playing like they're coming to help the people and they might have enough money to save the people's but they never do is the destruction. And because they're puppets working for the devil in this upside down world, they show them up as good people. Pay attention here to this devil right here they have in the corner. Yes, it's a 100% devil advocate right here on earth. These are the face they show you that control the devil system. Listen. Banking dynasty mm -hmm. has died at the age Banking of 87. Dynasty. His family <laughs> is remembering him as a towering presence mm -hmm. and passionate supporter of the arts through Listen. his charities, but he also leaves... No, people, what the fuck is charity? What is charity? Charity is a hoax, 100%. They don't give poor people shit. And you got to ask yourself this question. If they was really giving to charity, how the fuck they would be that rich? Don't be stupid in this dumb world, people. These are the people who actually work in by the devil. That's why they associated with the thing that the devil used to control you here, material money. You got to understand that. What do you think of this character here? He never die. That's what you need to understand. Never die. And this person passed 87 long, long time ago. What kind of game is they playing on the masses? You better understand. He never die. This is a devil puppet right here. Probably have the reptilian in him, 100% in. a complicated legacy with many people online mm -hmm. calling out his family for their role in the mm -hmm. creation of Israel. See, and people? Yes, his family created Israel. Uh, are there great soul trap channels that tell you that you consented to this and, you know, that they, they mislead you a million different ways and fill your heads up with shit? It's just incredible what people follow on YouTube. It really is. And that people can't see the difference. What does that tell you, people, that the world is a fucking stage? 100% in. How did these people, the rap child, supposedly be created? Israel. And guess what, people? You're getting all that drama from Israel. What do you think? America back in Israel. Remember, the supposedly rap child family come from the UK, people. The Europeans. So listen, he put that, they put that supposed to be Israel together and America protecting Israel the whole time. What that tell you people? 
It's just the world stage. All of them is a part of it. The reason why they put the Israel there is for the masses destruction. It's for all the things that you're seeing right now with them and the Palestinians. All of it is set up so they can destroy the people around in those areas. The same fucking Israel controlled by the Rothschild and the devil people of this earth. Why did the devil people have hands in the people that they tell you is the chosen ones? How were the Israelites supposed to be the chosen ones? The, the, the, the, the Israelis. How the Israelis become the chosen one? How they become this, these perfect peoples that, you know, everybody want to kill? And the whole fucking city of Israel was created by these wicked people on earth. Is everything connected to, to, to everything now? Is it connected? Because you should see it. How would these supposed to be family, Rothschild family created Israel and Israel becomes basically a trouble in the whole wide world? They're playing victims and all of this shit. They get so bombed. They get to do these things to the mother peoples because they claim that they was attacked first. You never get it. If these people have hands in that shit, you already know evil of place. You see the star and the flag, people? So they create it and put the flags right there to represent them. The two permit, one up, one down, to represent so above, so below. You never understand, people. All of it put together. Show you the world is a wicked place you live in and it's up side down taylor joins us live in studio with the details of his mm -hmm. legacy emily legacy hi louis i'm Listen. ross child the world is a wicked place you just follow jesus wait for rapture you just follow jesus wait for rapture has been trending high online all Listen. day today many politicians and people in the arts are posting mm -hmm. online mourning his death but there's also people in the arts mourning his death it's all fake with people and like i say the reason why they pull off these characters off the scene to make them big, you get it or not. Remember, they tell you how much money these people have, the richest peoples in the world. They control banking. What that tell you, people, just like they show you Mark Zuckerberg and all these characters, Elon Musk, and show you that they supposedly be the richest people in the earth. You don't understand. It's the same fucking people's right there behind the wall the devil advocates that's who they work for they work for the devil himself okay keep your right here in earth and don't worry about it it's a reason why they can a basic a control money if you want to be real how they get so much trillions of dollar they own basically three quarter of the money that's floating around do you believe that people and it's not a coincidence why they come from those regions. The same place that print every money in the world. So you see the control people. You see how they run you right here on this side of the earth. I already told you. They give these people props when they take you here. These ones is the one that going to control you. Gate keep you in here and everything. So they give them these big ranking. Yes, rank them way up there. With what? Money. Money is the ranking at the end of the day for these supposed be devil peoples that control you on earth right here and get keeping you in here. People creating a stir online, mm -hmm. pointing to how his family is connected with mm -hmm. the Balfour Declaration, as uh -huh. often considered a founding document in the Israel-Palestine conflict. Yeah, that people, the founding document. And remember, they already know that the war was going to go on, people. That's the reason why they put it there. You don't understand. They predict this shit from day one. They put it out there with the war in Israel and all of these things. And this is what they plan, people. It's a part of the damn script. So Israel can play basically what they call them victims. Play victims of this world. And everywhere you go, they're going to tell you, oh, look at Jews. Jews been persecuted. You see them show you the Hitler. Oh, he can get away with saying things on his channel. I got to be careful that I can't say on my channel. Because I don't want to risk my channel for this baby truther shit. And that's what it is. It won't help you get out of here at all. On again with another bit of breakdown.
Now we go talk about the supposedly weight loss craze that's going on right now all over the world. Everybody into this supposedly weight loss, fast weight loss, because it's a trend. You understand? Something that they put on you and now you find yourself more bigger, huge. You understand that obesity start taking effect. And now these people are going to show up all these things to cure it. You understand? This one they call it Neptunes right there. And don't worry about it. They're going to tell you it wasn't made for weight loss. You understand? It made for something else. But the social medias and all of these things that they have now pushing these things and the masses, now they're using it for weight loss. We're going to get into it. And I'm going to show you some things, the destruction that come in from people eager to lose weight. Make it run. The Food and Drug Administration mm -hmm. has issued warnings about a potentially addictive dietary supplement. Yes, and it's addictive. You hear that? It's addictive. And don't worry about the FDA supposed to be warning you about these things. They're all a part of it. It might sound funny, but they're all involved in the destruction. They're all a part of it. They're all a part of it. Bam. Bam. They're all a part of it. They're all a part of it. Mega on again, and I'm gonna nail it down with this mass shit that they got for the masses. Use the TV to fool the people with mass wearing sodomites, and you go get it on this bit of truth. We go get into it and break it down and show you some things because a lot of people's been sleeping on this shit right here. We go get into it and break it down, let you see some things with these mass wearing people, and that's all you see on TV. Make it run. You may not be easily fooled, but mm -hmm. a recent study showed that a third of people mm -hmm. couldn't tell at a glance which of these are masks. Of course they can't tell. What do you think? Why you think they use this on TV to fool the people? Why you think that? You believe that the people is that smart to spot masks on TV? I don't think so. I don't believe they even can spot it in real life. Wow. The study showed that a third of mm -hmm. people couldn't tell of at course. a glance. Of course. Now take a look at these right here. This one kind of look like the Mr. Sensible. The so-called guy that always trying to debunk the mag. But pay attention right here. Mass wearing people. Yes, it, they look just the same. But you have to have discernment to spot them. They can't pass the mag. Just like a damn transgender. You understand? Move. Which of these mm -hmm. are masks? Sure, they go by really mm -hmm. fast. But when many people were given unlimited time, they still couldn't tell. Mm -hmm. Now, take a look at this right here, people. Take a look at that right there. Now... That's not a sophisticated mass, but this is how they do it when they so called showing their hands. They're gonna show you the one that you can spot. You understand me? But I already told you on TV they use sophisticated mass. There's no way the regular human being can spot it. Still couldn't tell. Mm -hmm. Follow the mag. You give the mag cash app money. You give the mag cash app money. You follow the Jesus. You give the mag. Cash up money, you get out of the wicked, the wicked, the wicked world. Mm -hmm. When they're given as, as long as they like, they're having a really hard time and mm -hmm. giving us the wrong answer mm -hmm. uh, to this seemingly simple question mm -hmm. on about one in five trials. Mm -hmm. We've all seen masks like these in movies like mm -hmm. Mission Impossible. Mm -hmm. You <laughs> see why you th the people don't understand what you think a while ago, what you just see right here. What is that? All of them in Hollywood wear the mask. What you think? What you think? What you think? It's just that simple. I don't know why the people can't get it. It's just people wearing masks in Hollywood. Just a deception. Pay attention right there. So this is a real guy, so-called in life, a movie star. You see him right there? And of course, he gonna just tear off the face and it's somebody else. What that tell you? So when you see this guy again in the movie, you actually believe that it's, it's the real person? No, people, it's just masks they're wearing. All Hollywood characters, their looks altered. That's what they do. Masks like mm -hmm. these in movies like Mission there you Impossible. Go. Mm -hmm. They have made it out of Hollywood and are being mm -hmm. used to fool people in real life mm -hmm. and even commit crimes. Mm -hmm. Like this masked bank robber in California. And, and it's always California, people. If you notice, all those so-called mask-wearing bandits come from california why you think they're hoaxes 100 percent. of course that's where hollywood is they're playing with the dumb masses police were mm -hmm. looking for someone of a particular description mm -hmm. and it mm -hmm. later transpired that they'd been looking for someone uh who who was totally different mm -hmm. so more i spoke to mm -hmm. rob jenkins 
He's a psychologist who has published studies mm -hmm. looking at facial perception using hyper-realistic masks. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about these experiments you've been running in recent years, um, looking at how these masks are indeed fooling people? Mm -hmm. uh, these hyper-realistic masks break the connection that mm -hmm. we've all become... Take a look at this one right here, people. This is how most of the YouTubers that show up. This is how they have it. And the masses, they're wearing a mask. You just have to see it. The people just stupid. What is the Anthony Fall shit? What is the Joe Biden? You better wake up. What is the Donald Trump? <laughs> they are all mass wearing people and the masses. That's what you need to know. Between mm -hmm. facial appearance and identity. And mm -hmm. we were interested in whether people are getting away with that kind of Of course. Because... Of course. That's what TV do every day. They get away with the same shit that you're talking about right here. You're trying to tell the masses. That is regular people doing it, but it's Hollywood. That's what it's about, people. Uh, mm -hmm. People just aren't paying attention. They don't, mm -hmm. don't see any reason to, to yeah. mm -hmm. be uh, looking at a particular person's face. It's the same thing on TV. They don't, they don't have no reason to look at the person particularly like, is that person look real or whatever? No, they're not doing that. They're just going to suck up what the fuck they're saying and move. Or maybe mm -hmm. they're, they're just not expecting to see something mm -hmm. like... Yes, exactly. They don't expect to see it on TV either, unless it's a damn movie or a TV show. Okay, so I got to jump in again. Um, I'm not asking for money, but Mag Truth is. This Mag Bitter Truth. So donate to him via Cash App. Because people think that he's the same as my channel. Somehow. He's getting thousands of views. nine, Almost 10,000 views on this video since February. So this is the level most people are at. Most truthers on YouTube are at this level. They follow this stuff. Good job. Good job. Good job. Good job. Good job. Just follow that. They don't understand the people that read the news also mask up on you. Mask. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't occur to them that that mm -hmm. might be what they're seeing. Mm -hmm. uh, or if the, the the masks really are so realistic that mm -hmm. they just pass for regular humans, mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. we wanted to to test that more formally, we have this computer-based task where we're showing mm -hmm. people pairs of images on screen, and they just have to say which one is the mask. Mm -hmm. Now, one eye symbol in, in, in the a back. Ways. One is just kind of mm -hmm. at a glance, so it's mm -hmm. to model the sort of situation where you know someone walks past. We're talking like a you know half a mm -hmm. second or something mm -hmm. to just catch your eye. Um, and we, we did that because we thought this task might be too easy and we'll just see everyone's performing perfectly. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, that wasn't the case at all. So people were terrible at making these discriminations. Mm -hmm. You hear that? It was a... You hear what they just said, people? The masses is terrible at finding out the mass wearing people. That's what they know that. They know that for sure. Remember this. If you're not up on the game, there's no way you're going to look for people be wearing masks. That's what they do on TV. You understand? So you're not looking for that because you're not aware of it. Now that the truth hit you, you need to start paying attention. Look at these people that they used to program you. They give you them for idol and everything. Check who they are. Check out. Look at them. You can see it if you pay attention. Most of them wearing masks on TV. Brief presentation. Mm -hmm. So we decided to make it easier on them and just say, okay, you can take as long as you like. Mm -hmm. And when they're given as, as long as they like, that improves performance a little bit, mm -hmm. but they're having a really hard time and mm -hmm. giving us the wrong answer. But at least you're telling them to look for somebody wearing a mask. You show two, two photos and basically one of them wearing a mask. At least you let them know that somebody wearing a mask. You understand me? But on TV, who tell you they're wearing masks? The mag, bam, you need to start checking. To so the seemingly mm -hmm. simple question on about one in five trials. Mm -hmm. That's actually one of the reasons I find this so interesting is that we're evolutionarily programmed to mm -hmm. pick up on facial cues. It's so much of our social interaction, mm -hmm. um, yet you have these masks that aren't necessarily 100% realistic still fooling. No, because it's what all the people was programmed. They program like that. They don't pay attention to those kind of shit. They basically take TV as word. Anything they say, they take it and run. That's it. Mm -hmm. Humans are social animals. Mm -hmm. So... Mm -hmm. We rely very much on, on getting whatever insight we can mm -hmm. into each other's mental states from, mm -hmm. from our appearance. So 
we can tell if someone's following along in conversation. We can tell if they're cross with us or pleased mm -hmm. to see us or skeptical of what we're telling them. And, and we need to do that. We mm -hmm. also need to be able to connect it to particular individuals so that when we see them again, mm -hmm. we can remember what happened mm -hmm. last time and mm -hmm. behave accordingly. And this isn't necessarily for fun and games. There's actually been some reports of these being used in crimes to conceal identity. Mm -hmm. right? All bullshit. We started to notice mm -hmm. a few years ago that we were seeing reports in the news of mm -hmm. things like bank robberies where, say, the police were looking for someone of a particular description Mm -hmm. And it later transpired that they'd been looking for someone uh, who who was totally different from you. Well, opinion. well, until somebody tell them, they would have never know. That's what you need to know. But I believe that these stories are coming out of Hollywood, basically, with these mask wearing robbers. It's a hoax. All of them is. But the real deal is when you're watching TV and these people giving you information. I'm not talking about movies and tv shows i'm talking about the main brainwash programming that they got for tv the people that you see on there all of them masked up character bam um mm -hmm. part of the solution might be mm -hmm. to look for other cues that conflict with the the signal you're getting from the face there mm -hmm. could be let's see what we need to look for to spot a mask from this dude right here pay attention look at this right here mm -hmm. now Tell me right here, people, if you see this right here, would you believe that it's a real person? Just take a look at it. No, this don't look like a real person. This look like mass to me. That's how you have to look at it, people, because when you look at certain, certain people on TV, you can tell they create the photo or if it's a moving, if it's a moving so-called video or whatever, it's a mass wearing person. That's how they do it. So if they show you a picture and say this person missing, they can just create that photo, put that shit together and just make it a photo and say, yeah, this person missing. Now, if they show you a video, it's a mass wearing sodomite. That's how they do it. Watch this right here. Age, so mm -hmm. the way the person is moving. It looks nah, like nah, you don't notice that on TV. Very old and mm -hmm. wrinkled and, and mm -hmm. That's all it's a see. mask wearing sodomite. That's what it is. Bam, bam. What do you mean, like the Joe Biden with no wrinkle on the jaw but around the eyes wrinkle? Huh? Push up Joe that's 80 years old. Same type of shit. Mismatching. Mm -hmm. There you so go. There are a number of things mm -hmm. you could look for that are not directly to do with facial appearance, but mm -hmm. exploits the facial appearance mm -hmm. in conjunction with other messages that you're getting. Mm -hmm. and, and that sort of conflict could be um, a part of the detection story. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now they teach you to spot the mask. <laughs> I told you already, people. You just have to pay attention. Your discernment will bring you to if you are aware of it. You understand? If you are, if you're not aware of it, there's no way you're gonna spot this shit right here. Never. Classic masks mm -hmm. aren't anything new. We've seen mm -hmm. them in the movies, but mm -hmm. what seems to be new is that the price has been coming down quite. Oh, the price is um, coming down. The price is coming down. And I already told you, people. Once you see them with it in the street, it's not the real deal. <laughs> you understand me? Just remember that shit. It's not the real deal. That's just the one that they hand on to the public. The one that they use on TV. They're not going to give it to you. So don't be thinking that it's real sophisticated Hollywood masks they have with the so-called bank robbery and all of this dumb shit. No. Those masks is just for Hollywood. Maybe the evolution mm -hmm. of the, and the news. Here, how this is becoming more mm -hmm. available for regular folks like us. Yeah. I think this started yeah. off in mm -hmm. like Hollywood special effects industry. Mm -hmm. and there are a few... Uh, craftsmen mm -hmm. who were who were masters of this particular mm -hmm. form of artistry and uh, were involved in sculpting and monster making and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. And they developed these techniques using various materials over the years. Mm -hmm. They started around six hundred up to a thousand, maybe fifteen hundred dollars. So mm -hmm. I have one here that's uh, it's kind of an old favorite. This one. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, um, it's mm -hmm. made of the silicone material. So mm -hmm. he say fifteen hundred dollars, but. What you have to understand, people, like I don't tell you, these that they show you is not the real Hollywood mask. Yeah, it can look close, but it's not the real Hollywood mask. You understand? Most people can never spot the real mask that they use on TV. Move. Mm -hmm. As you can see right there, pay attention. These are all masks right here. They give the masks. You see that? And they put a lot of work into it. You see that right there? Make the eyelash, eyebrows, and everything. 
there you go right there this is what they used to fool the dumb people you still sleep it's time for you to wake up all hollywood characters wear masks yes the news reporters and everybody all silicone masks they got on the people it's too sophisticated for you to spot that's your business time for you to wake up there you go this is what they do for tv anything they show you time for you to wake up there you go there you go it's watered down virgin any one of these that they show up water down virgin are the hollywood real deal mask that they it's use. watered down virgin watered down virgin again on another bit of breakdown now we go take a breakdown to this supposed to be shooting that went on in the joe Osteen church the lakewood church that they have in houston that devil fucking worship shit they have on for the masses we're gonna show you some things how they pull off a big old ox right there in the lakewood church we're gonna talk about it by the way lakewood is 36 in numerology we're gonna talk about it with the joe Osteen, a devil puppet right here make it run news out of Houston, a five-year-old child and a 57-year-old man were shot at a Houston church this afternoon. So you listen, people, a five-year-old and a 57-year-old man. The 57 is a number 12 coding. We'll give you a number three, but you listen. Pay attention. All this right here was happening in the Lakewood church, supposedly. Pay attention again. Seven-year-old man were shot uh -huh. at a Houston church this afternoon. Houston police responded to a shooting at Pastor Joel mm -hmm. Osteen's Lakewood Church around 2 p.m. this afternoon. Officials say the suspected shooter, a woman armed with a long gun, has been killed. So listen, people, a woman with a long gun have been killed. They're trying to tell you that a woman run up in the church with a long gun and then they shoot her and she dead and that's it. But pay attention, people. Where does the five-year-old come from? That got shot. Pay attention. You're going to learn more. Listen. Police say she walked into the church mm -hmm. and started firing shots not long after. Uh -huh. Officials say after she was shot, mm -hmm. they were. You can see right there. They were the recordings right there. Three sixes in the background. Coding people. Pay attention here. Nothing real. But look. Also told that she mm -hmm. had a potential bomb with her. Okay. So when did she say she have the bomb? After she got shot? After she went up in there firing shots, they say they shoot her down right there because of those police off duty cops that working at the, the Lakewood church. So pay attention, people. When did the woman shout out that she have a bomb? After she got shot? Listen right here. Once um, Listen. she went down, mm -hmm. um, the officers reported back to us that she threatened uh, that she had a bomb. So you hear that, people? After she went down, they, the police that shoot her, I guess, report back to them right here that she have a bomb. She threatened that she have a bomb, as you could see the stars right there, to represent the damn fallen peoples right here. But pay attention to the story and see if you can put it together. Listen. So mm -hmm. we searched her vehicle, mm -hmm. our bomb squad, mm -hmm. um, and also the backpack. No uh -huh. explosives were found. Uh -huh. But she was also spraying some type of substance. Listen. On the ground. When she run up in the building firing guns, firing a shot out of a long gun. When did she get time to spray stuff on the ground? When did she get a chance to tell you she have a bomb? The whole thing is a hoax, people. She have a bomb. She have a bomb. I watched the whole thing play out. Can you believe? again on bitter truth style now we go take a breakdown to this character that you see on screen wendy williams as you could see it right there in the orange dress and all in the pyramid and the hand sign now we did a lot of videos on this one right here coming up you know from back in the days basically showing you that it is a man in a drag on tv they use it for the damn deception but you see it on a talk show and you know even get a star on the hollywood walk of fame this same character right here over a talk show supposed to be talking about the same people like this one right here in Hollywood eating out this devil pot. 
So we're going to talk about this one. And now it becomes a big star on the masses and Lifetime right here making a movie supposedly on this one. And it's not the first time Lifetime give you a movie with this fake character right here trying to make you, you know, interested in it. And now they have the agenda. Let's get into it right here and give it a bam. I was six years old. Mm -hmm. All I wanted was to be famous. Listen, you hear that? From six years old, that's according. But you have to understand, remember, this is what they push on the masses. You understand? Fame and fortune. That's what they've been sucking up ever since there was babies. You have to understand with those programming that they give to your youths from their young is to be famous or, or, you know, fiending for fame and money and all this world got to offer. All illusion, 100%. And the Wendy Williams is a part of it. So they have to give you the supposed story at this one right here and see where it's going to end. Look. Time to Documentary of the Wendy Williams. Mm -hmm. And it's ex executive produced by Wendy Williams, the same character. Wendy Williams is a bomb. It's a bomb. A bomb. And pay attention here, people. I'm going to show you that they're full of shit on the masses. Just program Pay attention it. now. Bomb. Bomb. Pay attention. And they give you with these characters. It was a reason why they bring the Wendy Williams. To the scene and i already told you for all the awards including the star in the these things are fake on tv these things are fake on tv i teach you i teach you here high level channel bam bam the walk of fame hollywood walk of fame is to put these puppets on to show you they did something to deceive you that's why they get that award and those stars for them name to be, you know, never forgetting. You can never forget their name, supposedly, when they put it in stone in a damn star to represent the fallen ones. Pay attention. Walking, the boss is walking. Pay attention, no people. There you go with the star in the hand and even on the clothing to represent the fallen angels. That's what they do. You have to understand, this one deceived the masses a great amount. That's why they give it a... A star right there on the walk of fame. Pay attention here. That's a man in a drag. A 100% drag. Pay attention. Pay attention. Ass is right here. Watch. People mm -hmm. love Wendy. You are mm -hmm. a star. People love she Wendy. What a joke. Anyone. Take a look at it, people. He look this figure. A bad shape it character. They give you right there for a female. You see what it is? Have some melon on the chest. Have no supposed be shape. Period. Pay attention here. Take a look at it right there. Is that a is that a woman? Everybody gone dumb and take a look at the foot. Take a look at the legs. We break it down all the time and show you this is just a devil character right here. And it's not a woman by a long shot. Wake your ass up with a back. Take a look at the foot. Take a look at the foot. Well, yeah. Take a look, coding. Number three coding. And take a look. They make it look like people going crazy for the Wendy Williams. It's bullshit. This is how they make puppets. A star on the masses so right here. Take a look. Orange dress all the time. Mm -hmm. And then the peak oh, Go back right and here, people. There you go. There go the star right there in Hollywood. To have a talk show? Better wake your ass up like I tell you. It's just the people that they want to put on on the masses. All Decepticon. Mm -hmm. Take a look. Mm -hmm. Pay attention here. Mm -hmm. Empty chair. She was gone, supposedly. And take a look at this right here, people. Take a look at it right there. When it look like a woman, you tell me. <laughs> it's a damn joke, people, that they can pass. <laughs> it's a damn joke. It's a damn joke. Soft these ugly creatures and the masses and they buy it. What is that you're looking at on screen right there? Wow, unbelievable. Run it. Ready? Yeah. Ready? Look at the eyes. All right. Mm -hmm. And away we go. Mm -hmm. Look All at this I know right is how to be famous. I really All you know is to is not to be famous. What does that mean, people? Famous? Wow. I told you, people, it's just brainwash they give you on screen. All Decepticons, everybody they give you is deceivers. You have to remember that Wendy Williams is a big part of the government agendas with what the mass is going to go to in these times. Pay attention here. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Tell look at it, it people. Can't walk now. It lean and bent up. Take a look at it. Straight like a damn matchstick. Right there. That's a woman. Look right here. Pay attention what they're telling you now. They go the Wendy Williams. Take a look at it, people. Wow, a damn scary sight. Right there. What's going on? Yes, now you understand. Why did they put this Wendy Williams right here in the damn spotlight? Nothing special about it. It's just something they want to give you as an agenda right here. Pay attention and you see it. Watch this right here. It gone retarded. That's what they show you right here. Pay attention. Devil horns. Pay attention. Mm -hmm. Laughing at you. And then it dragged the devil horns right there. Like I tell you, this is how they do it. Pay attention here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you see a neurologist to find on. out if I'm crazy? Neurologist, pay attention to find out if it's crazy. Take a look at the eyes, people. Why is the eyes pop out the head? Why is everything change about this one face right here? It get more potent. What you think, people? You look more scarier in the damn face. What it is that they, they make the mass look more intensive? What as, a, as that person said, it's not a knock on me. It's uh it's comparable content to my channel, and apparently this guy is a soul trap channel, and he covers what I cover, but I, I don't see where it is. I don't see anything here, even covering feminism, much less the soul trap. Where are the videos here covering what I cover? Where are they? Where are the damn videos here covering what I cover? on the bit of truth in full effect now we're gonna break down some things right um um um they say up in in africa right here as you could see the ground supposed to be split all the way and they're telling you that this part of the african country right here gonna just wash away in the sea no lie this wash is a, wash away bam bam what they tell you that the continent actually break off into two pieces right there. We're gonna talk about it and see what's the agenda behind this faker right here. We're gonna talk about it. Just make it run. Of Nairobi, Kenya, experience an earthquake like movement. So this right here is in Naomi, Kenya, right there. So they're trying to tell you that this just happened suddenly. Not just, you know, over time, but it just happened suddenly. Um, this Bam, that's a damn lie. Bam, bam. Listen again, pay attention. Bam, pay attention. Bam. Residents of Nairobi, Kenya experienced an earthquake like movement at exactly 10 27 p.m. yesterday. You hear that, people? 10 27. That's the coding. Wow, for three sevens. Don't doubt when I tell you. Three seven is a hoax code. And that's the reason why they tell you that exact time. They tell you this happened. It's bullshit. So you're trying to tell me that just one event caused this? What was it? An earthquake, you say, shake? And this happened? Wake up, people. Take a look at this right here. You never see a split this long in the damn earth. Which is the 28th of April, 2023. Mm -hmm. there was a 28th of April. Wow, sound like another coding, but listen. Earthquake, which was felt in various towns in the country earlier this evening. Okay, so they call it an earthquake, people. And they wasn't saying that it was a big earthquake for, say, people just feel a little trimming, just a little trembling. And this happened, as you could see, they show you right there, the old hurt supposed to be sitting in water, and then piece of it break off right there in Africa. And they tell you it's going to just wash away and see Pay attention here. It's to Africa splitting into two continents. Look at this. Africa is slowly but surely tearing into two. Like so, so, so take a look at this, people, from what they show you at first, that red dirt area that they show you, and now they show you this. It, this one look way deeper right here. Pay attention. Geology. Take a look. It's an extremely long process that will take mm -hmm. millions of years, but it will eventually see part of East Africa chip off from the rest of the continent, huh? likely resulting in a new ocean arising between the two landmasses. Yeah. The colossal breakup is associated with the East African Rift system, 
one of the largest rifts in the world that stretches downward for thousands of kilometers. So what you want us to believe right here, you want us to believe that this happened naturally? What caused the continent to break up in pieces? Does that make sense to you people? They're talking about an earthquake. We shall tell you it's a damn hoax. There ain't such thing as titanic plates. It's fake shit, people. 100% fakery. So the ground attached to the damn tectonic plate and the tectonic plate shift by itself and it comes no damn no damn tectonic plate no damn tectonic plate cause the earth to shake it's dumb people it's 100 percent dumb but this is what you buy into and of course if you buy into it they can bring a lot of science nothing shake the earth nothing nothing in the name of tectonic plates Pay attention here. Several mm -hmm. countries in Africa, look at this. Ethiopia. Now take a look at this right here, people. This look like a trench. This look like a little trench right there, not even two feet deep. Can you see that, people? So how can they show you a different area at some point? They show you some deeper area with the hole in the ground. It's fake shit. Just an illusion they give you right here in Naomi. It's fakery. 100% percent in the Democratic Republic of Congo, Look at Uganda. this. Rwanda. And go back again. Go back, people. Go back. Of kilometers mm -hmm. through several countries in Africa. Yes, so hold on here, man. You think you can fool the people? Take a look. Go back again. Pay attention. Thousands look. Of kilometers through several right countries. there, people. Right there. So look, this is where it's at right there. Do you believe it, people? Unbelievable. So they can't get away with this. This is a 100% talk. So if it's an earthquake and the earth split open, what happened to right here? This is where it starts from. And that don't look like a crack, people. That look like somebody dig out a trench. You have to understand that. Why is this part right here round if it's a crack? I'm talking about the tip. The tip of this right here where it started. It can't be a round, supposed to be edge. It's supposed to have a straight edge if it's a crack. Okay, so they didn't understand who we are here. And guess what, people? It didn't even touch the road where car drive. <laughs> They forgot who they're dealing with here with this bit of truth. They can't pass off no fake here. Okay, so the road right there didn't touch, tell you. It's just a scheme they set up for the dumb masses. Why don't they split all the way across the road? Yes, that would affect some things there. But they just dig a trench there. Look at it. That's not deep, people. About two feet or five feet deep. Africa, including Ethiopia, Look Kenya, at that right there, people. That's just a trench. And look, people, even some part skip out and never crack. What happened? The earth shake all at once and you get the cracking and it stop right here. Wow. Unbelievable. That's all I can say. Let's see more. Republic of Congo, mm -hmm. Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, look at Zambia, this. Tanzania, Malawi, and Mozambique. Mm -hmm. This earth system needs Yes, and watch him right here standing on it, people. What that tell you? What is this? They show you here. We see sinkhole in Florida that deeper than these shits right here that suck up house. What is this they're showing you right here? It's just a hoax. 100%. And when you go back and check, you're going to find out what's going on. The government agenda with these countries right here. Splitting them up and everything. That's what they do. Pay attention. That's African plate splitting into two plates. Mm -hmm. The smaller Somalian plate and the larger... Okay. Plate. I'm going to ask you a question. Go back again. Now... This is what's going to fuck them right here. Now, the tectonic plate shift, people, and the piece of earth break off. Now, show me where is the tectonic plate. Did it break off with this piece of supposed land that's that going to go to the sea now? Please tell me, people, what is tectonic plate and where it's at. Why you can't tell the masses what happened to the tectonic plate there. It shift. Does it break in half? Wow, so you're telling us the whole earth is sitting on these tectonic plates and they can move with the heavy earth sitting on it? Wow, this is the dumbest shit in the world, people. And plus they tell you living on a spinning ball, anything spin gonna shake. It's not balanced. You ever see a wheel on a car? <laughs> That's not balanced. Can you imagine how much it shake? This shit going a thousand miles per hour that no car can go. You better wake your ass up, people. What's going on here? You get nothing but tricky with this earth. Don't believe this psyop right here that they show you. The smaller in Africa. Somalian plate and the larger Nubian plate. 
that are pulling you away from each other and they're pulling away peace. what the a joke so you. the plate broke and look what they're showing you a different scene again people it's just fakery look back in 2018 mm -hmm. news of a crack emerging in kenya mm -hmm. went viral with mm -hmm. many claiming that this was evidence of africa snapping into two you see uh-huh why this startling scene was related to the east african race okay system. so it's the same crap they're talking about that people were showing online before is it the same crack right here still cracking listen as some scientists reported at that time you better wake your ass up you better wake your ass up pay attention this was likely just a highly localized expression of the valley's regular rifting activity the east african system has been in this current process for around shit, 25 people. million years ago wow. and the crack in when this expression of the valley's regular rifting activity the east african rift system has been in this current process for around 25 million years ago 25 million years ago and who the fuck tell you that where did you get your information about 25 million years ago who tell you that a human being there's no human being have no recollection on 25 million years you should never take shit from the human beings that long what's going on here people you can't even go back 2000 years they can't tell you shit happened but you think they can go back 25 million years and tell you things was in progress it's bullshit people the wake your ass up Kenya was an indirect whisper of what's occurring on the continent however in another 5 million to 10 million years uh -huh. changes in the east african yes resistance. 5 million to 10 million years what a dumb shit. i guess you can sit there and look forward to that why the fuck they tell you that this is a joke right here people 100 percent joke don't believe nothing that come from these region remember they tell you that's the motherland they have to keep you off keep you up to date with sire for you to believe that bam two sections of africa <laughs> Black the and continent white. have started to move apart and this change is associated with the east african rift system mm -hmm, the drift system look at this oh shit white men use technology stop right at road stop right at road now take a look people what they're showing you every time they change the damn scene they show you something else look again pay attention is that the same thing imagine standing on a continent which is about to be torn apart Mm -hmm. This is going to be a seismic shift not seen in millions of years, and mm -hmm. it's happening right now in Africa. What the continent, called? known for its vast deserts and diverse wildlife, mm -hmm. is slowly splitting into two. But what forces are powerful enough to break a continent? And how does such a massive change go almost unnoticed? Mm -hmm. Look at From this. the sudden appearance... People, you have to understand this. You have to go back and check. Like I mentioned about the sinkhole in Florida, most part. You're going to know this is the same kind of shit they show you. So what happened is the ground, basically, because I do believe that it's Florida doing that shit with the water because they have to have ponds and all of these water areas. And then when the rain fall, those things fall. And then it slowly, slowly saturated the earth. That means anything sit on it heavy, going to fall into a hole. You have to remember, because they keep the water there, the water is all these ponds and these streams and these things that they set up there in Florida. That's the reason why you get sinkhole. So yes, the dirt with water, heavily soaked with water, yes, shit starts sinking in because it's built on top of the dirt. And that's exactly what's going on. And guess what? Even some part of the, under the dirt is basically have hollow places in there. You understand what I mean? rocks and dirt mixed up and you know sometimes they build on a foundation and they're thinking that it's firm and then later on like i say water and everything just bring the whole thing down don't let them fool you about the whole continent is breaking off and he's telling you about millions a year before this supposedly take place it's bullshit Does such a massive change go almost unnoticed from the sudden appearance of giant rifts to the birth of get a new ocean here. Every mm -hmm. twist in this tale, the chart of a new ocean. What do you mean by that? You mean another area just get full up with salt water? I already explained it and tell you in my podcast, the Tuesday podcast, to show you that yes, they let the water in here. That water didn't come from the earth, people. Where does it come from? 
these big body of salt water that cover the whole wide world. Where does it come from, people? Remember, it's not a rain from the sky. Where is that water come from? And it can't go nowhere. It's sitting there the whole time. What happened? How did that water get in here? Yes, that's the water that the whole wide earth is sitting in, period. The earth is sitting in water. It actually covered by a dome and sitting in water. So these people right here have to let that water in. That's the same salt water that surrounds us. The whole earth is sinking in damn water. It's in water. It's not on a land sitting down. So yes, it's on the water. And that's how that salt water get in. They're the one who let it in some way, somehow. So they can tell you about new oceans that pop up because they're the one who doing it. Most of these oceans, they show you that America is a part of his fake shit. Listen. Challenges our understanding of Earth's dynamics. Look at this. Earth Join dynamics. us as we explore this monumental uh -huh. transformation set to reshape the very face of our planet. Mm -hmm. Historical context. It all begins with the transformative theory of plate tectonics. Yes, and it's bullshit theory from bullshitters. That's what they want to sell the people who have low IQ. They can't sell the people that who actually are going to look into these things. So listen to me, people. As far as, despite of dirt that they show you that these things sinking and opening up, they actually tell you that below these surfaces, then they got these melted rocks burning, soup-like. That's what they call a volcano. So it's beneath the earth somewhere. The same place they get the fucking oil, man. Sometimes I'm pissed off that the people believe in all these psyops. All of it is for your destruction. Everything that they give you. They give you a tectonic plate. They can use that so-called tectonic plate name to kill off everybody. You have to understand that. Remember, that's what they told you happened in supposedly, you know, Rome and Italy and them places when they tell you the shit just a, a, a volcano came to and freeze everybody into rock. That's what they told you and show you new fake people in rocks over there. Like I tell you people, they can destroy you and just put it on that same shit that you believe in. You can't believe in volcano no more. It's fake shit. There ain't no fucking hot, burning, melted rocks under the ground just lurks in and ready to bust out. It's fake shit. So yes, it's the same place they're digging to find oil to, to basically supply the whole wide world to make electric, to, to run cars, run planes, run every damn thing that's moved. The same oil that they dig from the ground that got that fireball down there, people. Melted rocks running and bubbling like soap. The whole wide world is dumb, people. And now they're going to tell you that tectonic plate is beyond these. And then when it shifts, you get an earthquake. I even can split off a piece of the world. What a dumb shit for the people. This here. groundbreaking concept, revolutionizing our understanding of Earth's dynamics. Reveals right, yeah. the ongoing division of the African plate into the Somali. You see, and... the African got another plate right there, people. It's fake shit. The plate is bullshit. It's 100% bullshit. And if you want to believe that, that's your business. But it's going to lead you to bullshit. That's all it's going to do. Like I tell you, we're sitting in water. They find a way to let the water in. Yes, and it's a lot of deception. It covers a lot of grounds that the masses could have been walking on. Instead, it's just deep waters. It's harder for the masses to explore the earth with all these waters on it. That's the reason why they do it. Yes, it's kind of like a damn cover-up. And tell you about 2,000 years ago, we have a big old flood that flood the whole wide world. And then what happened? The water receded and leave the seawater there still salty. It's bull crap. In plates. This rift, a phenomenon dating back 25 million years ago, mm -hmm. showcased... Nobody shouldn't take nothing from you when you mentioned 25 million years ago, where the fuck did you get that information from, dude? It's all bullshit. It's a world in constant motion, mm -hmm. stretching thousands of kilometers across East Africa. Over decades, scientists have unraveled the mysteries of this rift, from theories of Look crustal density differences to the influential shit. role of mantle. There you go, people. It's a joke. It's a, it's a joke, people. It's a joke. It's a joke, people. It's a joke. Again, now with another bit of truth breakdown.
Now we're gonna talk about the supposed the European protest right here that they got going on. As you could see, you could see Greece right there. You see Italy right there. They have France right there, and also Belgium protest for farmers. Just like they give you the Ottawa truck convoy. You remember that? The hoax that they pull off in Canada, all government operation why they did keep that vaccine mandate on on the people while they protest for that shit. The guts to understand none of these things right here is really the people. It's just government operation to bend and twist the masses. Now with them supposed to be farmers right here protesting and causing all these problems supposedly be trying to get an eye on farmers because when you check it out maybe some farmers live over there in europe now because we already know in this side farmers is gone they put too much pressure on them to even feed the masses anything at all too much pressure they put on the farmers so therefore the farmers is gone they're non-existence on these sides so listen in these areas right here in europe yes they have some farmers left and this is all they're gonna get rid of them. Remember, I tell you, they're exchanging everything else out. Get rid of naturality to give you. Oh, he's he's not a special channel. Is that what you're saying? This isn't a special channel. Where's the soul trap stuff over here? I'm looking for the soul trap stuff. Mag again on with another disturbing truth. Now today we go take a breakdown to this so-called Emmalanian salt that you see right here, this pink looking thing that people, you know, stuck on right now. Now, what you have to understand about salt is it's never good for the human being body. Salt, you understand? If you consume too much of this thing right here, yes, it could be dangerous for your body in the long run. But what they're gonna do is bring you some new style and some new things like this right here, this Amalayan salt, to basically have the masses eat salt and thinking that it's good for them. That's some bullshit. We go get into this right here and break it down. And I'm gonna show you how salt really come into play right here. Let it run. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As you could see right there, they're cutting it like a big old rock, people. Take a look at this shit right here. We go get into it and they go show you where this shit come from right here, the new craze for salt, the Himalayan salt right here. The mass is just dumb. It's a new way to kill off the people. Make it run. Himalayan salt doesn't actually come from the Himalayas. Mm -hmm. It's mined yes. 186 miles away in mm -hmm. Pakistan. 186 miles from Pakistan. Take a look at this right here, people. So it's rocks that taste salty, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks to its pink hue and supposed health benefits, mm -hmm. the salt benefit people. Do you believe that? What kind of health benefit come from salt? I told you people, this is the way they trick the masses. Health benefit in salt. Why? Because it's pink. Why? Because it's so-called Himalayan salt. He just tell you. You got to have the pink salt. The pink salt. It's not really from the Himalaya. What is this right here? Some pink rocks from, from, from Pakistan that tastes like salt? Okay. It's exploded in popularity since the late 2000s. Mm -hmm. You Today see, it's every time they have a new food for your people, it just explode. Where it come from? The people just stupid. Into lamps, statues, and mm -hmm. of course, table salt. Table salt. By extracting the coveted salt means descending into dark caves. Mm -hmm. and you see, they always have to tell the masses about blasting in caves. The same way they tell you they get gold, diamonds, and everything else, even oil. It's not real, people. This is another psyop they bring to the masses with the salt. It's the same damn salt. What's the difference? Because it's pink. Wow. Look rock. at this shit. It's bullshit. Mm -hmm. We went inside the mine, turning this mountain into 400,000 mm -hmm. tons of pink salt. Wow, a mountain, people. Take a look at this right here, people. A so-called cave that made out of salt. The people just stupid. I told you, the same way they show you their mine goal. What is this world we live in, people? You go under the ground, under caves, and find anything. It's trash for dumb people. Don't buy into it. It's the same damn salt they feed in the people. You believe that it's got health benefit? Wow, come on. 
into 400,000 tons of pink salt each mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. The Keoda salt mine here in the Punjab region of look Pakistan this. Take is a the look. second largest salt mine in the world. Second largest salt mine in the world. They just discovered it, people. When? They just discovered it 40 years ago. Come on, people. This is trash right here. Take a look at the ground right here. They tell you this is a farmer's seabed. And that's how the pink salt under the ground. The salt is trash, people. It's the same damn salt. Pink salt comes from remnants of ancient seabeds. See? That crystallized 600 million it's years bullshit, ago. It's bullshit, people. It's bullshit. What you have to understand, there's no way no green we could grow there if that was the case. Or would you have this shit grow on salt? It's not real, people. Wake your ass up. What do you think? It has it. It was actually Alexander the Great's There horse. you go. There you go, people. Alexander the Great. Pay attention right here because all of these fake shit attached to puppets. First discovered these salt rocks. Wow. Stopped to take a lick. Wow. The ass discovered it while he was riding to the ass stop to take a lick. You believe? <laughs> Give it, people. Wow. So now ours is attracted to salt. Okay. Tool. Salt mining ramped up in the 1870s. Wow. Today, wow. it's a popular tourist destination mm -hmm. and a mm -hmm. working mine. There you go, people. A tourist, this a popular tourist destination right here and a working mine. But take a look at it right now. Remember, you see them taking out those big pink rocks? It's nothing but trash, people. Wake up. Using the majority of the mm -hmm. world's pink salt. Mm -hmm. All mining starts here at the train station. Mm -hmm. This train takes miners deep into the mountain. Here, tunnels stretch for 25 miles. Wow. And it's always 64 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. Mine can wow. Wow. It's 70 level. Mm -hmm. level is see what he so called got behind him is nothing but green screen but pay attention that's supposed to be all mla and salt right there a, a salt cave people wow mm -hmm. Six level. miners mm -hmm. work these dark chambers they've used Look many of this. the same mining tools for over a century pickaxes wow. hand drills and this gun bullshit powder. people so and gunpowder it's nothing but trash people I told you, it's similar to something that you know. Same way they tell you they mine everything else. You understand? It's not real. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here they go explode it and salt will come out. It is making me sleepy. I, I've got to turn it off because I'm uh, I'm going to end up falling asleep watching this. I'm, it's really making me sleepy. What an incredible channel, though, everyone, right? What an incredible channel. And this was compared to my channel. Mag again on, and this is a bit of truth most people can't swallow. I'm going to get into the supposed to be dog right here, and I'm going to show you how the government manipulate you with the dog right there. So what you have to understand, you know, you having a pet, this is one thing you need to pay attention to if you have a pet. So yes, you hold a pet hostage. You hold an animal hostage. Now the animal is under your supposed be care and all of that. That's not even right. But this is what they teach us to do in this world. I do have pets also, but dogs basically. And, you know, I understand this from a longer time in my life. I understand that, yes. We all in these these animal hostage, you know, doing what we want to do with them, you know, cutting the air and doing all of these things. And if the dog is a natural animal is on earth, if they're natural, they don't need all of that from the human being. with another bit of truth breakdown now today i'm gonna break down some things and show you about these public figures that the masses believe in wait a now, second is that flow state with his his pope hat on is that flow state right on the screen there everyone who is that that looks like flow state you see him uh, King Stephen, I see you backstage. You're certainly not coming up. I don't know what you're thinking. If you if you want to come up, you know what? I'll put my cash out backstage. If you want to come up bad enough, you'll send me 20 bucks to that. Otherwise, you can go fuck yourself. There you go, buddy. 
Pay your tithes to the Pope, King Stephen. Yeah. Pay your tithes. He, he, he came up, was it yesterday or the day? I think it was last night. He came up last night. Dude has me blocked on his channels and his stream on his channel and on his stream yard. And so he comes over here and I'm like, okay, I'm a generous guy. I'll let him up. And the first thing that he does is drop an in bomb with a hard R. Oh yeah. I remember that. Fuck. Yeah. $20 to apologize. Send that shit over. He's still sitting back there. So hopefully he's cash apping. <laughs> Never. I wouldn't send you a rusty fucking penny, you grifter. I'd let you starve first. You peasant. I'm a king. I'm a king. You're just a peasant. A lowly, lowly, lowly little peasant. Now I'm going to show you that all of them is a deceiver. 100% from this pope right here. To all these movie stars and actors and, you know, all these entertainers that they give you. You kind of believe them because they show you some snapshot of them, some snapshot, and you feel like you know them because they're in the public light, but you don't get it. These are government puppets. They just put out there some flashes and let you feel like you know them. And then before you know it, they're going to show you what they're really about, show you their hands. And the devil agenda right there. I'm going to show you something. Start out with this Pope Francis right here. Remember, the Pope's supposed to be a man of the creator, a man of God. Supposed to believe in righteousness and everything. But they're flipping over the world right there on you. After they let you believe in the Pope, then he starts showing his hand. Watch this. 14 past the hour breaking news mm -hmm. from the Vatican. Why oh. is this a breaking news, people? If the Vatican going to speak or do say something why they in charge of the world that's what i want to know they god this is a dumb shit right here why is the world care about what this fag about right here think about how what is supposed to be view or nothing you got to understand they all a part of the world stage fooling the people listen francis has approved a landmark ruling that mm -hmm. will allow catholic priests mm -hmm. to administer blessings to same-sex couples as long you as that people yes the they're going to give their blessings to same-sex marriages. Like I say, people, this is how they fool you. You remember when they bring the Barack Obama on the scene? This, on the same subject right here, before he even take office, they ask him these questions because they want the people to believe that he's a righteous man. So, yes, he said, yes, he's not down with same-sex marriage. But as soon as he go in and supposedly, you know, on you now and growing on you a little bit, then he came out and tell you that he support it because that's what they really are. Okay, everyone. Okay. I've covered enough of that. I'm going to move along to something else here. I'm not going to let everyone fall asleep. I am getting very sleepy. Very sleepy. I'm... Oh, my goodness. So if people think that guy's channel is the same as mine, or comparable to mine, that guy must be on drugs. He'd have to be on drugs or something. Would anyone like to hop on here as a guest and join me? Join me as a guest. Who would like to join me as a guest?
Are you still there, Axe? Yeah, yeah, I just want to let you guys talk about, yeah, show your thoughts. We just lost you for like, I don't know, maybe a minute or so of the last part. Oh, I'm there sorry. Was no, there was no what sound was I, at all. What was but I saying? It, I will talk louder. My, my mic also is pretty bad. It was, yeah, it was just like you lost connection maybe. I'm not sure, but you weren't coming through, so. At what part? It was, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to remember exactly what you were saying. It was around, I, I don't know, 45 seconds, a minute of the last part. Uh, okay, so I was talking about all the ways they used to subvert us and that most people, let's say the masses, they are too invested into their personas, so it's another net, another barrier towards truth, because at the end, we want to reach freedom, we want to reach liberation, right? And we want to fight back. Uh, I, I was saying that us, for the most part, on this channel, uh, we know the truth, so their trickery and everything they use, is, let's say it really doesn't affect us anymore. However, we know that they will use those tricks when we die and that we will fight back. We know that we will fight back, we know how we will fight back. And we know all those things that the masses don't know. And all of what I'm saying is that it creates a lot of barriers for the matter uh, towards the, the way of truth. And in, in a way, like it's the, let's say themselves putting traps, more traps upon themselves. You know, the main perpetrator doesn't have to always come out with new tricks, new ways of of beating us. The masses are beating themselves up at the game. You know, it created a, a system. I don't know, I just want you to share your thoughts about it. Some of the message was uh, interrupted, but I hope you got this. No problem. I got at that time. I agree with you. The masses will um, take it into their own hands. It isn't just evil, top down tyranny. It's tyranny, neighbor to neighbor, street to street, city to city, country to country, person to person, where they will patrol each other and they will deceive each other and steal from each other and be greedy and follow the system and control each other. Also, I want to point out that we are on the internet and it is the World Wide Web. It is a net. It is a web. So when people think, well, we're all using this for truth, that's great. We are kind of using this for truth here in this small little corner of the internet. But for the most part, most people are not doing what we're doing right here, right now, having these conversations and trying to understand this realm and help others understand it better. Most people use the internet for complete shit entertainment porn music movies uh social media sharing memes talking about their lives their dinner their children all this kind of stuff all this stuff is going on influencers instagram girls that are showing their tits and asses and and trying to advertise themselves as escorts all this stuff is going on and that's really what the majority of the internet is is all that kind of stuff it has nothing to do with people sharing the truth we are in a net and a web and YouTube is called YouTube for a reason as well. YouTube, it's all about you. They want people to be self-centered, selfish, uh, narcissistic. They want it to be all about having their face or their body on, on camera, on webcam. And me, me, me. They, they might as well have called it MeTube instead of YouTube. It's all me, me, me. And they're not helping anyone. And they want it that way. They named it that, that uh, for a reason. And YouTube goes back to... TV used to be called the boob tube, right? So anyway, they're calling it YouTube because this is a replacement for TV. YouTube is basically the modern version of television where people interact with you. You can't type on a TV and interact with the content like you can on YouTube. But this is basically the same as television. Their goal is just to use YouTube as a replacement mind control. And that's all it really is. It's just something for to work better to without TV and just, this is like, this is like TV 2.0 basically. 
That could be a double. That could be a double-edged sword, though, couldn't it, Stephen? Because wouldn't you think sure. that uh, all these people out here are obviously acting out a record performance, presentment of a record uh, based on their actions, and that would be what is written on their hearts because that's what's allowing them to act a certain kind of way while they claim some sort of righteousness in some sort of bag they're trying to catch no way but at least they have us like they have everybody at the same place and that's their intense actions though you know <laughs> are way louder than words well I'll, I'll just put it this way a hammer can be used to build a house it can also be used to smash some in the face so it can be used for both but this youtube is barely being used in terms of helping and truth overall there's millions and millions of videos and there's channels with millions of followers that have absolutely nothing to do with expanding minds knowledge truth uh sharing anything useful there's a lot of garbage on youtube i mean it's it's a mountain of garbage on here if you go and look at the majority of the content on youtube is absolute garbage and if i started sharing it on my channel it may be people that have not looked at the mainstream content maybe for months or years it's just horrendous but that's what most people do watch people sometimes in these communities forget the majority of people on youtube are watching absolute garbage worse than television just like on TikTok and, and instagram they're watching absolute garbage they're not watching content like what you're watching right now the majority on YouTube are watching absolute mind control, degenerate garbage and stupidity. That's what they're watching by the billions and their views are huge. And that's what's going on. Most people are not looking into this at all. So it can be used as a tool for sharing truth, but it's rarely used for that by a very small number. There's only 23 people watching right now this. Out of all of the internet, there's 23 people here. Out of everyone on earth. That's what YouTube's showing. And they could say, oh, Stephen, they rigged the numbers. Well, where are they in the chat room then? If there's way more watching, which some people always say, oh, Stephen, there's way more than 23 or 24. Well, where are they in the chat? There's chats hardly anybody. It doesn't even have 24 in the chat room here. So where are they? I don't think, I don't assume that those numbers are completely false, that there's thousands. Show yourselves then if there's thousands. I don't buy it. What I'm saying is I reach very few people and real truth in this realm reaches very few people. No matter if it's on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, whatever, Twitter, I'm not even I'm not even on those platforms. You know, I'm on Odyssey and BitChute just as backups for this. And it, you know, but anyway, I mean, you can't reach very many people through this if you're speaking anything meaningful and helpful that's true. It's not going to reach many people. So it's rigged that's the way that it is. I don't think most of the subscribers on my channel even get notified when I'm doing a live stream at all. I don't think it shows up if I'm doing it during the day, night. It doesn't matter if I'm doing it in the middle of the night. If I'm doing it in prime time in America, uh, American, let's say, 8.30 Eastern Standard Time, or if I'm doing it in the morning of whatever. It doesn't seem to matter. It's, it's 20, 30, 40 people. It's not hundreds and it's not thousands that are watching ever here. So my proof is right in the pudding that they just restrict my channel and they don't even notify people. They do that all the time. There's people that have subscribed that probably think my channel is gone. They probably thought months ago that it was gone because they never get any notifications of any new videos. They probably forgot about my channel or just assumed it vanished or something or forgot about it i don't know but i'm just saying they can control the flow of information and they can, can they do it they they they can do it and they do it and uh, it works unfortunately but there's 25 people watching if you think about that out of this entire realm there's only 25 people here and there's probably several billion perhaps watching garbage content right now on youtube tiktok uh, Twitter, Instagram, billions of people watching absolute meaningless garbage that won't help them any way in life or the afterlife. 
and there's a whole 26 people here. So there you go. I mean, they're not afraid of this platform being used to reach millions of people because it, it just doesn't. They can control, if you're speaking truth, that, oh, this channel speaking too much truth will just throttle them so they can only get 25 people. This other channel speaking nonsense, they'll have 2 million or 5 million subscribers and, and they'll get millions of views every time they put up a fluff video that's meaningless. That's the easiest way to control the truth. Well, did you like that little rant by me there? Did you enjoy that? You're fairly you're fairly certain that you won't be accepted here. Well, the Kiwi, we have a gingy moderator here on my channel, a guy named Seth. So I do accept some gingies. Some gingers are accepted. It's it just depends on the attitude. Top on over, not over there. Let's see here. Wanted to go to something else. Let's see what Jake the asshole talks about. Uh, with his rigged games 20 hours ago. Welcome back, disgruntled sports fans. Look at this. It's like a salesman. It's like a salesman. We have a major announcement the in the salesman. NFL. We have some new rule changes that are going salesman. to be happening to our precious pretend football. Oh, no. I hope they don't ruin the game. <laughs> as if it hasn't been desecrated enough already. As if the NFL hasn't completely ruined the sport of football. Now they have announced. Are you ready for this? New kickoff rules. They are going to adopt, apparently, the XFL-style kickoff rules. And... Not only that, new tackling rules, they're now no longer going to allow players to wrap up and use their body weight to make a tackle. Yes, I just said that. So it seems the NFL is going to go out of their way to change the rules to further hide the fact that they are rigging and scripting these games, of course. Let me go ahead and show you exactly what the news is saying and what the announcement is. We turn now to several major rule changes in the NFL designed to increase action and keep players safe. Trevor Alt is here with all the details. Good morning, Trevor. Hey, good morning. Yeah, so a lot of people for the first time are hearing about what's called a hip drop tackle. It's a technique that even some professional football players say they had never heard of. And we're going to show it to you because league officials say this is an especially dangerous play to the point they have now banned it, along with seriously overhauling the kickoff. Okay, so the rule changes they claim are to increase action and player safety. So they're doing it to keep the players safe, supposedly. So this guy also claims that they're going to ban the hip drop tackle. Have you guys ever heard of a hip drop tackle? And he said even professionals have never heard of this. Yeah, that's because that's a new thing that you guys just made up. When you wrap up a guy and you use your body weight to tackle him, that's called making a tackle. And now they're going to say that all of this stuff, when you wrap up and use your body weight to make a tackle, this is called a hip drop tackle. And now all of a sudden it's dangerous and they need to ban it. Okay, I already see where this is going, but let's go ahead and let them explain where this is going, and then I'll tell you where it's really going. 
This morning, the NFL rolling out new rule changes aiming to protect player safety, though some players say they're out of bounds. League owners voting unanimously to ban what's known as a hip drop tackle, like the one seen here where a player wraps up the runner and drops their weight onto the runner's upper legs to bring them down. Okay, how are you supposed to make a tackle if you can't use your body weight after you wrap up? So you're telling me you're allowed to wrap up while making a tackle, but then you can't use your body weight to bring the guy to the ground? That's the whole point of... Why is he shouting so much? Jake, why are you shouting so much, dude? Tackling a guy is to bring him to the... You're shouting, you're shouting. You're upset about stupid football. Hi there, Pamela. Good to see you. Good to see you. Super chats and shekels and donations and his sports NFL grift exactly. That's what Jake is doing. That's what little Jakey is doing. Little, wee little Jakey. Just a wee little Jakey. That's what he's doing. He's a wee little man. Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. Before we begin, I want to thank all the patrons who have helped videos like this one possible. If you are new to my channel or know my work for my videos, documentaries, video essays, or anything else, thank you for watching. I recently begun working on in-depth videos like this one full time and it's thanks to generous patrons and donators that I can delve so deeply into topics and stream as a full time endeavor. So if you enjoy this video, please consider giving me a few dollars at the links down below to help me pay bills and keep eating food. With the obligatory shilling out of the way, let's get right into the video. I'm confused. Are you confused? I guess they want money too. They've got 90 or they have 79 and a half thousand subscribers. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. How do you donate? Help me pay rent and support the channel. Oh, here you go. Cash app, Venmo, PayPal. There's lots of ways to give money here. Lots of ways to give money. Matt Walsh has been something of a rising star in the conservative media space in the last few years. During his time at the Daily Wire, he's even somewhat managed to eclipse the outlet's own editor, Ben Shapiro, in the mainstream zeitgeist, due mostly to his What is a Woman documentary in 2022. And while that video was many's first exposure to Matt, it wasn't for me. Uh, no, I've been hate following Matt Walsh all the way back to his days as a blogger. So when everybody else was rightfully calling him out on his transphobic trolling, I saw the same- Wait a second, you've been hate following him? Hate? But you call everyone else haters and you're hate following someone? What is going on here? Patterns he's been repeating for far longer. Even as someone who keeps tabs on most mainstream and conservative commentators, Matt has gained his own unique spotlight with this incendiary transphobic comments and intentionally obtuse arguments. Matt Walsh isn't unique in that way, but what is unique is that unlike contemporaries like Crowder, Shapiro, or Poole, his blogging has given the world a look into his worldview for years. Now, it exists as kind of a a mental map, a chart of the mind palace of a bigot. We can use it to see what's important to him, how he sees the world. Since 2013, Matt's blog quietly gave an intimate look into his life as a young conservative father, allowing him an outlet for- I wonder what Mushroom Coyote would think of this YouTube channel, Dead Domain. I just wonder, I don't know. Almost 300,000 views on this video every perceived slight and petty grievance. And a few years later, his video blogging on the Matt Walsh show only helped grow his audience. As a result, Matt Walsh's body of work now exists as a nearly comprehensive compendium of who he is and how his mind works, well beyond the more refined professional image he puts forward for the Daily Wire nowadays. 
But why make a video discussing Matt Walsh so thoroughly? I mean, you could easily look at any of Matt's videos and show how he's little more than a vindictive and spineless bully. Well, it's because Matt Walsh isn't unique. In fact, he's representative of a growing population of vocal conservatism, one that doesn't care about respectful politics or bipartisanship, but outright advocates suppression of their enemies and extra legal and- Is this boy George's daughter or son? Do you really want to hurt me? Look at this. What is this? Is that a tattoo on the chest there? What is this? Where do you get those man, man like where do they get those man-sized dresses? Often violent suppression of anything they disagree with. And if you truly want to fight back against something, I've always found it best to understand it. To take apart a machine and understand how every piece works in conjunction with one another. Because as I've watched countless hours and read through five years of Matt Walsh's blog, I've come to realize that Matt Walsh isn't complicated. Mushroom Coyote doesn't like hairy chess, but I think Mushroom Coyote likes, likes what's on the screen right now. Or nuance. But the way he structures his arguments and how he avoids criticism can give him the appearance of being superior, at least to his followers. The reality that I'll come to show, however, through this tiered breakdown of Matt is that he's little more than a sad, frustrated man who is driven by spite, yet of all the hatred he espouses, I don't think there are many people Matt hates more than himself. But before we dive headfirst into the shadows of Matt's mind palace, let's go back to the beginning. Matt Walsh isn't a very interesting person. His history and how he got to his station are fairly benign affairs, for example. And as we'll see later, his tastes and the things he appreciates are likewise fairly bog standard. And on the off chance Matt or any of his fans or followers see this video, I'd entreat them to not resort to their regular cynicism and sarcastic approach to critique that they so often resort to, but instead seriously address what I'm saying and how I'm wrong if you think that's the case. Matt is a professed lifelong Catholic who grew up in the church. By his own testimony, he fell away from the church during his young adulthood and later came back to it after starting a family. Yeah, I, uh, well, as far as faith, I, I was raised uh, Catholic, devout Catholic by a devout Catholic family. But I had a, a period, like a lot of people do, when I was in my, when I was in my uh, late teens, early 20s, where I sort of, uh, I always believed, I didn't, I didn't leave the faith per se, but I, wasn't, I certainly wasn't living according to it. Mm -hmm. um, but then I, you know, I used to get married and, and start having a family. That's when I, I started to realize that I need to, take this stuff actually seriously, um, become, it becomes real for you mm -hmm. in a way that maybe it's not when you're just a single guy in your early 20s living you know, in, a, in your one bedroom apartment. So, In brief, he started as a shock jock on a local radio station around 24, roughly six years after graduating high school. As Matt would later write, he sidestepped any kind of college education. In his blog post, Thank God I Wasn't College Material, he writes authoritatively on an experience he never had, stating, quote, people go to college. It's what people do. Why do they go? Because they need to. Why do they need to? Because it's what people do. Why? Because they need to. And so on. This was in response to a teacher trying to help him find a path in life using creative writing. It seems that from a young age, Matt has, at least according to him, been smarter than nearly everyone around him. But don't worry, there are plenty more examples of that ahead. Now, Matt's history with education is very important to understanding who he is and why he is that way, but we'll dive into that in a bit. There's a lot to cover here, and as a wise man once said, don't cross the streams. Don't cross the streams. Why? It would be bad. I also want to be clear. My goodness, uh, is there anyone single watching my channel that wants a girlfriend? I'm not sure their pronouns, are they he or she? I'm not sure that I have nothing against people who don't go to college or even people who finish high school. If there's one thing I agree with Matt on, it's the basic idea that not all education fits all people. But Matt has a very specific chip on his shoulder that takes this idea and twists it into a justification for his ignorance and incuriosity, which we will get to shortly. But back to the shock jock era. Infamously, as was reported by Ari Drennan for Media Matters, during this time, Matt also professed ideas like 16-year-olds being mature enough to have babies and basically being adults. Uh, even biologically, and this is me just stating, I'm just right now I'm gonna start by just stating facts. So fact number one, 
It's not a new phenomenon. Fact number two, in fact, it's a phenomenon that was more common earlier in history. And for, you know, the first six to 10,000 years of human existence, it was a normal thing. Uh, fact three, girls between the ages of like 17 and 24 is when they're technically most fertile. Yeah. Okay. That's biological. That's a fact. All right. I'm just stating facts. That's all I'm doing. On the Matt and Crank program, Matt and his co-host performed all kinds of juvenile and lurid pranks in attempts to garner attention. I don't want to harp too hard on most of these because they were very much the kind of edgy, stupid humor that appealed to many young men in the late 2000s and early 2010s. And I don't think there's a lot of value in trying to cancel an entire generation of frat bros who thought South Park was cutting edge humor. But this platform, while allowing Matt to also indulge in this random cruelty and basic observational humor, also gave Matt an opportunity to espouse his political views which he did often. But it is in fact true that you have to make people hurt. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but holding signs and uh, yelling loudly will not make anyone hurt and it's not gonna get anything changed. Uh, calling your congressman probably makes you feel good about yourself and I'm very happy for you, but that doesn't really get anything done. And you're not gonna change the system by calling a congressman and you're not gonna change the system by voting out a few incumbents. And you're not gonna change the system by voting in Republicans. I think we're at the point now where we have to purge the system of all parties. One of the more interesting aspects of Matt during these shock jock years is that, as we'll see, he hasn't changed much since. Sure, he's swapped his raggedy t-shirt and stubble for a generic suit and an ill-fitting beard, but by and large, his opinions seem to have remained the same. He's nothing if not consistent. Uh, for example, he's always been transphobic, as evidenced by this bizarre screed in 2011. You're trying to express your inner self. Why is it always the same as everyone else's inner self? There's also needs to express. And okay, so in a cross-dressing guy, it's always, it always looks like a, like a housewife from a Farsight cartoon. It's always, it's always, this, you know what I'm talking about? It's always like beehive do and they're just completely ridiculous. Just, I don't know. I don't know where they get their, it's, they gotta, especially the cross dressers, they have to kind of, I don't know where they get their notions of femininity from is what I'm saying. It's not, it's never like a sporty girl that, that, that wears like jogging outfit and kind of has a ponytail. It's are always they, just overdone. Just, are they going for femininity now or are they just going for some weird hybrid? They are weird hybrid themselves. They're supposedly going for femininity, but they gotta, you know, flip to maybe the style section of the paper, not the, not the, not the comics. Matt also exhibited a lot of racism. This particular clip where the hosts are debating whites becoming a minority in America is interesting for how the other host continues to try pushing back against Matt, who repeatedly runs into white replacement paranoia and edges the 14 words with reckless abandon. But the point is, you see how, um, and, and we've heard this before, maybe this is more dramatic than what we've heard before, before and when no one's actually said it's over for us, we're done. Our, uh, our race of people, uh, we're, we're, we're singing our swan song right now. We're the last of the Mohicans, the last of the Anglos, and that's what's happening with us. The extinction of the Anglo-Saxon race is, uh, is, is, is, is just like that. Yeah. Now, the solution is pretty simple. It's just the solution is to freaking reproduce and have kids but, and have families. But I, well, I know what you're saying, but it's a little bit different because I, I just think people are less racist than they used to be, and so they're not just going after – I'm a white guy. I'm gonna get me a white girl. But when when you don't have kids and when you don't reproduce and when you've decided that it's more important for you to just get into your career and then when you're in your 40s maybe you'll think about it. When when you do that, that that's a dying race. Dying races are old and and impotent. And right now the white race, at least the Western white race, is old and impotent. Impotent. I don't really think about it as I don't know. Okay, so what? There's not gonna be a whole bunch of white people. I, yeah, what, because what? because don't you agree that America, when the Mexican people come here which is fine that they want to come, as long as they come legally, which most of them aren't. But uh, they bring with them, being that they're a different culture, a different right. race, and everything else, they bring with them an identity, and they, and, they, and they bring it to America. And so as the Anglo-Saxons, which were the original Americans, die off, our identity and our culture goes with it. All of this took place from 2010 through 2011. Now, you might hear a lot of this rhetoric and think, gee, this sounds eerily similar to a lot of modern alt-right talking points like Great Replacement Theory, which is true. The thing is, the alt-right wasn't really a thing in 2011. Talking points like the Great Replacement were commonplace among conspiracy right, led by voices like Glenn Beck at the time. It would be years until people like Stephen Molyneux and Lauren Southern would push those talking points more into the mainstream. During this tirade, he also calls Anglo-Saxons the original Americans, which is not true. Uh, Anti-nativism is another feather in Matt's ignorance cap. As part of the duo's prank calls, Matt Walsh also called Obama Elementary School, putting on a very racist affect that recalls Steven Crowder's infamously racist impressions years later. But then I was been waiting this whole time to say, wait till they open up a school named after Barack Obama. Wait till they open up Barack Obama school that he's running, you know, because I know that he's going to be down with that because I could even imagine a situation where he would say, look, 
uh, you ain't really get a good grade. This other dude over here got a good grade, but we can combine y'all two grades, you know, and make a and make an average grade and then dispense it equally, you know, proportion. So I just want to make sure that's the way y'all run things over there, uh, so I no. can. What's no, that? not in terms of the grading. I mean, every student would earn their individual grade. And that's the grade that they would be given. Yeah, but that, that don't. I mean, but then why? You know, I ain't trying to put you on spot because huh? I know I know you don't make these decisions. But why would y'all name yourself after Barack Obama when, when we know that his policy was really? You know, I'm gonna try to spread that around to anybody who ain't really got none. You know, I'm gonna try to spread that that around that wealth and that and, and whatnot. Like I said, Matt's views haven't changed really. It wasn't the primary focus of his work as a shock jock, but he couldn't help but be incendiary. Wherever he got his rhetoric from, it's pretty clear that Matt believed in some pretty racist shit, like white settlers' superiority over indigenous people, the stupidity and illiteracy of black people, and that he bought into paranoia and fears about the erasure of white or Anglo-Saxon culture. All things he still soaks fears about today, by the way. His shock jock career ended abruptly, with Matt seemingly mysteriously fired. He moved to Kentucky, where he had a show on WGMD 92.7. It was a small Christian conservative station where Matt kept a low profile and worked less than a year before hopping over to another show he worked in 2012 until it was canceled. In November of 2012, he started a blog where he would write about petty grievances until 2018. In 2013, Matt joined... Glenn Beck's network, The Blaze, where he would cross post his blog posts as editorials on whatever minute grievances he would get worked into an overworded, needlessly verbose tizzy about. And he posted a lot. In his early days, according to the archive of his blog and the website, sometimes he'd post multiple times a day. From here, he basically had his back door into the conservative space. He had always been someone willing to make fun of others for attention or shield controversial beliefs for a spotlight, as shown as his days on morning radio. But The Blaze and his blog gave him a bigger platform to spread his purposefully incendiary rhetoric. Matt Walsh's ascent to a figurehead of right-wing reactionary movements isn't surprising. He's not a particularly charismatic speaker. He doesn't have a real wit or way with metaphor or analogy, but he is competent. And... That is enough to set him apart in a sea of conspiracists and blowhards while also giving his audience a false sense of confidence for echoing his beliefs. He speaks gratingly with an authoritative verve, a false sense of self-assurance that whatever he says is objectively correct, which in turn helps his audience feel secure in trusting him and the conclusions he draws about the world around him. Many of these same qualities are easily identifiable in other conservative talking heads like Nick Fuentes and Jordan Peterson. It doesn't matter so much what they say or if they have any proof, it's how they say it that seems to lend them credence. But more than that, Matt rose to prominence because of the way he eschewed mainstream conservative talking points, bypassing the decorum of an older conservatism that at least tried to publicly respect others instead of outright bullying his subjects, most often with broad generalizations. It's why he so comfortably seemed to move from morning zoo crew prank calls to daddy blogging. They both gave him the ability to belittle others, something he seems to have always relished. Like I said, consistency. I would never call Matt Walsh a grifter um, because of his history. Unlike Candace Owens or other right-wingers who have jumped onto the profitable bandwagon because they couldn't make other careers work, Matt Walsh is a true believer. He believes in what he says. His opinions haven't changed since his early 20s as proof. But what does he really believe? And what does it say about how he sees the world? Let's really dig into that gray matter and find out in his own words. When I set out to make this video, I plan to go down the list of what Matt believes and how he justifies it all to create a roadmap of what he actually believes in. The problem is those questions are easily answered. He mostly believes in anything that makes him feel inherently superior. Though I want to preface this by saying Matt Walsh, while often espousing his beliefs as inherently better, both seriously and sarcastically, has a defined streak of self-dislike. It mostly comes out when he's talking about self-image. He doesn't see himself as good-looking, for example. The pressure to be beautiful is not something that I myself have really experienced, and thank God for that, because obviously I missed the beauty train, and it ain't coming back to pick me up, so it's good that it doesn't, it doesn't matter for me. And so I'm a man, and I'm also married, so I really don't care. It doesn't matter to me. <laughs> I mean, people in the comments will make, uh, I'll see sometimes, they'll make, they'll make very insulting remarks about my physical appearance. And you know what? Anytime I read those, the only thing I, I just smile and I think, well, it's a good thing I'm married then. So I don't care. I mean, it really doesn't, really doesn't make a difference. Um, I just feel bad for my wife, honestly. Now, I'm not in the habit of passing judgment on people based on their looks because beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Matt Walsh isn't really my type 
to begin with. Too much beard and bigotry. But if you saw Matt Walsh on the street just walking by and didn't know who he was, he just looks normal. He, he has a face. He has a head. He just looks like a guy. Yet this self-depreciating streak, especially when it comes to his looks, pops up quite a bit, and it's something to keep in mind. But back to the main quest. The more insightful question I found in going through Matt's blog wasn't what he believed, but how his mind worked to believe it. Like Ben Shapiro, Dennis Prager, Jordan Peterson, and many others, Matt would have his viewers believe his ideas are based in fact. But they're not. Not really. Matt's ideas seem to be solely based on the ever-present belief that he is always right simply because he is. Like other commentators, he uses words like facts, logic, and reason as crutches for his arguments because if he didn't constantly use them to prop up what he was saying, there would be no reason to find him trustworthy at all. He rarely cites sources and mostly relies on broad generalizations. And I don't mean he actually uses facts, logic, and reason. No, just literally those words. Like he, he just says them and thinks that makes him right. For example, Let's look at a video blog where Matt makes the scientific case for Christ using entirely circular logic. He starts by saying that science cannot disprove God. Let's start with one basic principle here. Science cannot disprove God, okay? It cannot disprove the supernatural by definition. Uh, science is a thing for the natural realm. The claim of a Christian or of any theist is that there's also a supernatural realm, which science can't tell you anything about. But then Matt makes the argument that God is the reason why things like science and math work. And because I'm trying not to not make the kind of self-evident arguments Matt relies on, no, that's not why science and math work. The, they work because humans have spent thousands of years working on them. God didn't come up with the theory of relativity Einstein did. After hundreds of years of work, that led up to his own. Ironically, Matt uses Einstein as part of his proof. So you cannot disprove God by applying the rules of the physical world to him. He sets those rules. And, and the, fact, the fact that the rules are so orderly, the fact that you can do mathematics and you can do physics and you can work out equations and calculations and learn about the world, um, and it all makes so much sense, that is evidence for God, not against him. You know, there's that famous Einstein quote where he said the, the most incomprehensible thing about the world is that it is comprehensible. So he was speaking about the incredible order and discernibility of the universe, um, which is not what you would expect. If we're talking about a random universe that was just uh, that came out of nothing and came out of chaos, you would not expect a universe that has ordered itself like this, a universe that can be understood, a universe that follows certain firm laws. And from there, he pivots to a reason for believing in God, and his proof is the Apostle Paul converting to Christianity. For those who don't know, Paul was a former anti-Christian named Saul who had a vision on the road to Damascus and became one of the most fervent preachers in early Christianity afterwards, which is all well and good as a historical figure, but as evidence for God, there's a lot to question with Matt's approach. Paul himself, his story, um, what he did, his, his own biography is, is even more compelling evidence. Because we know that- uh, This is getting kind of boring and I didn't realize it was this long. I didn't realize that people, I'm sorry, but there's so much boring content on YouTube. There's just so much boring content on here. See what else do we have on here. Accumulation of money by families like the Vanderbilts changed the economic, social, and physical landscape of the United States. But once rich doesn't mean always rich. And the Vanderbilts eventually fell from the top of the financial and social ladders they once dominated and went from American royalty to flat out broke. How'd they screw it up? Well, today, we're going to take a look at how the famous Vanderbilts blew their fortune. Hey guys, it's Matt. YouTube put a video in front of me this morning regarding a topic it knows I can't resist. From the Weird History Channel, something like how one of America's richest families lost everything or lost their fortune, and it was specifically on the Vanderbilt family. So I can't resist. Of course, I start clicking it, and I'm going, oh, sure, right. Now, it is possible one or two of the famous families via the old money of the Gilded Age that in today's dollars, they'd be worth 500 billion, 700 billion to a trillion via the conversion of today's dollars to the Gilded Age started around 1890. It's possible a few of the families pissed their money away and they were no longer prominent, but history insults our intelligence by saying they all squandered it to a degree. In the Rockefellers, the last time I looked, the family was only worth 11 billion, and it's just these little internet coded coders, these little pimple poppers like Zuck the Borg that now control everything. I don't buy it, 
for a second, I can't resist this topic. So I spent another hour, an hour and a half looking into the Vanderbilt family from the original line, which is Commodore Vanderbilt from the 1700s, all the way through that creep of today, Anderson Cooper, right through. I look briefly at that creep. I don't buy it for a second. Now you're looking at Cornelius Vanderbilt, who is without a doubt the most famous Vanderbilt. Yeah, even more famous than Anderson Cooper. Because he's not carrying the Vanderbilt name. He's carrying the Cooper name, whatever that is. He's trying to pretend to himself that he's doing it on his own. He would look himself in the mirror, Anderson Cooper, and say, because I'm a Vanderbilt, that didn't get me any jobs. It didn't, it didn't open any doors. I'm doing it on my own. That fraud actually believes that about himself. But forget that creep. At some point in history, around the time of the Gilded Age, Cornelius Vanderbilt, pictured here, was considered to be amongst the richest people in the entire world. And, of course, they squandered it. The Vanderbilts lost it like all the old money. Don't you feel bad for him? Look at him. Go ahead, look at him. Don't you feel a little bit sad for the family? Say hi to him. Go ahead, say hi. So Matt, I was going to give this video to somebody that would take this topic seriously. I'm sorry. I make it for you. If it could get through to anybody, I would make these videos different. I really would. But go ahead, say hi to him. He's probably, if enough of us say hi to him, he'll roll around in his grave, wherever it is. Maybe it's in the basement of the Biltmore Mansion in North Carolina. We'll look at that soon coming up. Reading briefly from Wikipedia, which is the beginning of the history that insults all of our intelligence, Cornelius Vanderbilt, May 27, 1794, January 4th, 1877, nicknamed the Commodore, which is strange because his father's name is actually Commodore Vanderbilt. It's like, that's really weird. Was an American business magnate who built his wealth in railroads and shipping. After working with his father's business, Vanderbilt worked his way into leadership positions in the inland water trade and invested in the rapidly growing railroad industry, effectively transforming the geography of the United States. As one of the richest Americans in history and wealthiest figures overall, Vanderbilt was the patriarch of the wealthy and influential Vanderbilt family. He provided the initial gift to found Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. According to historian Roger Grant, quote, contemporaries, too, often hated or feared Vanderbilt, or at least considered him an unmannered brute. While Vanderbilt could be a rascal, combative, and cunning, he was much more a builder than a wrecker, being honorable, shrewd, and hardworking. Well, Matt, I know what they say, but the family fortune was so massive it couldn't be completely pissed away. What's left? Well, when Gloria Vanderbilt, the famous jeans designer and mother of Anderson Cooper, if don't look directly into his eyes, she left him the entire estate of what was left upon her death, $1.5 million. <laughs> now, he makes, he makes that in a month, or he makes, he makes whatever. His contract's got to be 20, 30, 40, 50 million. He doesn't need money. He's, he's a Vanderbilt. He's part of the bloodline. I don't buy it for a second. She, he makes it in a few months, which she left him what was left of the entire estate, $1.5 million. Matt, why are you so skeptical about what history tells us where the old money went? You've said before, even your friend Tony explained you were tried. You're so thick headed, Matt, that see the new generations inside the old money. They don't have the work ethic. They were born with a silver spoon and they make bad decisions. And see, that's what happens, Matt. Your friend Tony explained it. You just don't want to listen. The newer generations just can't manage the money like the one that initially created the wealth. Well, sure, I'd buy it if it happened to just one or two families and the names like Carnegie and Morgan, the families were prominent today and present like Melvin, Dr. Evil and Zuck the Borg. Well, you, most people that don't know the code don't know who that is like Gates, Bezos. I don't even know the real names and Zuckerberg. The, it, they're not prominent. Where are the Morgans? Where are the Carnegies? Where are the Rockefellers in the last 20 years? Where are the Harrimans? Where are the Vanderbilts? The all, it just, in a similar sense, happened to all the old money. And there's always a convenient story. Well, Matt, you don't understand. You didn't do your research on Carnegie. Uh, he gave it all away. Oh, that's the big theme. Isn't that convenient to explain why all the old money family name influence is gone? If they didn't piss it away, they gave it away. Oh, sure. <laughs> Come on. There's so many reasons this is complete nonsense. They must have had the worst financial planners in the world. Let's just go over this simple exercise. In today's dollars, the old money was worth, and this is what they report to us, in today's dollars, 300 billion to close to a trillion. 
if you go back and the value of money and whatever the buying power and purchasing power was back in the day. Now, they must have all had the worst financial advice of all time. Every single one was using the same warped, demented, and retarded financial advisor. Because anybody, any kid out of college that was trying to get into financial planning would say to these families, listen, you're going to have to do certain things as the heir. And there's Cornelius Vanderbilt III and this whole big family tree. Any financial planner that's not completely out of his mind or her mind would say, listen, you didn't make the money. You don't quite have the business acumen. If you want to hold on to the fortune family collectively, I know it gets split up as the family gets larger, but what do they say the whole Vanderbilt family is worth today? They still say nothing. The branch goes out very wide. There's only a few things you have to do, the financial advisor would say. Number one, you simply have to take the existing fortune and put it in relatively safe investments, T-bills, st bonds, maybe 20% in stocks. And if they object, you could say, uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt II, you know what that leaves you a year to piss away? It leaves you about 150 to $200 million in today's dollars to completely squander and piss away without eroding the, the initial fortune. Whoever's advising him would say, listen, I know it's one of your dreams to emulate, uh, was it MC Hammer that went around, he rented a plane and he, he took his posse around the world. He kept pissing his money away, thinking that the next album would outsell the one before. It's like Cornelius Vanderbilt II, I know you want to emulate MC Hammer. You can do all that stuff. You can, but you can piss away. Here it is. It, the, the dividends and the, the reinvestments that come back, 200 million, you can just squander it or just decide to play croquet in the backyard, but you can't erode the initial base fortune that will generate via safe investment the continued wealth moving forward. Now, maybe a few of them might not have taken the advice, but a few of them would have. And they, uh, come on, uh, yeah, yeah, this is ridiculous, guys. And maybe the, the chances the entire Vanderbilt family all pissed it away, then the other names from the Gilded Age would be prominent today. Gloria Vanderbilt by herself, the whole genes thing. Uh, that, the, she, that, by the way, if you're over age 50 to 55, Gloria Vanderbilt jeans at one point was like the biggest name in jeans. She was making her own little name for herself, assuming the story's even correct, in uh, jeans and clothing and textiles. That, uh, if it was managed properly, should be worth several hundred million today. But her estate, one point <laughs> one point five million to Anderson Cooper, and he makes so much at CNN. It probably was like a, just a check lying around. What was it that scene in Caddyshack? Uh, Chevy Chase is Ty Webb. He has the young blonde-haired girl in his place, and she picks up the, like a seventy thousand dollar check just lying around. He's like, "Ah, keep it." That's what Anderson did. Uh, and when he found out what was left after his mother passed, what's how much of the estate was left? One point five million. Ah, keep it. <laughs> He's like, ah, fuck it. You know, that doesn't mean anything to the one, 1.5 million. Even if the whole story is legitimate, he still makes 10, 15 million a year at CNN or whatever he makes. Uh, you know, come on. They don't. Here's here's the thing, guys. I should have gotten to this earlier. See, if I if I had to guess, you know, if, if somebody gave me uh, two guesses, but I'm only going to need one, I would bet that the Vanderbilt name is in some way associated with the establishment or foundation of what's called the Federal Reserve. Uh, I just want to break in here. Matt needs an, another little helper to change batteries for him and open up soup cans and things like that. So if anyone wants to live with Matt McKinley, you should uh, contact Matt. He could use a, He could use a little helper that can decide to print up trillions a day without any government oversight. See, the Vanderbilt name is in there. So uh, in terms of what's publicly reported, they don't need no money. Well, Matt, uh, aren't you going to comment about the hidden hand and the potential influence of the secret societies? Uh, uh, well, yes and no. Um, not in the way you first grade truthers want me to, but I will say he might be looking for a cockroach that got loose in his shirt. Bill has a timely poster for us to sum all this up. How schools still spin the Federal Reserve, what it is, it's there for you. It has nothing to do with private citizens. I, who knows what the schools say today about the Federal Reserve, but on the right, voodoo economics really makes the world go round. And Reagan says, I told you so. <laughs> I told you so. V Bueller, does anybody, anybody in the class, it was uh, under the Reagan administration, 
blank economics boo doo <laughs> It's all been, but it's all been, it was exposed during the Reagan administration, but it's always been voodoo economics. The, the Federal Reserve, the, there's nothing that's a bigger giveaway to this reality in terms of presenting something to your family and friends. It should wake everybody up that things aren't as they seem than the Federal Reserve. There's no accountability. It's private <laughs> citizens and private bankers that go back to the Gilded Age, like likely the Vanderbilts, that can't be audited by Congress, that can literally make up trillions of dollars a day and push it out to wherever they want. Why would anybody care? This is the reason that the net worth of the old money doesn't exist. Per their own personal bank accounts, they don't need any money. They don't, it's, it can, they can go get whatever they need and they probably never need money. When the plane lands somewhere, they probably never need a passport. When the burger comes, there's probably no check. Did you, did we forget to check on that burger? No, there's ain't there. Oh, it's, it's a Carnegie. There's no check. I just, you make that burger for free. That maybe they don't spend a <laughs> time on anything. It's private names that are, that's responsible for something called the Federal Reserve. There's no government oversight. There, if, if this doesn't wake up your friends and family or nothing will, which, which is correct, nothing will. But it's not voodoo economics. We don't even have a name for what it is. They just make up whatever they want. So why would we expect any of the old names to have any money or net worth associated with their own personal bank accounts when they are all part of what's called the Federal Reserve? It's just am I are we in this group? Are we the only ones saying? Yeah, we are the only. I guess I was, was going to complain a bit, but yes, we are the only ones left uh, that have a degree of common sense and sanity in this reality. Look, the European Central Bank has it's one building, but it's constructed in such a way that from many angles. It looks like two towers. Is anybody surprised? I mean, there's still truthers that really still believe that the European Central Bank is like on its own and there and or the Bank of Japan or the central whatever other central bank may exist is on its own. It's probably part of the Fed, like a little subsidiary at the very minimum. They merged a long time ago and have to be acting completely as one or the whole system would have failed a long time ago. I mean, it is unbelievable. There's people literally in our truth research community that believe the central banks are actually separate from each other. Uh, it's, there's, it's one table of creeps. All the evidence all the time points to a one world system. And even going back to World War I and uh, the Sykes-Pico Treaty and why uh, the, the Russians never exposed the Americans for supposedly what was going on during Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo missions if they weren't playing the same game. I mean, come on, we don't, you know, it, we, it's frustrating at time, guys, because it's so clear to us. But anyway, back to the Federal Reserve. Who knows what, per Bill's poster here, what the school... Guys, guys, it's frustrating, guys, guys. Schools are saying <laughs> what the schools are brainwashing the children into believing what the Federal Reserve is. Either way, it'll be it's good and it's it's looking out for you. I took a snapshot of the debt, <laughs> the debt clock a few seconds ago. I didn't know what it was. I figured it was around 30 trillion, 34 trillion. Uh, six, I don't know how to read the number. It's so big. 609 billion, 34 trillion. God, look, guys, if it was if the entire world system was not managed by AI Whopper supercomputers or quantum computer, or whatever, things that we just can't fathom, doing thousands of injections, they must be doing thousands of monetary injections daily, all without human interaction. There's no possible way people at a desk could do it. Um, the system would have gone down a long time ago. I'll say what I said five years ago. Because they've kept what shouldn't be able to be kept going this long, they probably will keep it going longer than we think. But it, it, there's no way it can continue. It's the inflation that will break it. They can create 50, 100 trillion a day. They could, but then the, the price of an apple would go to $1,000. The inflation will break it. There is no breaking it at all except for the inflation when the people cannot afford their basic necessities and they start to look for where they put the old baseball bat. That's the only thing that's going to bring it down is the inflation. And the AI or whatever systems they have injecting all over the world, it has been masterful. It, it, the price of an apple should be $20 or $30 now. 
based on the amount of trillions they must be throwing around off books. If somebody's trying to tell me about the Fed balance sheet and the Fed balance sheet records for the public what's been spent, oh, sure. Yeah. No, the Fed balance sheet, whatever it is, and then there's a fifty, there's fifty trillion off books. Why would I believe? Why would? Why do they? Why do people try to tell me they have to show us? I mean, you're kidding me. So if it is, I, you know, if somebody's yelling at me, yeah, the inflation is difficult now. Yeah, I know. You know, I do. I go buy bread and milk myself. You know, and eggs. You know, I'm, I'm aware of that. But it still should be ten times worse. It, the inflation has been managed. Um, Again, it to in, in, in, incredibly, um, but it, they can't hold the tidal wave back forever. Um, I'll say what I said five years ago. Because they've kept it going this long, we should assume they'll keep it going longer than we could think or we could possibly have imagined. So the same thing. It doesn't seem like it should be able to survive another month, but I mean, probably somehow we'll do it because there is no breaking it, again, other than when the people – cannot afford movies maddie just keeps going over this over and over and over and over again or to buy a loaf of bread or huge sections of the population and then start to get unruly and they have the new system ready to go of course it's all ready to go now um with, they'll introduce a crisis when they need to it, it, it's all planned do not be scared when they do it they'll scare the heck out of people They'll probably shut banks down and people will lose and all these horrific stories. They have to make it scary for people to immediately adopt the new system and for people to look to the new system as a savior. Don't be scared by it. I don't know when it'll come. I'm not making any predictions. But the new system is all ready to go. And all the big companies are already testing and parallel testing. And it'll be so amazing that uh, the new, like Walmart, will be all ready in just a few weeks to accept the new uh federal credits so they'll, they'll be all ready to go amazingly in just a few weeks via the big huge companies that'll put even more mom and pops out of business so um you know look uh there when it happens the new system whatever it may be you know digital or crypto based or however they'll do it um some people will be huge winners of course it'll be the same group bezo and melvin and warren buffett and some people will lose big and have certain investments and bank accounts wiped out. And, you know, I, I'm no expert as to what's going to go down, but my advice has been the same for 10 years. A dollar sitting in some account literally doesn't exist. Literally. It's just a number on a piece of paper. If I can, whatever dollar I get, if I can put it into a brick, if I can put it into a, a two by four, a piece of lumber, if I can put it in to um, a, a sheet of plywood, uh, you know, it's expensive, but a uh, three, four by eight sheet, three quarter sheet uh, inch exterior plywood that pushes $50 will last for the rest of my life. And that's converting worthless dollars into things that are real. And, um, you know, that is, that's the only thing that people can do at this point, because who knows when the new system comes, uh, whatever your net worth was in dollars Will that be transferable to the new credit system? I mean, who knows? Who cares? It doesn't, you know, throw, I ain't got no wide array of portfolio. I'm not worried about it. I got out of this shit 10 years ago. I don't have one investment. I If I get, if, if somebody's nice enough to give me a dollar, uh, Matt, are you going to say it that way for the rest of your life? Okay, if somebody's nice enough to give me a dollar, I'll buy a brick or I'll buy something that I know cannot be. Oh, Matt's telling you to buy some bricks and uh, plywood. Pissed away. By the Federal Reserve System, and as it converts over to its new demonic system. Thanks for listening. Have a great dinner, Wendy. Hope that you're having something yummy for dinner.
Sausage and eggs over easy. That sounds good. Just checking the chat. Hello to Bex. Good to see you. Hello to Pamela. Yeah, somebody said about Keith in a camper or a van. He wouldn't be smart enough to do something like that, though, would he? He had to spend the $1,000 donation he got on a hotel room. Yes, I grabbed some snacks, Pamela. <laughs> it's a... Uh... I don't know why it's peaceful to watch these these camping videos, but it just is sometimes. Uni lives by the sea.
His dog really enjoyed the meal there. Oh, is it lights out time now? He won't do that. He's not smart enough to do something like that. He'd rather focus on what other people have and fixate on other people than fix his own life. Every country is liberal in the West uh, that has given women the right to vote and then feminist movement has come through. Women overall, overwhelmingly, uh, are liberal and vote liberal and support liberal policies. That's the way it is. Uh, a lot of these, whether the elections are fake or not, isn't the point, but most men support uh something other than progressive liberal so as soon as you allow that the country becomes more and more liberal and socialist doesn't matter if it's norway or sweden or canada or usa it always does Yes, my channel is is an ASMR channel. It's uh, just my voice. My voice is either this way or my voice, according to YouTube, is pornographic, pornographic if I moan. So anyway, this is kind of making me sleepy, though, this video.
好，上，好，上。Bakacağım değil sanki. Olayım mı? Bakacağım mı? Bizim gideceğimiz yere doğru gitmiş. Kurt, kurt. Kurt mu? Kurt. Bak görüyorum içeri doğru gidiyor. Bak bak izlere bak bak. Kuyruğunu sürte sürte gitmiş demek. Bak. Kuyruğu aşağıda bak. Görüyor musun? Biraz yamuk bir de arkadan bakalım. Biraz geri gel, çok az bir. That's a maniac. That's a maniac. Look at the size of that winch on the front. Damn. Tam da adamısın. <gülüyor>
Gayet güzel, tamam. Okey. I hope you are all enjoying this live stream. This is El Diablo Radio International. You're camping with El Diablo today.
bir bez alabilir miyim? Kaçta şuradan ıslak menü verir misiniz? Şuraya şuraya. Ver anneciğim. Çarşaf veriyorsun. Ilerim. Yok yok fazla ileri atma ki ısıyı ısıyı orayı atmamız lazım. Şöyle. Bak işe yarıyor buhar biraz azaldı. Çok güzel yağıyor yalnız ya. Bak şu an burası da o kadar soğuk değil. Değil. biraz olmuş. Evet. Hadi yemek olana kadar dışarı çıkalım iki dakika. Çok güzel.
Aslında kardan adam olmuşsun altın bana diyorsun ama. Ay. Oradan çoğalt diye. Bir şey olmaz. Kafan sağlam. Hello. Are you there, Pam? Hello? Hello? Are you there, Pam? Choppy, I can't really understand what you're saying. You're breaking up. It just sounds like you called me sexy. That's what it sounded like. Can anybody hear what Pam is saying? Is she saying King Stephen sexy? Am I hearing things? That's what it sounds like. To me. If you think I'm sexy and you want my body. Yeah, it was Morse code for super sexy El Diablo. I think that Marcella would be proud. I think Pam can hear me, but I'm I don't think I could nobody could really hear what she was saying. Hello? Hello? Is it me you're looking for? I can see it in your eyes. I can see it in your smile. Pamela feeling lonely. <laughs> Hello. 
I wish I could hear what you're saying. It just sounds like dee dee dee dee dee dee Hello, is it me you're looking for? We're having technical difficulties. It must be Pam's Wi Fi connection or something. Thank you very much, Marcella, and, and welcome to the chat. I didn't realize you were here till just now. It's good to see you. Hello, is it me you're looking for? I can see it in your eyes. I can see it in your smile. I think that's a, is that a stone pot or something that she's cooking on top of this little wood stove? I don't know what that's made out of. Clay oven type pot. It's good to see you, Marcella. I'm glad you're here and listening. Oh, by the way, happy Good Friday to everyone here. Happy Easter. It's good to have you here. Efsane güzel. Çok güzel değil mi? Evet. 22 22 santim. Ya var. Evet. Dikkat ettiysen sobanın arkası eriyor. Evet. Soba bir tık ısıtıyor demek ki orayı. Hadi üst şurayı ısıtıyor oradan aşağı koy. İçerisi var ya sıcacık. <gülüyor> İçerinin sıcağı kapıya vuruyor direkt. Lambanın içine girmiş ya. Hello. You still?
still breaking up, Pam. I can't really hear you. It's uh, choppy. Sadly. Burası dolmuş. Kanalda dolmuş. Now that is snowing there. That's really snowing. Cuz they're not moving and that snow's coming down pretty pretty quick. Big snowflakes. Bayağı birikmiş ya 20 santim var. Lambanın içine su gidiyor ya. Bunu yapmasam kısa devre yapar aşkım. Cam çatlamasın. Düşünmüyorum değil mi? Hadi bakalım. Bir şey yaptım. Her yer kar. Sıcak ama o kadar soğuk. Yo dışarı. sıcak burası ya sıcacık. Hadi geçer. İyi geçer.
Balkonun durum fena. Su almış. Hmm. Şeyler falan hep buz tutmuş. Hmm. Dışarıyı gerçekten merak ettim şimdi. Bayağı kar yağmış. Cumburama geliyordu. Neredeyse dizine geliyor şu an. Evet. Bak şurada daha net anlaşılır. Oo. Kılıç olmuş. Şunu alayım ya. En büyük keyfim. Bunu alma zevki var. Alabilir miyim? Al. Bu ne? Bu. Şu neydi? Şu atların ismi neydi? Şunların. Şunun ismi neydi? Unicorn. Unicorn. Onun şeyine benzemiş. Dur bir tane de ben alayım. Senle savaşalım. Adaletsizlik var. Senin için üç oldu. <gülüyor> Ana. Ana. Ay gözüme Ulan, geliyor. Kalın olan daha çabuk kırıldı. Sıkıntılı ya. Cam gibi ya keskin. Abi çok fena tutmuş ya. Baksana. Bu taraf muhtemelen sobadan dolayı böyle oldu. Şu Öbür taraf tarafta bu kadar şey, buz yok. yok. E, bacı şu tarafta ya. Evet eritti. Bacağın ısı eritiyor. Eritince de damlaya damlıyor. Hmm. Baksana ya. ASMR. Keser cam gibi çünkü. Güzel. Kesti şurayı. Acaba enerjimiz ne kadar kaldı? Yanında mı telefon? Yanında. Bak şey delta key'yi de gösteriyor. Yüzde yetmiş altı delta key kalmış. Ha, onu da mı tanımladın? Diyor kendisi otomatik görüyor. Sistem oh, olunca. Oh. Enerjimiz yüzde üç kalmış. Çok iyi. Neredeyse dün hiç güneş yoktu. Ve yani hani güneşi geçtim. Kapalıydı sürekli. Sadece bir kere temizledin o da hemen bir kapandı. Temizledim de zaten almıyordu ki.
Arabayı bir çalıştırayım. Niye şey? Çalışıyor diye bakmak için mi? Evet. Çalıştır. Şey çalıştın ısınsa. Tamam. Şey isteyeceğim senden. Panele bir bas. Alternatörden bas. biraz doldursun. Yani. Hazır çalışacak. Şuna alternatör bastım. Bak çalışınca şu an sıfır ya. Şuraya Aha. bak. Tamam. Kapı açılmayabilir. Bu sütmüş aralar. Oo, her yere kar gitmiş. Adam, adam. Adam. Hey be. Manyak işte. Tiş, tek marş. Çık. <gülüyor> Biraz çalışsın. Bakalım şimdi. Gel. Şu an, şu an doluyor bak. 311 watt, 295 watt elektrik basıyor şu an. Bak üzere. Hmm. Hmm. Oh. Hmm. Anneciğim. Bak. Hadi. Suyumuz var mı ya yüz yıkamak için? Var var bir sürü su var. Biraz sarfı. Sudan da bir şey yok. Şimdi şunu şu tarafı vereyim mi? Evet. Ay, ne kadar güzel ya. Burası da hem buz tutmuş ya burası da. İçi buz tutmuş, bak buralar hep buz tutmuş. Evet, yavaş evet. yavaş eriyor işte. Onun için akmamış su. Evet. Ay. Desem Keşke şey yapmasaydın. Hala daha da çok hızlı. Şuradan bir yerden cırtaz bir şey açabilirsem. Gidecek. Evet, don, donuk ama. Şu an bu arabadan doldurduğunu gösteriyor ha, değil mi? Alternatörden gösteriyor. Bak şu an %55 oldu. %53'tü. Ve şu an 451 değişiyor işte. Yani şu 449 watt Elektrik basıyor. O 156 olmuş. Günaydın. Günaydın. Bu bile sıcak olabilir ha. Evet. Görüyor musun? Nasıl eriyor? Evet. Bir daha sıcaklıkta. Şu an iyi değil mi? Evet. Nasıl? İyi. Evet, evet. Biraz sıcak sanki ya. Hala. Tamam. Daha sıcak çünkü. Sen de bana dök.
Ya ne yapıyorsun? Yüzümüzü sildiğim e, su. Şey. Ya olsun. Ya, çok kötü. Allah Allah. Ben duymuyorum. İnsan oradığını duyar mı? Bu hemen olur Nehir. Hadi Ringo. Yeme yeme sakın. Yeme babacığım. Çünkü o arabanın metalleri de var içinde. Tozları falan. Börek oluyor. Ben bala koyacaksın zannettim. Ha yok. <gülüyor> Sıradan gidiyorum. Bıçağı mı bekliyorsun kızım? Evet. Daha çok beklersin. Nehir gel bunu devir. Kılıcı silah gibi. Işın kılıcı. Yok. <gülüyor> Bence tut gelsin. Aha. O ne Nehir nereden aldın onu? <gülüyor>
Serenat. There are roughly 250,000 lakes in Ontario, Canada. This is the largest one wholly contained within the province. But with its size comes a notorious reputation. The lake is feared by boaters and paddlers alike for its penchant for violence. Winds exploit its monstrous size and can transform a pleasure cruise into a horror. Most of the lake is remote, and the fish and wildlife here are something out of fiction. A year ago I spent a week paddling at South End and only covered a fraction of the lake. It was a trip that begged for more. This time, Aaron and I are attempting to paddle around the entire thing. The question is, will Mother let us play? This is the Alexander Dam, one of three on the Nipigon River, holding back the lake we're about to paddle. A humbling perspective on a sheer scale, with this river providing the largest tributary to the largest lake on Earth. This is the longest trip we've attempted, and conversation is fairly minimal as we load our 17-foot prospector canoe and go through mental checklists. Despite the lack of whitewater or portages, we know it won't be a cakewalk, and there are a few pre-trip jitters. To complete the trip will require a couple hundred thousand paddle strokes from each of us. But for now, it's one stroke at a time. way here and the anxiety that comes with starting a multi-week trip is fading away so much prep and planning and food prep we've got 120 plus meals in our in our food barrel there there's a lot that goes into it and you just fear that something's going to go wrong you'll forget something and that's all melting away now as we're on the water and we're approaching the first point of interest on this trip big beautiful prominence called otter head Just a perfect start to our trip here, coming around Otter Head, and conditions are gonna allow us to cross Three Mount Bay, which saves us going in there. We can do a five kilometer crossing across, which is a lot, but 
yeah, great conditions, even a little tailwind for the sail. Perfect start to our trip. And we better make hay while the sun shines because the weather in the long-term forecast looks pretty dubious with wind and thunderstorms. And this is a lake that's notorious for it to begin with. So we're gonna give her. All right, finish that big crossing, about five kilometers more. We'll be at our target campsite for the night, which is a beauty. All right, camp is in sight. Got camp set up right away. Sky's been kind of sketchy today. Got a nice big tent, very spacious for both of us on this private secluded beach with this insane view. Fantastic. Camp number one of many. Rogies for night number one and a good start to our trip 20 plus kilometers for a 1 p.m. start pretty good long way to go really looking forward to it it's not a rush trip but still you don't want to start out a potentially 400 kilometer trip behind schedule mm -hmm. what was their flavorful jalapeno and green onion uh -huh. So it's nine o'clock. It was a bit of a scramble to get everything done this evening. Just, uh, yeah, pushed for this campsite. Really glad we're here. I was here last fall, just under a year ago, and had an amazing experience here. Got windbound, but it was a beautiful day and the waves were crashing in on the beach. A bear came by, but uh, it was a good encounter because it swam away, no issue. And then the Northern Lights came out and uh, that was actually just a warm up for the Northern Lights that were to come on that trip. So. We're hopeful for those on this trip as well. The trip last year was just a week solo and I just dipped my toe in the water of this enormous lake really. So I knew I'd, I had to come back and I'm so glad that Aaron's able to come with me. It's gonna be an amazing trip. I'm glad too. Yeah. So here's a quick look at the map. We came today up from South Bay, around Otter Head, crossed Three Mount Bay, and came up to Smoke Point here on Dead Poplar Point. Last year I did the same, but I went around down into McIntyre Bay, all around here, and around and back. This time we're skipping McIntyre Bay because I've been there, going through here, and all around the lake should be around 400 kilometers. It's just a giant. What time is it? Ten after six. Nice. Good morning. Sun's coming up and we're getting some breakfast and tea on. Earl Grey this morning. And we've got a lot of granola this trip for breakfast. So it means we don't have to even get the fire going. And we just 
put some hot water we boil water the night before put it in a thermos so we can have hot coffee or tea with our breakfast without the need for a fire so we're scrambling to get out of here I'm expecting a strong wind today and it's already building a lot of fetch here to build up a wind through the mouth of mcintyre bay which is what we want to cross as soon as possible once we get around here we should be in the clear but yeah pretty nasty winds coming we got to get out of here Good thing it's not any more chopped up here. I know. I just discovered a new feature on my sun shirt. A pony hole. <laughs> <laughs> it does feel horse-like somehow. <laughs> it looks like a horse's tail. That's why it's called a ponytail. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you learned something new today. Yeah, every day. So it's actually very calm out here. That little point we were on was getting really chopped up and windy, but yeah, that's a relief because this next stretch is very exposed and rocky. And last time it got rough with two to three foot swell. So be happy not to do that again. We're just getting ready to start our crossing here. It's about two kilometers. And it seems like we're just in time as the fog's lifting for the first time this morning and we're getting our first view of the far shore. So it's nice and calm on this side and let's hope that holds up all the way across. And with conditions staying good, we get my line in the water. Amazing walleye, pike, lake trout, and brook trout fisheries here in Nipigon. McIntyre Bay on our left is where I saw the best northern light show of my life. John just bought a log and we were joking because we always save like grasshoppers and butterflies and stuff. So he's like, floating log, let's get it. So we were like powering to it. And then all of a sudden it slapped its tail and it was a beaver. Yeah, huge <laughs> it was a beaver. Big beaver. I thought it was a log, <laughs> big log. I'd like to see that one again. Yeah. Your eyes open for him. So we're coming around Grand Cape now. Beautiful spot, nice cliffs on this side and it's just as beautiful, if not more so, around the other side, which is as far as I got last year. Everything after that is gonna be new. As you can see, a lot of the area we've been paddling through today was burnt by a forest fire probably 15 years ago or so. Almost around the Cape, 
great scenery, somewhat obscured by forest fire haze, which is building. The fog burnt off this morning and then this haze came in. So according to our SATCOM forecast, we've got about two or three hours more of reasonable wind and then it's supposed to get pretty nasty. So we want, want to be off the water by then, ideally with camp set up. And it might be slim pickings. There's nothing marked on our map and the shoreline is rough, old forest fire. So we can't even really hang the hammocks or it'd be difficult anyway. So hopefully something will turn up. What do you think? It's pretty good. It's as good as we can hope for. Yeah, we might have to take this because yeah. if we push on, we might get stuck in a bad situation. So. Yeah, it'd be dangerous. It's an amazing beach with only our footprints. Yeah. yeah, great view, completely out of the wind. Better take it. Nice eagle feather here. Beautiful. Oh, it's so cool, so big. Yeah, they are. Like, okay. So I've said in the past that I never bring solar panels on trips because the trips just usually aren't long enough to warrant it. And I'd rather bring power banks. I usually bring two 20,000 milliamp power banks and that will see me through a couple weeks. But considering that this might be a three week trip, I decided to bring it, I own it already. So I'm doing it, but honestly, power banks make more sense. I still am a power bank fan, but yeah, something to, to try. Colder than I expected actually. <laughs> bean burritos on the menu tonight. Great evening here. We had a nap after our dip. Feeling refreshed. Mmm. Oh yeah. <laughs> Well, we certainly got out of the wind. It's extremely calm in the bay. And we've got a great view here from the tent. And if the clouds don't ruin it, it could be a great sunset too. And here's a regional map of Lake Nipigon from the book I'm reading. Right up there. Lovely morning here on Lake Nipigon to start day three. We've got tea, coffee, and Mexican quinoa rehydrating in the pot cozy. 
with yesterday's thermos water so we don't have to make a fire. Nice to have those little efficiencies. And the surf, we could hear it hitting, like there's some islands out there. We could hear it hitting them all night, but it seems to be simmering down and it's been really calm in the bay. So we picked a good spot and we'll get on our way after brekkie. Really excited. Yeah. I'm reading my book more and just <laughs> thinking about this lake. It's pretty cool to be reading a book about the lake your entire trip is on. Yeah. Water. <laughs> all right all packed up on our way for day three everything else from here on out is new Kingfishers ahead of us, and there's a whippoorwill at camp last night. We realized this morning that we're not even 48 hours into our trip, which is really hard to believe. We've seen so much already, but just scratching the surface. Probably the best scenery yet to come. Fishing, inflowing creeks and rivers to fish as well, and we haven't passed any of those yet. And possibility for woodland caribou, which are endangered in the area. Aaron's never seen one. I've only seen one ever, so that would be a real highlight for a trip. Beautiful. Just yeah. so much uninhabited space. It's hard to wrap your head around. That's crazy. We're going to cut across this bay. Doesn't look super interesting, so we'll save a bit of time here. We're through the crossing and we're finally out of the uh, forest fire and back into the mature woods. And it's nice to be able to smell the conifers and just have more variety in the forest. So onward, onward. Taking a break here to stretch her legs. Beautiful beach and moose and wolf tracks. The moose could be from this morning because it rained. Mm -hmm. That looks pretty fresh. Look at that thing. Yeah, yeah, it's a good size. Coming around Burnt Point, massive peninsula, and we're going down into Grand Bay. Next big chunk of the trip. Lunchtime, peanut butter and honey wraps, which we'll be having 50 of over the course of the trip, 25 each roughly. The odd pine here, red and white pine, we're north of their range, but there is the odd one on Nip again. Looking amazing here in Grand Bay. We're about to get it, hear it coming across the lake. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Ancient looking cliffs here. Thunder booming way behind us.
eagles flying off. Out, eh? yeah. All right, looks like we found camp for the night. Thunderstorms are threatening. It's just after five, so we'll call it quits here. Beautiful spot. Want some electrolytes? I would adore some. Chickadees want some. Here, you ready? Great campsite so far, but we're really happy to be on rock. Sand beaches are beautiful and nice in a lot of ways, but the sand gets in everything. So we're very happy in here. Glad we got off the water when we did. Wind just started howling. Such unpredictable weather, so we picked the right time. Uh, the canoe tied down as well. Food barrel's not going anywhere, it weighs a ton. This is why you don't want to push your luck too much on a big lake. It only took a few minutes to build up like this. Ended up pulling the canoe up here because the waves were just about reaching it, settling down a bit now, but it was too close for comfort. We didn't want to be thinking about that through the night. Sun just broke through on one side right as it started raining big heavy drops on calzones tonight eating up the fresh stuff the back half of the trip is going to be pretty lean the front passed through pretty quick gives us a chance to have dinner perfect day it's a fun day yeah. Scenery is just firming up. Just like us. Oh. So tired. So tired. About to get on our way for day four yesterday we continued down the shore cut across this bay around uh, burnt point down into here today we continue down chiatang bluff and it's a long like 10 kilometers of what looks like cliffs so it'd be a really nasty spot to get stuck in the wind very exposed so hopefully we get a window
cool, clear morning in the Canadian wilderness. Doesn't get much better than this. Really a joy to be out here this morning. And we seem to have it all to ourselves. We only saw a boat at our access point on day one, just past the access point. So no one else around. And my book about Lake Nipigon speaks to how bizarrely undeveloped Lake Nipigon is. It's just hardly anything on it. The odd cabin or structure, but very little for the most part, which is a miracle. And now it's quite protected as well. So hopefully it stays this way forever. Taking a quick bathroom break on this beach. Wind is kicked up quite a bit. And we're gonna have to hope that it settles down or we won't get past, be getting past these bluffs. Getting a little rough for an open canoe, so we're gonna get off the water for a bit. According to our SATCOM weather forecast, it's supposed to calm down a lot this afternoon. So, I'm not gonna push it, especially with the open canoe. A lot of advantages to a covered canoe with spray deck, but a lot of disadvantages too, especially for filming that you might not think of, but yeah, our policy is if it gets rough, just get off. Lake simmering down, just had lunch and tea, and it made us a nice platform to hang out on. Been a nice break. Looks like the lake settled down a bit, so we're gonna get back on our way and hopefully be able to make some progress and see some cliffs. tempting for a shower. I know. <laughs> you can kind of smell that water too. Yeah. It's like coming off here. Like it looks like it actually needs a nice shower. Yeah. We're supposed out. There's a little outflow here, but it sounds a lot louder. I'm thinking there's a falls back there. I might have to check it out.
the way this hazy light's hitting it makes it look even more magical and ancient. It looks so old. I know. So the bluff continues on that way a little bit, but we got the gist of it and it was stunning. So we're crossing over to that little island and then to the west shore of Lake Nipigon, way up that way. All right, we're across Chitang Bluffs back there and we've got a long way to go on the west shore here. The, the lake is about 100 kilometers north to south and it looks really scenic on the topo map. Next marked campsite's about uh, 10 kilometers away, so we're hoping to find something before then. But this shore is looking beautiful so far. Yeah, there's two spots for hammocks right here. It's perfect. Sweet. Get to hang the hammocks this trip. Yeah. I'll pull you in. This is what dreams are made of for us. Stone beach site to pull up the canoe. Great spot to cook dinner. A little sunlight left to charge up the power bank. And we're back in the hammocks tonight. So happy about that. Canoes tucked away. And back here. A view on the other side of this tiny little point. Should be able to see sunset over there, sunrise that way. We're really happy. Your favorite sight so far. All right, we've got penne tonight with rehydrated, what, tomato, spinach, mushroom, some matzo, and parmesan. And the bluffs are across from us. I didn't even notice that earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Too good. To complete the site, a luxurious wind has kicked up. Perfect temperature, absolute comfort. It's a pelican. Awesome. Wow, just woke up, heard a stick break, went down here and there was a black bear looking right at me, right there. And then he took off into the woods, that's good. It wasn't a big one. Good morning. Good morning. Little sunrise action over here. Just missed him again, he was right there. So we'll have to keep an eye out for him. Nice to be back in the hammocks last night and we went without the tarps because the forecast called for no rain. No stars really because the moon's still so bright. Looking forward to that later in the trip though. And we got a great looking day for today. 
with an exciting wake-up call. All right. Not sure if it's already day five or only day five. Feels like <laughs> we've been out here for a while, but in a, in a great way. way. So happy we have so much left. I'd be sad if we were, it was a 10 day trip, it would seem so short right now. Yeah. There's so much left to see. And we got Dalpalak rehydrated for fuel this morning. So here's the map update. That was last night's camp. That's where we get stuck in that beach and started up the west shore to there. And here's the broader view. We've tackled that over four days. And as you can see, there's a whole lot left. We're at the mouth of the first decent inflow on the trip, Williger Creek. And give the fishing a try. There's a huge bike right under me. Oh my goodness. No. He just darted away. He hit, oh, he hit it. Big pike. At least 36 inches. Oh. Easily could have been 42. Wow. Okay. Fishing motivation increased. Oh, I got my heart racing. He's right here. You got him? Oh, Aaron had the camera ready. Oh, amazing. Oh, okay, that's a win. Sometimes I just love to capture them in some way and to interact with this part of the world that's hidden. Never get to see it unless you fish for them or send the camera down. fish on but it's certainly not that big pike <laughs> no, just a little one Back to the lake, and I just saw the big fish again. He's like short biting this little paddle tail. You would think he would just inhale it. It's such a big fish. Fish on. Oh, dang. It's a smaller pike. That's still decent. But it's not the one. Well, we've got ground to cover, so we're moving on. There'll be other fish. It's a bit of a headwind today, so it's best we get on our way. In the distance, we're starting to see Caribou Island, and we're hoping to camp in that area. It's well offshore. We'll stick to the mainland, but that'll be a shorter day for us, probably under 20 kilometers. But we've got a headwind today, so we might as well wait but in the big distance when we have favorable conditions, tomorrow we should have a tailwind. Some days we'll probably be off the water altogether with a really rough day. Then we'll hope to have to make up that distance with a good sailing day. So just going with the flow, basically. Coming up to an island with a beach, so we're gonna 
hop out and see if there's a place to camp here. No dice on the beach site, so on we go. Ah. <laughs> Yeah, I think I'm great in here. <laughs> Started into a bit of a longer day than expected, and we just can't find a campsite. Our map had one marked here, and there's absolutely nothing. So uh, we're gonna continue. It's a beautiful day, but we're just getting baked in the sun. So we're ready to get off the water. These low energy nights, all for a backpacking meal. Easy prep, no cleanup. Stick stoves are just the best. Barely takes any stick fuel. Oil water so fast. I like this one because it's pretty big and doesn't mess around. Hmm. What do you think? That's good. Mexican style veggie bowl, not bad. Nice to have an easy meal after a long, short day. Mm hmm And a great view. Yeah. Couldn't really appreciate it at first, but <laughs> cooling down. Mm hmm So much sun this trip. Almost want rain. <laughs> Not bad for Camp 5. Walk down to the other end of the beach. Not too shabby. Camp five, camp four. Camp four. Uh, no, four. I don't know. I don't know. I'm losing track. I've lost track <laughs> of time. These sand floaties. They're so weird. How does sand float on water? Obviously, surface tension is the answer, but. So we've got these two small islands out in front of us. Behind them is Caribou Island. In the distance, I believe is Grand Cape where we were on day two. And we carried down that shore. And then way off in the distance, I believe that's Shakespeare Island, an offshore big island chain on Nipigon. And nothing but blue. Early start for day six. We'll be on the water just after sunrise. Big south wind is supposed to kick up today, which could leave some of our roof really exposed. So getting out of here, hopefully get some sailing in today too. Good morning. No sign of that wind yet. The lake's as glassy as it's been all trip. Such a sense of freedom out here. We got the wind pulling us, sun's powering our devices, tons of beautiful fresh water, all of our food for three weeks, and no planes, trains, or car shuttles, anything like that. So a fabulous sense of self-reliance. So we're about to make a small crossing from Champlain Point to Nazoteca Point. And that's gonna take us into one of the most anticipated stretches of the trip. Everything north of there looks really, really interesting on the top of the map. To the west of this crossing, there's a big bay, Gull Bay, small community there as well, and an access point called King's Landing for any of you Game of Thrones fans out there. 
Lunch break here in West Bay. It's a fish sanctuary. Interesting. And evidently some animals use this as a lunch spot too. There's some poop around and this pike skull. Lots of eagles here and even more pelicans. This whole area where we had lunch has just had tons of pelicans and eagles flying around. And then we came around the corner and right here there's a whole, there's a pelican colony. So there's actually restrictions because they're endangered. So we have to stay 500 meters away. So we'll carry on and give them their space, but it's pretty cool. Yeah. I've never seen that many. Usually I see two at a time. Yeah. Not in Ontario. You don't see that. Up. Here's camp number six in West Bay. Really interesting spot. Lots of wildflowers and a long wraparound beach. We saw some ungulate tracks on it, which could be most likely moose, but could be caribou, who knows? And what did you find? And I got John an anniversary gift for our two years since we got engaged tomorrow. It's a gift money can't buy. The downiest feather you've ever seen. That's incredible. <laughs> it's so soft. Yeah. And we're getting married this fall, so this is our final test for our relationship. Can we survive three weeks together in a canoe? So far, so, good. so great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we know we can. Wow, that's ridiculous. It's beautiful. Doing chili and bannock tonight. Aaron's got the bannock going. And we found something pretty interesting on the beach. What a unique skull. It's pretty far gone, but I was wondering if it was sturgeon. Maybe that's why this bay is protected for sturgeon. Or it looks kind of like a gar pike, but I'm not aware of gar pike being in here. Pretty interesting. Just had an epiphany. Could it be a pelican. That would make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Just heard thunder, so hopefully that holds off for a bit. Let's see where we're at. Five o'clock or so. 54%. That took all day, basically. Still a bit of daylight left, but yeah. These are gonna be delicious. Almost like having donuts out here, fresh, which is a real luxury when you're eating mostly dehydrated foods and all that. And I would even love to have fish here for dinner. We had time, but we're in the sanctuary and there's just a perfect weed bed right off here for fishing. Oh, pelicans and the eagles got to eat too. Our stuff's getting dry in this hot wind. We got to do laundry at some point in this trip, but not yet. Not even halfway yet. And down there in the distance, you might be able to make out the pelican colony. It's a little island. Still not sure what the weather's doing. 
but clouds would be welcome. It's uh, not the most beautiful site per se, but it is really interesting with a lot of diversity in plant life. And it's the only site so far that has had any signs of being used before. Fire pit. Our tent's in there. And we're mostly hanging out right over here. All right, here's the map update. And I'm getting in the tent because thunder's starting. Erin's already there. She's feeling some heat exhaustion, I think. So yesterday we came up into Williger Creek around Spruce Point, which was kind of nasty. And this campsite didn't exist. So we carried on and ended up camping right there on the beach. Today came up past Champlain Point and we ended here in West Bay Provincial Nature Reserve. Tomorrow we're heading around Undercliff Mountain and Echo Rock, which look beautiful, but we were warned about that section, so hopefully it's calm. And we'll carry up past the Kopka and Wabanosh River, White Sand River, some other beautiful destinations, Windigo Bay Provincial Park. And that's just going to be the first half. Oh, just plopped down into bed. Beautiful breeze above us. And that's good for Erin. She needs to cool down. Although, actually, she is cooling down. She's even got her sleeping bag on. If she overheats, she gets a little cold. So, yeah, she has a bit of heat exhaustion. But just hydrating. And hopefully tomorrow we don't get baked by the sun. But another beauty. Looking forward to tomorrow. And the wind just changed directions and it's getting pretty strong. So I bet those thunderstorms are coming over our way. Day seven, and it looks like it might be a rest day. We, we plan to be off the water at least one day a week. We have thunderstorms this morning and potentially waves this afternoon with some strong wind from the south, which would make it tough to get around under Cliff Mountain and Echo Rock. So, might be a rest day. Bunch of blue jays keeping us company. Silly sounding creatures. Mm -hmm. Twelve thirty, and we're just having lunch. There was a big storm last night, way bigger than anything we expected, and we were really missing the hammocks in the tent. Yeah, I was thinking this morning about how much I appreciate the hammocks when we have them for rain, where you've got the tarp and you're able to get out if you need, if you have to go to the washroom or something, and stay dry. And then everything else is so dry in the hammocks, you're able to pack up. Yeah, packing up is the biggest part. Yeah, and putting Instead everything of... away, not damp. Yep. Instead of this big sloppy tent. Yeah. Yeah. So, made me really appreciate those, but there's definitely some benefit to the tent. It was nice to yeah. hang out and be together, but... Always pros and cons, but in the rain, I definitely prefer the hammock. And you yeah. can see as well, yeah, there was a big true. lightning storm, so from under the tarp in the hammock, you can see a lot of it. And you can get a good view. As opposed to looking at the inside of the fly of the tent. So we're just chilling out today and get a 
an early start tomorrow. Anniversary dinner, we've got poutine, peanut M&Ms for dessert. Electrolyte drink. Yeah. Lemon lime flavored. Mm -hmm. How is it? So good. Mmm. <laughs> poutine was delicious. And we got another thunderstorm booming over there. Broken bat. Look at the little rock baseball. Broken bat hits a member of the crowd. And it starts raining. Ah! For this trip, I decided to bring the book Braiding Sweetgrass, which is one my friend still has been telling me to read for a couple years now. And I'm finally getting the time. And it's such a good book for out here. 10 out of 10. Okay, 640, we're on our way. Got some breakfast bars to go. Earl Grey to go. And Undercliff Mountain and Echo Rock. A couple hours away. Mm -hmm. Exciting day. Just stopped on this beautiful beach. So we cut our eye over here. There are no tracks, I don't think yet. No. So caribou are very dependent on lichens. They eat a lot of this sort of lichen off the trees and ground. And we notice lichen all over the ground here. So this has been browsed. Yeah. But I don't see any tracks. 
yeah. Anyway, fun to imagine. Doesn't really matter. It's just fun to imagine them. Pelican. Pelican. There are some faint tracks here, but that's no surprise. Could be moose. Oh, Peregrine Falcon. Wow, that is a sheer drop. On Echo Rock here, there's uh, the book says there's some very faint pictographs, so we're just kind of having a look around. I'm not sure if we found them or not. If it is, they're quite faint, but it's fun to look. Big spiders. up there that look ready to fall on. No sign of the pictographs at Echo Rock, but as we were coming around the corner, there's a campsite right after it, and there were four young guys camped there. First boats we've seen since day one near the launch. Four young guys from the U.S. in kayaks, which make a lot of sense for big water like this, from Wisconsin, Illinois, and Ohio, I think, and it is I sound like it's like I'm so old, but it's great to see young people out here enjoying this. They were on night 11 of their trip, I think they said, and they got a couple more left. They're doing the top half of the lake, going the opposite direction as us. They started at High Hill, so we'll be there probably in eight days or so. PB and honey wraps. That's a quick lunch. Some interesting tracks on the beach here. Hard to tell, like for us to tell the difference between moose and caribou. They're small. But these look, we've seen tons of moose tracks in our lives. These look a little different. Mm -hmm. What would it mean to you to see one? That would be pretty special. Yeah. Yeah, they're so cool. They're just so endangered and rare. Yeah. Almost like, like they could be extinct someday. And I hate to think of that, but to get to see one before they do, mm -hmm. if they do, we just, it's just a privilege. Mm -hmm. Incredible wildflowers here. It's just a fascinating area. Echo Rock, and now we're passing by an old Hudson Bay Company trading post from 1850 to 1937 is what I think it said in, in Nancy Scott's book. Of course, there's much older indigenous history here dating back 8,000 years to the end of the last ice age when the glaciers were coming out of here. And then on top of that, there's Outer Barn Island ahead of us, which is just a remarkable island. Fortunately, it's way offshore. We won't be seeing it up close, but even afar, it's a sight to see. 
In the book, there were close to 20 fur trading posts on Lake Nipigon itself and even more in the basin, but it sounds like there are virtually no remnants left of any of them. Just came around this corner and spooked a big bald eagle. It took off and we were like, I wonder if it had a fish there. Sure enough, big chunky pike. Probably a 10 pound fish right there. It's not that long, but it's thick. Also an old campsite here. And there are a few blueberries, first we've seen yet, and some Saskatoon berries as well. That's nice. And an enormous, I don't even know if you can call that a fire pit. Stonemason camped here. Swans, beautiful. Sorry, coming down pretty hard on us. We were about to stop for lunch, so we're actually gonna set up a tarp and wait some of it out. Well, we're drying out. Didn't last, but it was a hard downpour. Got sweet potato curry, right? Yep. In the pot cozy. And this is a nice site. We plan on stopping here for lunch anyway. Just happened to start pouring when we got here. Very nice. Probably the nicest established site we've seen. Looks like we're in for showers today, despite our 0% precipitation forecast. So we decided we we're gonna stick around here. It's mid afternoon. We've done 27 kilometers today, right? 26, 27. So that's good enough. We only have to average 20 per day. We're expecting to be windbound some days. And yeah, we just wanna hang out here. We got a really exciting part coming up and the next campsites are 12 kilometers away. So we'll do it tomorrow with full head of steam. We're also really glad to be filtering some new water here and to have a swim somewhere else because there was that pel pelican colony, I don't know, probably a kilometer and a half away from our site, but the wind and waves were blowing right toward us and they pooped so much on their little island and it was definitely all blowing into us. After we went for a swim, we had a bit of a swimmer's itch. So yeah, ready for a swim. Okay, we're all moved in for camp number eight. Gonna be an er another early start tomorrow, so Aaron's getting in a nap. We just had a dip, drying everything off, and we'll be on the water hopefully around sunrise tomorrow. Closing out day eight here, having a light dinner. Yeah, it was a great start to the second week of this trip. Yeah. Second phase. Very excited tomorrow to get to the mouth of the Kopka River Provincial Park. It's actually Wabanosh River, but the Kopka drains right in before that. And hoping for good, good fish in there. Yeah.
Morning of day nine, on our way, excited for this one. We've got the mouth of the Kopka Provincial Park and Wabanosh River, and I'll definitely be wetting the line there. Otters just dove right in front of us. This inner barn island comes into view. Saw outer barn island yesterday. You tell us go. <laughs> hey there. What a morning. Did not expect this scenery on this shoreline here. Wow. Wow. <laughs> As we come around the corner here, we can start to see some gold in the hills. So things are starting to change for fall. It's still early August, but up here, the colors start changing early. Oh. I'm so helpless. Mm -hmm. Amazing bird life on Nipigon continues. Got to be a dozen mergansers, it looks like, on a rock over there. Some bank swallow holes. You don't see the swallows. Kingfishers. Lots of birds. So great. So this morning we've come from English Point there along this beautiful rocky shore into Wabanosh Bay and Kopka River Provincial Park. And we're right at the mouth there of the river. The Wabanosh flows in here into Wabanosh Lake and the Kopka River, famous Kopka River flows in here as well and they drain into Nipkin here. I paddled up the Kopka uh, last summer and it was stunning. But no bites here yet. Erin's got her magnet out for some magnet fishing. Hopefully we'll get something. When I ran into the four guys yesterday in the kayaks, I asked if they had any luck fishing and they didn't. So I think we both felt better knowing that each party hadn't had any success. A little bit of pride restored. of pelicans ahead of us 
And uh, so it's an interesting spot, beautiful scenery. And in my notes, I wrote that Hudson Bay Company had Wabanosh House over there from 1821 to 1850. And right over there, Northwest Company, Fort Duncan from 1795 to 1821. We were gonna get out and take a look around, but um, the grass is actually a lot taller than we anticipated. So we probably won't even see much and just catch a bunch of bugs. So we'll leave it alone, but it's cool. Yeah, in the book, it sounds like there aren't any relics left really extremely lucky to find something, so. Oh good, just beautiful wildflowers now. Up in the river mouth, finally got a bite. It's pretty spunky. Not too big, but it's got a fight. This has gotta be a trout. Hmm. Wow. wow. Gotta be a trout. And that rod bent, single barbless hook. Oh, oh, that's a nice. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Is that a brook trout? That's huge. Holy cow. This is what Nipigan is famous for. Oh my goodness. That is, that's a huge brook trout. Holy smokes. Oh my. Holy smokes! That is a spectacular. That's my biggest brook trout ever, I think. Wow. You clear the hook, keep the fish in the water. Oh my goodness. It just <laughs> spilled out. Aaron got it on camera. That's all right. I don't care about the photo too much anymore, but yeah, as long as you got something. Wow. Oh my God. What an idiot. It was a powerful fish. <laughs> it was, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, who cares? Wow. That is what I was expecting. Wow. On this guy. Might have found the reason for the relative lack of fish back there. There's a rapid ahead and a bunch of pelicans are fishing it. So this looks promising. I would estimate that brook trout at least four pounds, if not five, five plus. Yeah, yeah. Aaron says five plus. It, it could have been six. Oh. getting much magnet fishing which isn't a huge surprise because it's a really big lake so lots of coming across something to pick up or slim but it's kind of cool like seeing the rocks that come up so it sticks to the magnet there's often lots of debris and sediment it's fun lots of iron content in it or something i guess yeah i think so yeah high iron i don't know what we found here some old engine maybe a little piece of a Ooh. Forestry equipment, I guess. Yeah, some form of forestry equipment. Looks like an engine and then a bunch of gears over here. To protect the trout on Nipigan, you're not allowed to keep them in a live well. Obviously, we don't have a live well or ice or anything. So I wasn't going to keep a fish like that because it's just way too much for, for one sitting. And it has to be at least 56 centimeters on Nipigan, same as Superior. I think that's 23 inches, which is an enormous brook trout. That's a, just a crazy standard, but it speaks to how big they get here. But I was just trying to release that fish gently, keeping the water, lost focus. Hopefully I'll get another one because that would have been the fish of the trip. Fish was just out of frame for me. Aaron got a little with the action cam up front, but it was on like the really wide view. So it's, there's no detail to it. Anyway, we got to move on. Unfortunately, we could fish this all day, but the campsites that were marked on the map here don't exist. So 
we got to carry on and the next one marked on the map is 18 kilometers away so onward Aaron's taking a turn wow got some round egg mm -hmm. up in it mm -hmm. Oh, it's pretty nice walleye. Nice walleye. Nice walleye. Good job, hon. That's how it's done. <laughs> there we go. Just getting it warmed up for you. Found a long beach before too long. The view of inner barn island and many others. The lake's chopping up on. We'll stay. There's a little creek coming in here. It's pretty interesting and some hammocking spots back in the woods. So we'd be happy to be in the hammocks tonight. This burl's crazy. I've never seen anything like it. Not anything that big. Let's see. Look at that. Look at the size of it. So here's camp nine. For the eighth time out of nine, we are in a kind of a bush site slash beach. We've only been on last night's established campsite. And it's only the second time we've been in the hammocks. So we're really happy about that. So comfy. This is a pretty good summary of the weather on Nipigon so far. It can be totally clear and then it just gets nasty. This was the other reason we stopped here. In the forecast, it's supposed to get stormy. Yes. I hope that didn't hit the canoe. <laughs> <laughs> Same, and if it did, I'm glad we're not in it. Oh man, yeah, good call to get off early. Yeah. This lake is a beast. Wow. What entertainment. That's a show. You know what we'll be looking at inside the tent? What's that? You know what we'll be looking at inside the tent? Tent. The tent. on top of us. The lightning and thunder, it's instantaneous.
Storm is passing and the sun's back out. We got this creek flowing again. The wind and waves were driving water into it. Now it's flowing out. Awesome dinner, just making a quick dinner here on the alcohol stove. Off to bed, in good time today. Gotta wake up early tomorrow. We got northward progress to make and some potential headwinds. So as if I wasn't stupid <laughs> enough after dumping that incredible world-class brook trout <laughs> back in the lake, uh, I just pointed out to Erin how bad my screen's getting on my cell phone. And she said it shouldn't scratch like that. This could be just the original pr screen protector. I've had this problem for like a year. And I've just been riding it out. Sure enough, <laughs> that is a screen protector. <laughs> and I now have a brand new screen. I can barely oh. see through this thing. <laughs> So oh, it's so great. <laughs> Look at that. Silver lining to today. Brand new. And a, a great day overall. Yeah, it was a good day. Aside from that, I'm sorry. Sorry. Just walking the beach after dinner, and it's glassy calm now. Holy cow. We just had something big run right. How far do you think that was from you? No, uh, very close. A, a couple of three a couple meters, meters, maybe. What's that? Three meters? Oh, yeah. Something went through here. We felt it felt wildlifey here. <laughs> and it proved to be true. <laughs> oh, I guess we'll probably see tracks on the beach. It ran right through here, and I don't see any sign of it now. Wow, what time is it? 4.30? Oh, that'll wake you up. Mm -hmm. That's uh, around the time that we had something run through our site last I trip. <laughs> this is the uh, the hour for them. <laughs> They're waking up. Well, I heard like a stick break and then suddenly it was really loud. It, it must have been a moose. Yeah, hopefully the tracks on the beach will reveal when we get up. Whew. Okay. Back to sleep? Uh, let me try. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> You're okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Okay. Oh my goodness. Like a human. And now we got a wolf or like at least a coyote. It was pretty close too. Was not far. All right, first light's creeping in here on day 10. We're getting out of here. <laughs> Interesting experience. Huge thunderstorm. A moose almost runs down Aaron in the dark. And then a wolf howl. Coyotes aren't as common as wolves here, so more than likely it was a wolf. And it was close. Just the other side of the creek, I would say. Very close. Mm, very close. So we're walking the beach now, eager to hopefully find some tracks. And it's funny because last or yesterday evening we were both saying we had this animal vibe. 
there's like this primal sense I think that we're not really tapped into. You can just feel a wildlifey spot. That looks like it's been disturbed because mm -hmm. there's dry sand. Yeah. Okay. Here it is. Tracks. Yep. So that looks probably like a moose. Yeah. Running. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. That's a big one. Holy. Oh, what? That's a big moose. Here. Holy cow. That was a tank. And there are these really pronounced dew claws behind, huh. which I think can be more indicative of caribou, but also you'll see them in moose tracks sometimes. Yeah. Oh, man. If that was a caribou, that would be. Just I'm, tragic. I think it's too big. I think so too. Yeah. I think the tracks are too big. Yeah. There it yeah. goes. Oh, um, oh, and then it continues down here. Yeah. Oh man, that's so funny. Yeah, we gave it quite the startle too. Yeah. I don't know. Huh. I don't see as huge here. No. That's interesting. Oh, it's got a dew claw. Yeah, I know. I said that. It's got a really pronounced dew claw. That could have been that could have been caribou. Yeah. Oh my goodness. It might have been. These now they don't look as big now that they're in now that it's kind of compacted sand and wow. Huh. Okay, well <laughs> maybe someone can confirm with the tracks. If so, that would be Aaron's first caribou experience. Mm -hmm. Not the one we dropped up, but yes, anyway, that was cool. Well, it's quick way up, but looks like it's going to be a beautiful day and we're going to be on the lake early. So, yeah, it's a win. There's a barred owl hooting over there now. As a cameraman, I feel like I've failed on this trip so far. <laughs> we had that black bear at the site um, four or five days ago. I didn't get any footage of the massive brook trout, <laughs> this potential caribou. That one couldn't really be avoided. There was nothing I could do. No. Or the wolf most likely howling 50 meters from our site. Hopefully I'll make up for it. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, your instinct was to yell and scare the caribou away to protect me. So yeah. it's okay. Another perfect, clear, cool morning in the Canadian wilderness. Paddling on a big lake like this, sunrise, barren, no place in the universe I'd rather be. Inner Barn Islands coming around the corner here, and it just looks amazing in the morning sun. We're expecting a headwind today and right now we've got a tailwind so we're going to make the most of that looks like we could have headwinds for the next couple days so we set this trip up to be a marathon a lot of sprints so we had time to enjoy stuff and only have to average about 20 kilometers per day Yesterday we only did 14 and today we have 16 to the next campsite, which we might stay at. We'll see, see how much we like it. At the most, we might get to the White Sand River. Another amazing beach for a lunch spot. And something really bizarre to swim under the canoe. 
A big insect like I've never seen before. Where'd it go? It's gone. Oh, there it is. It's weird. It's got like big horns on it. I don't think I've ever seen a beetle like that. That's no, not a beetle. And then there's a big earthworm right there too. Oh. You want to lift it out? That's hilarious. Oh man, I can't believe it went on it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's going to look so freaky on camera, probably. Mm hmm. Like a monster. Yeah. my Castle Island now with a tailwind, a beautiful tailwind, on a day that we thought we'd have a headwind. Castle's building in the sky too. Supposed to be storms later, potentially again today. So we're just going to cruise, enjoy this afternoon, get off the water in decent time. Pelicans in a flying V. Oh, yeah. That was incredible. Just like I just geese. heard like their wing beats as a unit almost. <laughs> like heard them soaring through. Yeah. It was very cool. We've got the headwind we we're expecting now, but we're just a couple kilometers away from the mouth of the White Sand River, and it's clear from the shoreline where it gets its name. So we're the mouth of the white sand. Really exciting to be here and we'll hopefully fish it. It's super shallow though. And we're hoping to camp here, but it looks pretty bleak. Either tall sand banks or thick, thick bush. So we've just dipped into the white sand river. We're hoping to find camp somewhere along here. Whoa, it's just a beaver. <laughs> okay. Whoa. Turtled us. Just swam under the canoe. <laughs> oh man. After last night we're uh we're a little on edge maybe. Still there? I don't know. He no. was visible like here for a bit. So. <laughs> oh <laughs> man. Just scrambled out of the bush. <laughs> As you were saying. <laughs> almost tipped us. Yeah. As I was saying, it feels nice and safe on the river. <laughs> feels nice to be tucked in after that headwind and just being on the big lake. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's really, it just, it's such a cool feeling on the river. But uh, yeah, that was fun. <laughs> oh, man.
What do you think? Yeah, I think we can probably get hammocks up in here. Okay. We'd love to camp on the river tonight, and Aaron's hopped out, and looks like this might be workable. Peaceful change of pace for tonight. This log stopped us on the river. We're going to try and portage around that, so we figured we'd get out here and see if we can make anything work. And we found a really cool spot on this bend in the river. There's a game trail right on it, which is probably beaver. Almost for sure, based on this spot. Yeah, very cool, very peaceful. So nice to be in some more mature woods. A couple hammock spots over there. All right, tarps up, and cook some lunch. Well, this camp is a breath of fresh air. We've got water access down there. No sand to worry about after many beaches, which are nice in a lot of ways, but always trying to avoid sand in your shelter and food. Gets a bit old, so. Yeah, it's sweet to get a bit of river travel almost. Haven't had any river tripping this season, basically. Big lakes. And I'm gonna wet my line before something moves in. Looks like that might happen. We even lined this beaver trail with some deadfall. It's pretty bougie. It's starting to rain, but I mostly just wanted to get a few casts onto this log. I'd be happy with that if I do. So here's the map update for the last two days. Came around here into Wabanosh Bay, up to the river, back out and around to there, past Castle Island, up the White Sand to there. Next points of interest, Windigo Bay, Provincial Park and Bay, and Mount St. John. This morning we're gonna head up the river and just check it out a little bit. We could hear some moving water, so hoping to find a little bit of rapids or something that we can cast a line in. And it's just been nice to be on the river, so we're gonna see a little bit more of it. Really nice to be paddling an unloaded canoe. Got normally, I don't know, 200 pounds a year at least in here. Yeah, it's beautiful in the river. There's some cliffs back there. You can't see them from camp, but we camp right there.
no luck, but I bet in spring and fall this is quite a spot. Is there a camp in there? I can barely tell it's in there. Back to camp. That was a nice change of pace and everything about this, this camp has been a nice change. And it's been windy, gray, and drizzly, so nice to be off the lake and tucked in here. It's supposed to die down a little this afternoon, so we'll get on our way after lunch. Okay, we just packed up and had lunch, and we're on our way back to Nipigon. Coming along the shore of these tall sand banks, and the sand stretches out, I don't know how far, but it's very shallow and flawless sand. A couple trumpeter swans here, making our way along the shore. Yesterday we saw this cleared land and maybe 15 buildings from afar, and it was almost bizarre to see them after seeing almost nothing but bush for the last 11 days. And I happened to read about what this is or was in my book today about the lake. So in 1884, the Windigo Bay Fur Trading Post was established around this area, and this community was developed as well to help conduct business with it in the convenient location. However, decades ago, the Nipigon River was dammed, which raised the water level on the lake by, I think, about 70 centimeters, and that caused erosion in new places, including here. Even some burial grounds were eroded, sadly, and the community ended up relocating. In the book, it says Old White Sands is used seasonally by White Sand First Nation as a healing lodge, boat launch, and a few cabins have built at the site. And they're also adjacent to Mount St. John and Windigo Bay, which are the next points of interest on our trip. unbelievable like close to a kilometer we just followed him along the shoreline he's aware of us and just completely unperturbed we're just keeping a respectful distance but it's pretty just incredible i've never had an encounter like that no does not care barely even looked up at us yeah doesn't care it's so cool
coming up to the mouth of Kenna Creek. There's a campsite marked on our map there. I'm going to bet that it doesn't exist, but we're going to check it out. And in any case, we just saw a heron flying around perched at the top of the tree. We've never seen a heron perch like that, so pretty cool. Yeah, no sign of anything in here, but beautiful northern woods. Back to the big lake and stopping here on this rock, inspecting it for a potential campsite. But it was also a Hudson Bay Company trading post from the 1884 through all the way to the 1950s. Not all that long ago. We might be able to tent here actually. Blueberry shrubs, but no blueberries on them. We were really hoping for lots of blueberries to keep produce coming into us on this trip, but oh well. Lots of this blueberry look alike Clintonia, but can't eat that. Yeah, it's a nice sight. We'll be in the tent tonight. It's got rock, sunset view, sunrise view over this way. And we'll have some fun looking for relics. I don't know if this is the exact site of it, but it was around here. Another great day with trumpeter swans, black bear, and the heron. And some gulls here are begging. Beautiful view. And the islands, there are I think like 500 islands on Nipigon. And the distances, they all look different. And some of them create mirages. Some of them look like they're floating in above the water. And we're right across from Windigo Island. Tomorrow we'll be heading around into Windigo Bay, just on the edge of it here. <laughs> Pretty bold. So we're doing a little relic hunting this evening. No signs of anything yet. Yeah, you can picture some caribou walking through these woods. Munching on these lichens, old man's beard, they love this. Tons of Labrador tea here. Sphagnum moss. This is lovely. Sun's coming out too, hopefully for sunset. Day 12 starting out is an ugly one. It's cold and gray and windy and not a nice day for paddling. So we're sitting tight this morning to see what happens. We've only taken one rest day so far through 11 days of travel. And we've budgeted three for the trip. We're expecting to be windbound for at least three days on the trip, just knowing the nature of this light. So 
if we have to sit tight today, that's fine. Aaron is whipping us up a real treat. Bannock <laughs> with raspberries. Dehydrated raspberries. She did these at home. It's gonna be amazing. Yeah, this will be nice. Just what we need on a cool gray morning. Yeah. That's good things. I learned to make bannock when I lived in Geraldton. I was lucky enough to know several women who were very generous with their knowledge. And one of them who taught me most of what I know about bannock making is Sandra mm -hmm. Ice. So thanks, Sandra, if you ever see this. Really appreciate it. So good. <laughs> Haven't had a shore lunch yet on this trip. That would be a really nice thing. I got one today. Give it a shot. starting to drizzle and it's not a pleasant day on Nipigon, but it can be far worse. The weather's been pretty good to us overall, very good. But there's a quote in the book here that I thought it was fitting for today. It talks about the recreational opportunities here and says, but it must be remembered that this is a wild and remote lake that can be very treacherous, even for experienced adventurers. Due to a particular set of circumstances, the wind and swells can be dangerous and unpredictable. Swells tend to be steep and of short frequency and can therefore be especially treacherous. The wind speeds on the lake, in combination with the lake's long fetches of open water, can make boating very hazardous for small watercraft. Moreover, most of the shoreline is not hospitable for camping, and there are few suitable campsites. Those who venture out onto the lake must always be mindful of the unpredictable and hazardous nature of the lake. This east wind has not let up at all today. Fished a little, no luck. So we're cooking up dinner back here, and then we got a special treat tonight for ourselves anyway. setting up movie night here mm -hmm. we never do this on trips but given the length we decided to bring one movie and you could probably guess what it is for an intermission halfway through the movie some popcorn kernels oil and salt that's it so good real movie night mm -hmm.
beautiful sky to start day 13. Lucky 13. And we'll be looking at the sky tonight, hopefully. Some stargazing. The moon's finally getting small. And there's supposed to be the Perseid meteor shower tonight. So we're really looking forward to that. It's supposed to be clear. Fingers crossed. All right, we on the move? We're on the move. This feels good after a rest day. Yeah, it does. So for day 13, we're heading into Windigo Bay. And in our book, there's a quote about this section. It talks about Norval Morisot, who was an artist born on Lake Nipigon, and we both love his work. It says, Morisot wrote a book of Ojibwe legends, including the chilling tale of the infamous evil spirit, Windigo, which in the book is said to reside in the northwest reaches of Lake Nipigon at Windigo Bay, where the legendary spirit of the Ojibwe perhaps lingers still. Eerie. The, uh, the Windigo is the most horrifying uh, folklore beast or demon that I know of. Haystack Mountain in the distance as we come into Windigo Bay. And there's no campsites marked here, but on the far side of Windigo Bay, there's the Picatigushi River. You might look at that for a campsite, at least fish it. And then there's a point called Meeting Point, which I'm assuming has some historical significance. Hopefully we'll camp there because the next campsite marked on our map is about 60 or 70 kilometers away. So, the magnets come in handy. Butterfingers, me, dropped my phone in the lake. And thank goodness we had the magnet. I was able to scoop it up. Yeah. It seems to work fine. waterproof these days. Yeah. I was just checking it to pull out my life jacket to check the time and drop. So, saved me having to go for a dip. We're at the north end of the bay. Oh, scared a couple ducks <laughs> and Aaron. And it's uh, really peaceful and rich plant life in here. Birds, all this dark soil. Yeah, nice change of pace. Quite a special place in Windigo Bay. On our map, beaches are depicted with this brown outline around the shoreline. And Windigo Bay, before the dam on the Nipigon River, the dams, it was all beach. You can see it's pristine sand for miles. And it's, it's kind of sad to picture that all being washed away and drowned. But still, despite the damming, this lake is a masterpiece.
peanut butter and honey wraps for the sixth time so far on this trip, but very convenient, pretty filling and satisfying, and we are not sick of them at all. In fact, we look forward to them. Windigo Bay has turned out to be a beautiful spot. Haystack Mountain is in there behind us, really unique shape. Tons of wildflowers, and feel like we're just on the cusp of a wildlife sighting. Just got that vibe. Back on our way and we're at the mouth of the Picadagushi River now. And there's all these old trees here that I guess got washed out by elevated water levels from the dam and these cedars take forever to rot. So they're still just lying here. Hoping to get into some fish here, but it's been quite shallow. Another eagle taken off. We've seen at least a hundred on this trip. nest over there on the left. Nice looking river, but we're heading back to the lake and we might have a little sailing opportunity here too. We got about five kilometers of sailing in this afternoon and we're getting close to meeting point which is where we're hoping to find camp for the evening. Okay something called out to us right away. Big beautiful rock, nice old forest behind, spot for the hammocks and a fantastic view. We get laundry going right away. So because of the length of this trip, we need to do laundry halfway. We plan to do it on day 10 or 11, and suddenly it's day 13, we haven't had the chance. So glad to get this. Get some water in the dry bag. And some camp suds, put these in here. I'll wring everything out, squeeze the soap through everything, and then dump it way back in the woods because this is biodegradable, but only in soil, not in the water. back in the hammocks tonight. And this is the closest we've ever set them up. There's literally a foot and a half between the ends of our hammocks. And we're hoping to go tarpless tonight for the meteor shower. We're all settled in here, really happy with this camp. We've got black bean burritos going today and uh, we put hash browns in there too. It's a nice combo. And Aaron spotted this, something I love to oh, yeah. see. It's a survey monument, so topographic survey of Canada, Ontario sheep post, oh, C6, I mm -hmm. guess is the reference, and it was put in in 1926. And they use those as geographic reference points, so that's like a, a known point on the earth. Aaron just spotted this new dragonfly. It would have just crawled out of this shell, and now it's shaping up. That cloud is a duck. That is an immaculate duck. Got a fish on the third or fourth cast. Haven't got a look at it yet. Not a long pike fish. 
pretty stout and powerful. Oh, oh that's not too bad. I want it flopping around. Got my pliers here ready. Wherever I'm fishing, pliers are at the ready. Give you a quick look. It's pretty thick. It's like the thickest pike I've ever caught that's not long at all. Thank you. Not allowed to keep pike between 27 and 36 inches on that again. So, we she goes. Probably in that limit. Watching the sunset and boiling up some mint tea. Wind down day 13. Hasn't been unlucky at all. It's been one of her favorite days of the trip. Beautiful view. I really look forward to stargazing tonight. We've seen a number of starry nights so far, but nothing compared to when there's no moon. So mm -hmm. we're getting close to that, and there's the meteor shower tonight. So, but yeah, it's been a great day. One of my favorites. Yeah, Windigo Bay was just amazing. So much life in there. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised we didn't see wildlife. But... Life and color, beauty. Mm -hmm. So much color. Okay, it goes the wildlife lens for the first time on this trip. In comes the Astro. Let's do this. Morning of day 14, and what a night. Stargazer's dream. Countless stars, Milky Way, a bit of aurora glow, and meteor shower. Yeah, and it was totally clear, calm, mild, not too many bugs, it was perfect. And it's been cool on this trip to be looking back at where we've been the whole time. Back way over there, we can see the tall sand banks and Mount St. John, and yeah, we've always been looking back at what we've seen. It's an interesting way to progress on a trip. And we still got a, quite a bit left, mm -hmm. another week, so lots left to see. All right, 9 a.m., ready to get on our way a little later than normal because of the stargazing. And we've got a nicely packed canoe, a lot in here. We keep a double blade behind us for windy conditions as, and as a backup. Camera bag, tripod, day bag, map, one pack. Two packs, barrel, tent, overflow bag, odds and ends. Place that on top. And under here, we do have two dry suits for each of us, but we haven't felt the need to use them yet, which is great. And yeah, we're on our way. You all 12, eh? Yeah.
taking a break here on another beach. This is a long one. Stretching our legs, walking down it. Usual tracks, moose or possibly caribou. I'd say the odds of it being a moose to caribou are probably a hundred to one. Aaron spotted a moose over there. I'm gonna try to get my other camera. We have a, a call. We go. Hoo, hoo, hoo, hoo, hoo. Oh no way, it's caribou. No way. No way. No way. That was Aaron's first caribou, my second. We were just talking about it. No way. <laughs> no way. No way. That was incredible. It got to the like, it was like 50 feet from me. I know, I was getting a little worried because, you know, yeah. unpredictable. You never know. I can't believe that just happened. 100 to 1. All these tracks. That we, I just said to her, every time we see these tracks, we're probably just kidding ourselves and it's our imaginations. Wow. It's moose, you know? That has a privilege to see, oh. truly. And we just established this last night. I said, if we see wildlife, yeah. we need a like, call to each other that's not going to be like too obvious. We said, hoo hoo, hoo hoo. And you did it flawlessly. I had time to run down the yeah. beach. Get my other camera. Oh. Wow. Wow. That was incredible. And it was such a good, like, yeah, I got as close as I was comfortable just trotting down the beach, not noticing me. I heard it first because it was in the rocks. I thought I heard it. And then, yeah. No way. I saw it and I just kept trotting our way. Oh my. <laughs> that was just perfect. <laughs> Oh. Carol, just dump it onto the beach. We're going to go look at the tracks. So we've just come back to look at the tracks. And so I was sitting, I was actually looking for rocks. And I was down the beach there, probably about 50 meters. Um, kind of, I don't know if you can see, but there's a tree fallen. Uh, and then here's the print, which is cool. It's got the really clear dew claw back here and then compared to moose it's actually kind of seems almost like these are more spread out like i feel like moose are a little bit more compressed but that would be it running back once it's on me yeah close to it because yeah. of the compression effect of telephoto lenses surprisingly the tracks aren't as distinct as you might imagine for a running caribou And you may have seen nature documentaries showing herds of caribou, but those would be tundra caribou where they're a lot more numerous. Here, these are woodland caribou. Mm -hmm. Very endangered. It's 
pristine beach after pristine beach here. Just moose tracks or caribou tracks. That's that's all. This is the nicest beach we've come across. We've seen a lot on this trip and they're all beautiful, but this one's something about it. The sand seems even whiter and then there's just this stand of almost two dozen red pine that are very mature. It's just a mesmerizing beach. Couldn't resist getting out. It's so tempting to camp here, but if we don't make good progress, we're going to get behind and we could get in a pickle if we get windbound for a couple days. So keep moving, but we'll check it out. Older than I expected. Mm -hmm. I think it is. Kind of trap. Oh, uh, yeah. Good call. Yeah. Some sort of probably. Hmm. Kind of cool. Any date or anything on it? No. She's pretty rusty. Definitely pretty old. It was wild. They looked like rocks. And then John noticed one was a moose. And I finally saw it and I was watching it and the one in rock in front of it popped up. Yeah, you got startled. Yeah, <laughs> like I, I just didn't, I thought it was a rock. Yeah, they were bobbing around just Literally, diving for whatever they like to eat down there. Something down there it looked like moose bobbing for apples. Oh man, that what a day. So cool. What a day. Oh. Doesn't look like anything too appetizing down there. But they were having that out. Oh, actually, here's a little weed floating. So that's probably what they were eating. Oh, and some of this too. Is that coontail? Coming around North Bay Point, and there are a bunch of islands and beaches marked on the map in this area. Hoping to make camp somewhere around there. So our day got a little bit longer than anticipated, but found a nice beach here. Beautiful sand, flat spot, and great view. And we'll be up early tomorrow, so we gotta call it quits.
Sun's going down. We're kind of happy to see it going down. We got a lot of sun again today. Can't complain about that, but it uh, baked us a little bit. Erin's lying down. She's she's pretty pooped. But a beautiful spot and an unbelievable day. Still has, hasn't sunk in that that was real. Caribou, the couple of moose, but mostly the caribou. It's time for a map update. We've got this handy rock here, which has become like our shelving unit. So yesterday we came around Windigo Bay. And, whoops, whoops, whoops, making a mess. Down to meeting point here. Today we went through these islands and down here, just outside the mouth of Umbabaka Bay. What a view from the tent tonight. And we won't even have to get out of the tent to stargaze tonight. Just leave this like this. We'll be able to see it all. Day 15. This is officially our longest, the longest yeah. trip either of us have ever done. We did a 14 day trip in 2020 that was 250 kilometers, which we've already well surpassed. But that trip had 60 portages yeah. and this has zero. So <laughs> different game. Yeah. It's a chilly one. Glad to have tea. Another beautiful starry night and another clear day. Can't believe the weather we're having. Pretty perfect morning out here, but we really wanted to sleep in today. The early rises, they catch up with you. But we got potentially a, a wind that's gonna stop us this afternoon with waves and tomorrow, perhaps all day. So gotta get in distance while we have the opportunity. Yesterday we were talking about the caribou and I was like, the odds of seeing one versus a moose are about 100 to one. We were just talking about how we need to pick up the fishing on this trip and a bite seconds later. So we gotta start talking about these things because we seem to be able to manifest them. <laughs> I've never seen a pike jump like that. So it's not that interesting of a fish, but that was the best <laughs> jump I've ever got out of a pike. Again, it's a, a pike that's right in that limit that you can't keep, but not a bad one. Thank you. Passing by the mouth of Umbabaka Bay. It's a massive one. It's bigger than most lakes you'd find anywhere. Just this bay. Yep, a little walleye. Not so. Mm -hmm. Dang, we gotta, we gotta get going today, but I wish I could keep this one. Just don't have time to pick it up and I don't have a I don't like to keep uh, dead fish in the boat too long. Get you out of here soon. You can hear a chopper in the distance, probably scouting forest fires. There's a, there's a haze back in the air today. 
but we haven't seen anything immediate. It could be from thousands of kilometers away. There are huge fire, forest fires that can produce that smoke. And all we've seen basically is aircraft. That day that we saw the four kayaks in that one group, we also saw a sleeper boat from afar in the distance, like way in the distance. And we haven't seen anyone since, even at old White Sands where there were those cabins, no one. Feels like we have the lake to ourselves. In the distance behind me is a point we're trying to get to. It's uh, the tip of South Peninsula. And if we're able to get there today, it'll post in a pretty decent position if we get stuck tomorrow with the weather. And we're about halfway there. So just keep powering through and we should be, be able to make it before the wind picks up. Nice spot here on this big slab of rock. And we could see lots of blueberry shrubs. So we just had to check it out, but still nothing. Actually, there's... <laughs> There are two and one is pretty desiccated. Back here in the shade, they're getting a bit more moisture and there is a respectable handful to be had here. Oh, that one's covering spider webs, dang it. <laughs> First fresh produce in a while. Mm. Yep. That's nice. There's an old sign posted here too. Hasn't been Department of Game and Fisheries for a long time. Mm -hmm. Well, good thing we started early. It's starting to chop up fast and we found a perfect spot to camp. Checks all our boxes. So this will be home. We picked out our next camp and the timing worked out beautifully. It's really starting to get nasty out there. Aaron set up the tent here beautifully, really cozy spot, very unique site. I just rolled my ankle, but we've used our medical expertise to determine that it's not a mortal blow. So I'll probably live and tomorrow we expect to be forced to stay here. So, and we have no portages on this trip. So it was a pretty good time to roll an ankle. Here's a map update, full map today. There, past Umbabaca Bay, down the South Peninsula to there, where we should have a great view of it if southwest winds kick up some waves tomorrow. Should be in for a show. So the canoe's down there by the water tents through the trees, tons of blueberry shrubs, and as much as they're sparse, Aaron's collecting a bunch. A nice, have a nice dessert, and just such an interesting area. Tons to explore. There's a pile of rocks here. It could be an old rock cairn or a fire pit, whatever it is. It hasn't been used for a while, but I suspect it might have been put here to draw attention to this. This is crazy. It looks like we found the next one in the series, which is a, an insane coincidence that we happened to camp at two of them in, mm -hmm. within three nights. 
Because it says she post C5. The last one was C6. Same, Same here. here. That's so cool. That's amazing. <laughs> and it's tucked in here. Yeah. The odds of stumbling upon them are pretty thin. Oh, ridiculously yeah, right? slim odds. That's, that's, funny. that's insane. <laughs> so ended up with about 100 milliliters of berries, which doesn't seem like much, but... It's a lot of work. Yeah. Slim pickings, and after none for so long, be happy to take our 50 mils each for the night. Call it dessert. Amazing. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Grab more tomorrow. Thank you. Here's your empty. There's more for you. Oops. Mm. Oh, I'm good. Well, if we end up spending a rest day here tomorrow, and right now I hope we do, this is the place to spend it. This is amazing. And we've got our pads and we're on some like spongy moss slash shrubs and it's just extra comfy. And we skipped over on Babaka Bay today and here's part of the reason why. We talked to some people who know the lake and they said that on Babaka wasn't particularly scenic, but also this whole area is a diverted watershed for hydro. So the, the dams here on the Nipigon River, they diverted, diverted all this water that's used to flow down the Ogoki River down the little jackfish and this has created a lot of siltation in this bay so the water's not that clear and yeah figured we could skip that and spend more time in other areas that we think are going to be quite nice the woman found the blanket and pulled it up high enough to cover herself to the waist then raised one hand to push her hair back from her eye Day 16 and we're wave bound as expected and it's supposed to get worse so yeah we're not going anywhere and that's kind of what we wanted today for a rest day of a little show with the waves but now tomorrow's forecast calls for up to 50 kilometer an hour winds which would be extremely dangerous to paddle in especially in an open canoe today would be very difficult but tomorrow impossible so that is somewhat of a concern especially because the following morning is also looking rough so that could be three straight days where we struggle to make progress, if any, which for the first time on this trip makes me worry about us getting to the finish line in time. We've got a wedding to get back to, Aaron's in the bridal party, so we got to get back. Taking stock of what's left as well, we should be good for food for up to another week, but if, it, if we need an extra day or two, but not much longer than that. I'll be going for fish today, hope to make that happen finally, fish fry. It's not even 10.30 and it's already really kicked up over there. But we made a point of choosing a site that had a little leeward section for cooking and fishing, swimming, and even launching the canoe if we get a chance tomorrow. It's time to get a shore lunch, I hope. Got one. Thank you. Perfect 
eater walleye. Fantastic. Didn't take long. Rain threatening, I'm not gonna wait. This will be plenty. Erin's barely having any. She's actually vegetarian except for the odd little bit of fresh caught meat. But this will be my first meat all trip except for one freeze dried meal that had a little beef in it. So I've got the two fillets, two cheeks. You can get a little extra meat out of the cheeks on walleye and the pectoral fins as well. Walleye wings. doesn't really like seafood so she tries mm -hmm. it's good for me I saved in the trip mm -hmm. I appreciate the nutrients mm It's early afternoon and without a doubt we're going to be stuck here. It's not too bad around this point but this is the exposure and it's actually worse around the corner I'll show you. This is a bit of a glancing blow and this is a 30 kilometer an hour wind. Tomorrow if it hits 50 in the afternoon is forecasted it's going to be exponentially worse. We're tucked away in here totally out of the wind. Back there, it's quiet. You would hardly know what's going on. Well, you can hear the waves, but it's nothing like here. And the best show is around the corner here. Aaron's whipped up another batch of raspberry bannock and we're really enjoying this spot and we might be here for a while. Don't have the wind forecast for the third day from today but tomorrow and the following day look really really bad. Even if we can get out tomorrow morning we're not sure it's going to make sense because it'll get rough so fast and we have such a good spot for riding it out here. There's a chance we'll be here three full days but yeah. we'll have to play it by day by day. Even if we get a window tomorrow it's supposed to pick up so much that 
it might not be worth it. It might be dangerous to try and take advantage of that window and then get caught on it when yeah. it picks up. So yeah, tomorrow is be dangerous. Happening. So we'll see what comes. But the trip has a different vibe now. Supposed to be a clear night. This looks kind of ominous. Almost sunset and the wind just started raging. It was dying down and then suddenly it's just crazy. And there's this forest fire haze in the air too. A little rain on the air. It feels nasty. Almost looks post-apocalyptic now. All right, we're getting the bed, we're getting the alarm set for 4.30 a.m., but I'm not too hopeful. We'll see what comes tomorrow morning. Day 17, we woke up at 4.30 and it was calm as expected and still is, but it's just the calm before the storm. So we've decided to stay put for the day rather than get a two or three hours of paddling in and then scramble to find something before this thing picks up, which is supposed to be pretty nasty according to our forecast. I'll show you what we're dealing with on the map. We're there and the south winds are making progress impossible because of not just a headwind, but also these points, which are very exposed and present a real danger for an open canoe or most vessels, especially today. And then tomorrow the forecast calls for nearly 50 kilometer an hour winds again, which is crazy to have that back to back. Going down this way, which is still gonna make this point at least perilous. Livingston Point, I think it's called. Livingstone Point. So, we're probably gonna be here the next two days, but at least we're in a great position, an enjoyable position. But after that, we're gonna to have to put in some big days to get back to our end point there. Another reason this is a good campsite to stay at. Whoa! I think it was a pike, big jump pike of jumpers in this lake but yeah good good fishing spot for for shore fishing especially when it's calm like this and i can go out on this exposed rock i'm looking for a trout today brook trout have to be at least i think 53 centimeters on nipigan same as superior to keep one so that's enormous half over half a meter long i'm not going to keep a brook trout that big so i'm looking for a lake trout Oh, oh, just came off. That's, that works well. I think you got a look and quick clean release. Pretty similar pike to the ones I've been catching. Not that long, but pretty thick. I'm gonna work the south facing shore while I can. It's gonna be crazy later.
morning 17 and we still have a little bit of cheese left i think it's on borrowed time and i'm not gonna look too closely or smell it too closely but i think it's still pretty good uh and we're gonna throw it in our chili and Ooh. yeah it's quite a bit that was a good yeah and enjoy it with chili this morning this is our longest trip so it's the longest we've ever tried to stretch cheese we're thankful for it this morning a slow build today with the wind the forecast the wind kept getting pushed further and further into the day but it looks like it's finally ramping up hot chocolates tonight we've been saving them for a chilly nasty evening like this backpacking meal and we're ready for a show And we're getting the full thing. What a show. back in the tent with the thunderstorm and there's a weird thrumming sound it sounds like the, the earth is vibrating it's a little bit alarming but exciting thunderstorm passed now it's turning into quite a sunset I've ever seen, especially with the waves. It's just such a dramatic scene.
day 18 and we're windbound again. There was no question about that. The waves raged all night, so we knew we were not moving today. And our sheltered little cove where we've been cooking, keeping the canoe is almost underwater today. So luckily we had the sense to move it yesterday. Exposed rock and beaches are rarely safe from the waves. We knew about Nipigon's wrath coming into this trip and we budgeted three to five days out of our plan 21 to be off the water because of conditions. And this is now the fifth day, one thunderstorm and four wave bound days. So we've maxed out that allowance now. And if things don't improve, I'm worried that we're not gonna be able to do this. In the forecast for tomorrow, there looks like there'll be a paddling window in the morning before it gets rough yet again. So we're not going anywhere too fast, too soon. Here's a little oasis out of the wind. It's amazing how much one line of trees can do to cut the wind, like a rock in a river creating an eddy. And then right here, it's just wicked. Aaron and I live on Lake Superior and we've seen bigger than this, but this is certainly a storm worthy of great lakes. It's a chilly, overcast, and really windy day, so hoping this will warm our spirits a little bit. Winded down day 18 here, and it's really hard to believe we've been here for four nights tomorrow morning. 
and we're so eager to get going. We got an alarm set for 440. Hope to be on the water at first light if it's calm enough. It's just a blur the last few days. Five forty-five, and we're ready to go. Just going to wait a little bit longer for just a, a little bit of first light, but it's still too dark to see rocks or anything like that. So, but at least it's calm. We got our game faces on, and we're ready to put in a big day if the wind allows us to. There are a handful of nav beacons on Nipigan. You can see one in the distance there flashing. Shaping up to be a beautiful morning and what a night too. Sunset and then I got in the tent and a bat was flying around the tent above us, left the fly door open. I rarely see bats. Stars came out and northern lights. The one thing I wanted left on this trip to really complete it. So all, all that's left to complete this trip is to complete it. <laughs> it's a duck. Yeah. <laughs> So nice to have calm and silence out here after three straight days of that roar. We're about to make this four kilometer crossing across Humboldt Bay. And I think we have about 100 kilometers left on our route, which is like three good travel days. But what we we're really we're really hoping for is a sailing day at some point and we could make up a ton of ground at that point. But it's supposed to get windy again later today and possibly tomorrow as well. It could even be another wave bound day. So. Gonna make this crossing and keep motoring along. We're done the crossing. We're at Livingstone Point Provincial Nature Reserve. The wind isn't doing us any favors, so it looks like it's probably not gonna be the big day we hope for, but we'll see what we can do. into a little bay behind an island here. The paddling's been pretty rough so far. A lot of big swallows out on the lake. We got into a bit of a rough situation around Livingstone Point, but at this point in the trip with still so many kilometers left to go, we really have to try and balance keeping safe with also progressing when we can. So we're kind of contemplating, hoping to make a couple more kilometers today, but not sure if we'll be able to manage it or if we're gonna have to pull in an early day. It's been a long day, but we're finally behind Mungo Park Point, which is providing a nice bit of shelter here. And we're hoping to, uh, to camp at the end of that point. I'm so gassed. I had three hours of sleep between the Aurora early rise and just insomnia. So oh, I can't wait to get there.
just hammered out 40 kilometers into a headwind and then collapsed here and the gear bomb exploded. We've got electrolyte, water, dehydrated pineapple, and cashews. Basically didn't stop. Just took two pee breaks and that was it. Snack bars and wraps. So here's a look at home for tonight and very likely tomorrow night as well. As you can see, this area burnt and I believe this is part of the big 1999 fire just about 25 years ago. There's this long channel between the island and mainland. And an incredible view. That's north there, so we'll be keeping an eye out for more northern lights. It's the most established campsite, I would say, on this trip. Aside from that one other, I don't know, maybe day seven or something we stayed at. And we're supposed to have a big wind from the south again tomorrow. So, yeah, we might be stuck here, but it'd be a great place to swim, clean ourselves up, get some more juice over there with the solar panel, and rest after a big day. Penne with rehydrated sauce and veggies tonight. And the last of the Parmesan. So here's where we're at on the map. Came around the South Peninsula, crossed over around Livingstone, and up into this burnt area to there. Tomorrow, 30 kilometer an hour south winds, but then the next day it's supposed to be a pretty strong north wind. So we're hoping we make good progress down the coast and it's not too strong. And then that would get us uh, within striking distance of the car. Day 20, and for the fourth time in five days, we're wave bound. It's not bad here, we're on the leeward side, but we can hear it crashing over there and the wind's strong. So, we had a big day yesterday. Tomorrow looks like it'll be a big day as well, so it's not such a bad day for a rest day. And we've got a view worthy of the Great Lakes and yet another really interesting site to explore. So we're camp there just around the corner. Going to do a little shore fishing today. Hopefully get that lake trout I didn't get the other day. And the spot I came has a fish here, a burbot. Looks like something's been eating it, probably an eagle. So hopefully that's a good omen for me. No luck. Unfortunately, it's too shallow along the shore here. The rock slopes really slowly out, so I can't get my lure deep. Normally I would cast out a heavy spoon or something like that, let it fall deep to get to where the Lakers are, but can't do that here, but that's all right. We've got the last ration of Bannock along with some chili. So that'll be good. Then we're gonna go for a hike around the island.
been a great hike. There's so much going on in these rocks and the crevices and splash pools, little flowers. And we've got to the south end of the island. It's a pretty long island. And the waves aren't too bad today, but there's a strong headwind. Tomorrow we should have a good tailwind, so we'll take advantage of that. Can't believe it, but we just found some more survey monuments. This one is federal from 1959. This one's provincial from the Gravity Base Station. That's interesting. Departments of Mines and Northern Affairs, Toronto. Okay, we're back to camp. The east shore of the island turned out to be pretty much a bushwhack, so we're ready for a swim. On our walk today, we gathered some rose hips. We're gonna make some tea, so put them in the pot and boil them up for about 10 minutes and mm -hmm. see what tastes. Yeah, this is the fruit of the wild, of wild rose plant. Comes after the flower. I'm not sure if this is the right ratio of rose hips to water, but anyway, we'll see what it's like. It's a good source of vitamin C, apparently. Cheers. It's day 20. Day 20. Pretty mild and bland as expected. Maybe we need more, or maybe it's just not late enough in the season. The vitamin C should be there though. Yeah. Okay. There's not a ton of stuff left in the food barrel, enough for three or four more days, but we do have a good amount of sugar left, so that'll fix this up. We're also gonna throw in some mint tea <laughs> bags. <laughs> Take this into a real tea. It was pretty bland. There was nothing there. Wild yeah. edible teas like cedar, spruce, pine, all that. They usually, in my opinion, can't compete with <laughs> just an Earl Grey or a mint. I do like um, spruce and cedar. Quite I, li a bit. I like them, but I still like these yeah. teas better. But it's nice to get those vitamins if mm -hmm. you need them. 20 days and we're starting to long for home a little bit. Not terribly, I'm still really happy. We're still really happy to be out here. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's getting to that point. What are you missing most right now? The cats. The cats. And then... And then what comfort? Well, we were just talking about good meals. So it's between mm -hmm. that and a shower and clean laundry. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I'd probably say laundry. Yeah. Being able to launder clothes really well. That's the one thing I miss out here the most. And yeah, the food. Food a day. fridge full of fresh food, a produce actually, yeah, produce. produce would be up there since so we got so few blueberries, yeah. raspberries. If there's a chance we can put in a huge day tomorrow, like 50 kilometers maybe if the wind is in our favor, but we're not holding our breath on that. We haven't got that much sailing in so far, maybe 30, 30 kilometers yeah. of the 300 and of whatever we're at. Piece together here and there, yeah. We thought it'd be a lot more. Yeah. So. Yeah. Get, yeah, if we can get a big day that. tomorrow, that would be the nice. most. The longest sail we had was about a week ago, maybe coming out of Windigo Bay. That was five kilometers that we got out of that. It's really nice, but yeah, we expected some 40 kilometer sailing days, a couple of them here and there, and we have not had that at all. And all paddles. Last cast here, no fish unless I get one right now. Unfortunately, I really wanted one, craving something rich and fatty. Our food is so lean, but two or three days away from being able to satisfy all my cravings. Tomorrow morning, we'll be heading down this channel and south, hopefully toward a big progress day. And I'll give you a look on the map. 
so we're camped on that island and the channel's right in between there and the mainland. Tomorrow we're hoping to continue down to perhaps the Blackwater River and even further into this area if we get really lucky, but that's like a 50 kilometer day. There are a couple of outs before our exit. There's a municipal campground there, a small campground. We could exit there or down here in Orient Bay. However, that would be really dissatisfying to be so close. And once we get down to here, we have two options to either come through there or up on top. So that really helps with respect to wind. We could tuck away in here if need be. So that's basically the home stretch. Get some popcorn, it'll tide me over for tonight. Let's do this. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> All right, here we go at first light down the channel. The clouds up top this morning here when they're in that nice wavy kind of pattern it always reminded me of something i can never figure it out but this morning it hit me it reminds me of sand under on a beach under the water just flowing nicely same pattern it's the same pattern it's kind of beautiful symmetry mm -hmm. and here comes the sun mm -hmm. The swells have built as we carried on this morning, so we're going to try and just get past this next point and hopefully tuck into a bay. The wind's supposed to die as the day goes on, so we might have to wait it out a little bit. We've tucked into this bay. We're going to put our dry suits on and try and get a little bit further. It's The swells are big but manageable. They're not breaking yet, so it's a bit more progress in. day on this lake we thought we might have a nice easy day and it begins said not so fast obviously it's a lake that's better suited to sea kayaks and canoes with spray deck but we're able to to use our experience to get through this but a, a spray deck would be nice right now that's for sure Got into a calmer spot getting a bit of sailing in here Making much better progress now, about 26 kilometers into our day and passing Poplar Lodge Park over there. I came here, this is my first dose of Nipigon that I ever got. It was a little over a decade ago. I was road tripping in my minivan and I looked out on this lake and I was obviously inspired. And I'd like to say that in that moment, I dreamt about paddling around it someday, but at that time I never even dreamt I could do that. So pretty cool to be back here, almost all the way around it.
big dents in our day. Stopping for some tea, coffee, snacks. We just put in six hours straight of paddling without even peeing. Somehow we just didn't have to. It's not like we were holding it, but we're just motivated. Back on our way, we got about 15 kilometers left to hit the 50 kilometer mark. Hoping to get to there and then we can get home tomorrow almost for sure. So just into view is Otter Head, which is one of the features that we saw in our first bay on day one. And for so much of the trip recently, we've been looking back at the landmarks that we passed and to come full circle and be looking forward to stuff from being a trip is pretty cool. Kind of surreal, makes it set in that we're getting close. The lake really settled down after our lunch break, which is really appreciated because we're coming up to the mouth of Pidgeotowabic Bay. So it's nice and calm here for that crossing. And we've blown by all of this, which is a good, a good place to blow by, I suppose, if any on the lake, because it's got a bit of development, a few motorboats, and this forest fire runs all along here. So it's thick bush. We could have put in 40 to 50 kilometer days like this probably several times on this trip, but We've seen, we've passed so much on this on this day, but we've seen and experienced much less than normal. Also because of the waves and for the first 30 kilometers just didn't allow us to get into shore. But yeah, we're trying to head over here and camp for the night. I am losing steam. Here it is, another beach camp for the final night. Hard to believe that we're almost there. Gonna be in the hammocks tonight. We haven't done a ton of hammocking, so that'll be nice. And we'll be looking out at this view with sunset. It's supposed to go down somewhere over there. Pretty good. Fitting that I'm just finishing this book here on our last night and in the last chapter Nancy Scott says Lake Nipigon remains a pristine and undeveloped wilderness lake a place of grandeur mystery and intrigue that it has stayed in such a wild state is indeed remarkable and that is so true I can't believe that we spent 20 days up until today we barely saw a soul on a lake with no portages to get to and she closes with it can only be hoped that long into the future, the glory of Nipkin will be treasured, appreciated, and protected as the spectacular wilderness lake that it is. And may Lake Nipkin always remain the iconic, wild, near pristine body of water, befitting its unique setting in the geography of Canada, that special place where the Great Lakes begin. So here's where we stand after day 21. So we did a little over 50 kilometers today, which puts us over 400 kilometers for the trip. And just a few days ago when we had spent four nights in that one spot, I was really thinking that there was a very good chance we were gonna have to take out at that campground we passed today. Thrilled to be here. Took a couple big days, 40 kilometers, two days ago, fighting through the headwind. And today, pushing through, we had a tailwind, but pushing through some nasty conditions. So, feels amazing to be here. We're rehydrating some well deserved sweet potato masala, and the cravings are hitting harder and harder every day. Today, we said milkshake. I wanted a lemon custard for some reason. I don't even know if I've ever You're had not even one. A sweet person. No. Typically. Yeah, burger. Oh, poutine. Can't, can't wait for tomorrow to satisfy those cravings. But 
We're planning to go to this diner, which we lovingly refer to as the Krabby Duck. Long story short, we went there after our last Superior trip. I couldn't remember the name of it, so I called it the Krabby Duck. It's called Duckies. And we went there, had a wonderful meal after our trip, and we've been looking forward to it this whole time. Earlier, about 10 days ago, let's say, I started thinking about that, and I just randomly sang out a, a verse of a song, started a song. I said, the Krabby Duck is a Krabby Duck. And I paused and tried, tried to think of something else. That was a nonsensical start to the song. And then it said, it'll fill our belly soon. And we just sort of built off of that over the course of that day. She wrote a couple lines, I wrote a couple lines, and then she finished it with a couple more. So without further ado, <laughs> after dinner, we've got a little performance for you. For the Krabby Duck. It's really an ode to all the greasy spoons out there. Yeah. Exactly. And it's possibly the most annoying earworm since Baby Shark. <laughs> and or the song that never ends. <laughs> yeah. Our generation's Baby Shark. <laughs> We've got a beautiful sun dog just in time for dinner. One, two. Three. The crabby duck is a crabby duck. It'll fill our bellies soon. For 21 days we've been paddling hard, craving that greasy spoon. I got a rumbly in my tumbly. I can eat for a platoon. As the miles pass by, our hunger grows. We sing this paddler's tune. Watching the sun go down here on our final night on Nipigon. Unbelievable trip, trip of a lifetime in so many ways and something we'll remember forever. So many different things, I'm thinking about the birds, there are a bunch of gulls in front of us here. We saw pelicans, swans, eagles, herons. Peregrine falcon. Peregrine falcon, echo Merlin. rock. Yeah, countless just others. Countless, and it was super fun just watching and looking out for them, listening to them. Yeah. Yeah, they were a big part of the trip. Always, always putting on a show throughout. And then the weather and skies, fantastic weather. Unbelievably good. We only had one like fully overcast day and I don't think it even rained that day. Mostly no. the rain came and went. And then the only real challenge was in this last week, the wind and waves, especially pinning us down at that one site, but couldn't complain about the weather on this trip. Then there were thunderstorms, yeah. which we love. Just like the wavy days, we just love being in the power of nature and we got several i don't know the first week or two we had half a dozen thunderstorms at least they were rolling in kind of in the afternoons we'd have a warmer humid day and then as the kind of afternoon rolled in we'd get a bit of a squall and a thunderstorm yeah it was fun and there was a forest fire haze adding to the atmosphere sometimes making for some beautiful sunrises and sunsets and we saw maybe our best sunset ever. Yeah. That wavy day, the clouds were mountainous and so red and pink. It was amazing. And then Northern Lights. Yeah. We got Northern Lights, uh, one mediocre showing and then one pretty good one, so. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the meteor shower. Yeah, the meteor shower yeah. and just stargazing in general. And then there were the fish. Didn't get as much as I wanted to, but still we got uh, a walleye fish fry, we got some pike got that one nice walleye yeah. and I caught the biggest brook trout of my life but didn't document it well it slip through oh, your well. nets <laughs> yeah <laughs> and we got there was that big pike that was oh yeah nibbling early on too didn't get him on the line but 
Yeah, he was short biting my paddle tail. It was that close. Yeah, got a good sight of it. So, yeah, that was fun. And then, of course, there's the scenery, beaches everywhere. Campsites were fantastic, despite that maybe some are messed up because of the damming or forest fires. But we still found so many unique and fantastic campsites. Mm -hmm. Lots of cliffs. And just the overall landscape and scenery was so diverse day to day. Yeah, it's yeah. hard to believe it was all on one lake. Yeah, you think about Windigo Bay and that yeah. huge shallow wetland. Yeah. <laughs> and then Mount St. John and Echo Rock and uh, white wetlands. Sand. Yeah, the White Sand yeah. River. We got into some rivers and creeks as well, which was like a nice change of pace. Early on, it seems it's hard to even remember, but there's a <laughs> Grand Cape. That was gorgeous. And uh, Chiatang Bluffs. Yep. Barn Islands, can't forget oh, them. Oh yeah, <laughs> we had a good view of them for probably a week. Yeah, yeah, yeah, they were always on the horizon somewhere for quite a while. That was cool. And then you can't forget the wildflowers either. We saw so many and just a beautiful burst of color everywhere, everywhere you go. Yeah. And the wildlife didn't disappoint. We thought it might be initially because we were well into the trip and all we had seen was a small black bear at camp, which was just gone too fast to get any footage. But then we got to the north end of the lake, more remote end, and things started happening. That amazing encounter with the black bear just mm -hmm. let us watch him forever. Yeah, and he just went about his business, unfazed by us. <laughs> yeah. And then the magic happened, the caribou. Caribou. Oh, unforgettable part of our lives for sure. I can't believe, yeah, just so, so incredible to, yeah, just yeah. have that experience to have seen one. That was a pipe dream to experience yeah. that on this trip and it actually happened so yeah. that's crazy and then there's a couple of moose bobbing up and down bobbing for apples it looked like i can say that i've in my lifetime plenty of times mistaken rocks for moose yeah. that's the first time i've mistaken moose for rocks yeah <laughs> <laughs> and plenty of other stuff like otters um, yeah that's a lot of yeah mink mm -hmm. yeah Overall, I feel like we played our cards pretty well on this trip and it was executed nicely. Didn't forget anything or wish, there was nothing really that we wish we had except maybe the trail cam. If anything, yeah. I considered bringing it and left it at home. So maybe would have caught that animal yeah, on but, the camera, but. No, other than that, it was like, I can't believe how for a three week trip that we, there was nothing major that we, we no. missed or, you know, oversights or anything like that. No. The only thing we wish we had were blueberries. We've said that a lot of times yeah. on this trip, so won't belabor the point any further. But some fresh foods can be really appreciated tomorrow. So final thoughts on Lake Nipigon. It's been an incredible trip. And for me, even sitting here on day 21 this evening, I definitely thought at this point I would be aching for home a lot more. It was the lo longest trip by far that we've done, most distance we've covered. And uh, that stand out to me is that I'm just, I'm ready. It'll be nice to be home, but I'm not eager to mm. be getting home. I'm not missing things as much as I thought I would. Like it's yeah. really felt in comparison to other trips, doing such a long one has felt less like a, a trip where we're going from point A to point B and almost more like we're just coming and living out here for mm. a couple, you know, like three weeks at a time or it, it didn't have that same beginning and end feeling throughout it was just oh we're just out here living out here mm -hmm. paddling exploring the lake and uh and that's pretty cool to feel just so at home at and home yeah enjoy it so much yep and then i'm i'm shocked how few people we saw how remote the, this lake parts of this lake are with no portages and i think i said earlier in this trip described it as a masterpiece of a lake, mm -hmm. it really is. All the islands, so much wildlife, the fishing potential. Yeah, it's, it's a very special place. And the last time I was here, last fall, just got a taste of the lake and I said, it reminds me of Superior more than any other lake, which is the highest compliment I can give. And I feel that even more so now. So yeah, Nipigon in our hearts forever. Spectacular. What a trip. Yeah.
packing up here before first light. We've got 25, maybe 30 kilometers to go to the car. And then we're out of here. It's a chilly one. We've got tea from the thermos. And we're raring to go. We're now at the start of the Nipigon River, where all of the water from this lake rushes out, just like us. We're rushing out of this lake down the Nipigon River along the highway that runs there. Lake Nipigon has been called many things, including the sixth Great Lake, which I think is quite warranted, or the first Great Lake because it's the first in the hydrology. Everything from here runs down through the Great Lakes. It's also referred to as the headwaters of the Great Lakes for the same reason. But we've kind of latched onto the concept and the idea of it being the mother of the Great Lakes. Think about the lake. We've just paddled around and looking at the river here where it all drains. It's Lake Superior's biggest tributary. So in a sense, Nipigon gives birth to these waters. They travel down the river as children, out to the Great Lakes for their adolescence, out the St. Lawrence River, where I guess they become adults in the Atlantic. And they evaporate back up into the sky, go to Lake Heaven, and then eventually rain down to replenish the cycle. I've already come up with new uses for my pony hole. It's now my rabbit tail. Really enjoying this thing. Eh? <laughs> Possibilities are endless. Making good progress now. We're about 26 kilometers into our day, passing Pobler Lur. We're finally through the forest fire. The last day and a half, we were, or not day and a half, last. I'm saying goodbye to an old friend today. This is my seventh season with this shirt. It's my favorite shirt. It's becoming quite threadbare. It's torn. The buttons don't hold anymore. Today is its last day. So say goodbye, folks. Good morning. Good morning. It's a beautiful day. Something we learned on this trip. <laughs> The drone is a very good bellows. Really gets the coals going. <laughs> Look at that. One, two, three. The crabby duck is a crabby duck. It'll fill our bellies soon. For 21 days we've been paddling hard. Craving that greasy spoon. I got a rumbly in my tumbly. I can eat for a platoon. As the miles pass by, our hunger grows. We sing this paddler's tune.